In this nine and a half hour EQ course, you're gonna learn everything you need to know about using an equalizer. And not only are we going to cover the fundamentals like understanding the frequency spectrum, understanding how an equalizer works and all the different parameters, but you're also going to walk away with a ton of clarity on what you're actually trying to achieve when you pull up an EQ. And you're going to have a deep understanding of how proper use of equalization can lead to clean, clear and professional sounding mixes and masters. In fact, take a listen to this mix without and then with EQ. Nothing else has changed. Most people have no clear understanding of what they're doing when it comes to EQ, and they just pull up an equalizer and move the bands around randomly, waiting for something to happen. I call this erratic EQ, and you know you're one of these people if you struggle to identify the right frequencies to cut or boost, you're unsure about how much you should cut or boost by, and you even struggle to hear the changes that you're making when you tweak the EQ parameters. For most people, the root cause of all this is that they have no strategy, workflow, or intention behind EQ. And because because of that, they're relying on common advice like trust your ears or if it sounds good, it is good, which isn't really helpful. We're going to address all of these problems and more. And we're also going to address frequency masking, stock versus premium and hardware EQs, how to EQ any instrument of voice, how to nail the low end, mid range and top end, and how to clean up muddiness in the lower mids. And you're going to learn about a unique method for applying EQ that we call the chef strategy, which guides you through the entire process. Now, this isn't going to be the most entertaining video you're going to watch on YouTube today, but it's incredibly in depth. And by the end, you're going to be an absolute pro with an EQ. And as long as you go away and actually practice what you learn and follow through on the practical activities, there's simply no way you're not going to feel extremely confident with equalization on the other side. There are a lot of resources that go along with this course, including practice assignments, cheat sheets, charts, and a bunch of other PDFs. So I put it all in one folder and it's absolutely essential that you download this folder if you want to follow along properly with the course. So just click the link in the description below or scan the QR code that you see on screen now. Then on that page, enter your email address to get access to those free resources so you can follow along with the course. All right, I'm going to hand you off now to Dylan Pines. He's a professional producer from Nashville. He's an amazing teacher and I think you're going to love him. So enjoy. Hello everyone. This is Dylan with Musician on a Mission. So excited to be teaching you today about the basics of EQ. Now you've probably seen these pieces of technology around. If you've tried you know, doing any kind of mixing, you've seen them. If you've seen any sort of studio, if you've seen anyone at a board twiddling knobs, they're probably messing with an EQ. But today we're gonna to be starting with the exact basics, which is what is an EQ? What is an equalizer, which is what EQ stands for? Well, what it basically is, is a volume fader for your instrument's tone. So when I say volume fader, I of course mean like this thing over here that controls the volume of the entire track. What I mean by that when I say a volume fader for your instrument's tone, I mean it allows you to turn the good parts of your tone up louder. And it also allows you to turn down the bad parts of your tone. So turn up the volume of the good parts, turn down the volume of the bad parts. Before we get into some examples to show you what I mean by that, let's talk about tone. So every instrument obviously has its own unique sound. You know, obviously a singer does not sound the same as a guitar and a violin does not sound the same as a drum set. Now, the reason for that is because tone is made up of thousands of unique sound waves that are all happening simultaneously. So like I said earlier, you know, a violin is going to be making thousands of different sound waves than a drum set might be making. So these sound waves are what's known as frequencies. And the reason your instrument sounds the way it does is because of its own unique blend of frequencies. So an EQ allows us to go in, dive in, get our hands dirty with these frequencies and turn the volume up of the frequencies we like and turn the volume down of the frequencies that we don't like. We'll get into frequencies more in a little bit, but for right now, let's just get into some examples of what an EQ can do and what an EQ sounds like. So right here I have three examples of different instruments. We've got some lead vocals, a drum set, and an electric guitar. Then I also have an EQ that I have controlling all three of them. So let's just listen through right now 
to the vocals, and let's see what I can do to make them sound different. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes recklessly. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes recklessly. Let me try it down here. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes recklessly. So you see what that's doing to the tone? You know, whenever I'm boosting, certain parts of the tone are getting more aggressive. Maybe the sound is getting warmer or thicker, depending on where I'm boosting it, or maybe brighter and harsher. And vice versa, whenever I'm cutting stuff, you start to hear it sound thinner, you start to hear it sound maybe darker, or maybe even a little bit more balanced at times. Although I am being very aggressive with these cuts, because I want you to be able to hear exactly what it sounds like. So let's do the same thing on the drum set. You hear how it's getting really bright up here? And then the farther down I go, the warmer and boomier it gets. And if I cut it, it's the opposite. You lose all the boom. And if you cut up here, you lose all of the brightness, all the crispness. Cool. Well, let's do one more example just so that you get an idea of what it sounds like. So this is an electric guitar. So you've got kind of some crispiness right here, some aggressiveness right here, some warmth right there. If I cut it, it sounds thinner, less aggressive or even darker. So you can see that if I cut in the same place where I boosted before, basically the opposite effect happens. So, you know, if I boost in the top end, then, you know, it's gonna get a lot brighter. It's gonna get a lot more shimmery. But if I cut in the top end, it's gonna feel darker. It's gonna feel a little bit more closed off, a little bit more, you know, like you're hearing it through, through a wall, kind of like this. So you'll see this tool in every mix that you do. This is, maybe the most common tool used in mixing, used in recording, used in audio in general. Along with compression and reverb and the volume fader and the pan knob, uh, I'd say it is the most important mixing tool that you're ever going to use. So you need to learn how to use it. But before we start using it, we have to go over the physics of what's behind the instruments that you're messing with with the equalizer. We need to understand exactly what frequencies are, what the frequency spectrum is, and so we're going to be getting into that right now. So in this lesson, we're going to be talking about the frequency spectrum. Now, I know that might be a confusing word, a little bit complicated, a little bit techy, if you haven't heard it before. It's a lot less complicated than it sounds at first, but the reason we're learning this is because the frequency spectrum deals entirely with EQ. You can't really know how to do EQ without at least understanding a little bit what the frequency spectrum is. So frequencies are the thousands of unique sound waves that each instrument creates whenever a string is plucked, a drum is hit, a voice is sung. And the frequency spectrum is all of those unique vibrations, those unique sound waves that the instruments are creating laid out basically in a chart from 20 hertz all the way up to 20 kilohertz. Before we even get started, what are hertz? Obviously that's some jargon there. Hertz are basically how frequencies, how sound waves are measured. It's a scientific term. What it basically means is how fast a particular sound wave is. And while we don't really deal with that in audio very much, really what it is is how high pitched a particular vibration is, a particular frequency is. So the higher the hertz, the more high pitched it is. The lower the hertz, the lower pitched it is. So like, uh, is going to be producing a lot more lower hertz, whereas, uh, is going to be producing a lot more higher hertz. 
You know, we're using the word frequency a lot. We're using the word sound wave and vibration a lot. Really what we're talking about is that the frequency spectrum is a representation of the sonic energy of an instrument moment to moment. And we use the frequency spectrum to use our EQs and to better understand what EQ moves are going to do to the sound, to the tone of that instrument. So even though it might sound like a single note, instruments produce thousands upon thousands of frequencies when they're being played. And the balance of those frequencies is what makes tone tone. So a saxophone might have a dramatically different balance, volume balance of frequencies than a drum set or a violin. And we are going to be using an EQ to affect the general volume balance of the frequency spectrum to get a different sound. Let's bring up our EQ. And I'm actually going to be working with a full finished mix because I want to show you what each section of the frequency spectrum sounds like. Because each section has its own unique tone and it makes it a lot easier to use an EQ if you are able to think, okay, I want this sound to be warmer and you know exactly where to go to make the sound warmer. So let's start at the very top. So the bottom of human hearing is 20 hertz. We physically cannot hear anything lower than 20 hertz. On the flip side, the top of human hearing is right here, 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz is really what gets said more often. People talk a lot about how like, oh, dog's sense of hearing is so good. And that's true. Dog's sense of hearing is a lot more sensitive than ours, but also they can hear higher pitches than we can. So, you know, we only go up to 20 kilohertz. They'll go up to 30 kilohertz, 40 kilohertz. It's part of the reason why, you know, dog whistles, we can't hear them, but they absolutely can. And that's how they know to go back to their master. So we basically have names for the different regions of the frequency spectrum. So the first area of the frequency spectrum that we're going to be focusing on is what's known as the sub bass region. And that's between 20 Hertz and 60 Hertz. Now the sub bass region honestly is a little bit difficult to hear. It's really more felt like if you're ever in a club and you're dancing to the music and you can just like feel every single kick drum in your body, that's because there's a lot of frequencies in this region of the frequency spectrum. There's a lot of energy down there. So let me show you what that sounds like. And again, really think of, really try to feel this. And if you're using good speakers or good headphones, you'll be able to feel it more if you're using like laptop speakers or iPhone headphones. Uh, you're probably not going to be able to hear this because they don't go down that far. Fire, fire. Fire, fire. You just feel that just boom that's happening in the kick. I'm actually going to solo this out so you can only hear this section. So whenever you are sitting in your house and a car drives by with a big sub in it, which is where it gets the name from, and all you hear are just these extremely low thumps that are just rattling your whole house, that's because everything that it's producing is coming from this part of the frequency spectrum. It has lots of energy down in the sub bass. So the next section we're going to be talking about is the bass section. And together with sub bass and the bass, this is what's known as the low end of a song. Now the bass section is 60 Hertz through 200 Hertz. Now this is the part of the frequency spectrum where most of the thickness is going to come from. Most of the boom is going to come from. Bass is obviously very popular in a lot of music nowadays. You know, you hear just like that good low end thickness that comes from a lot of pop and hip hop, stuff like that. That is going to be living down in this region. So let me show you what it sounds like. Fire, fire, fire. 
Hear how all you hear is just that, just the really, really low pitch of the bass and the kick. Let me solo it out for you so you can hear it. You hear how you can also start to hear some of the other instruments. They are just barely making a few frequencies down there. Most of what's living there is the kick and the bass. But I'm actually gonna slide back down so you can hear the sub bass, so you can hear the differences between the two. Both very important, but like I said, one is meant to be heard, the other one is meant to be felt. So, the next section that we're going to be going over is the low mids. And that's actually going to be the meat of your entire song. The low mids are between 200 hertz and 600 hertz. So this is where most instruments live. You know, if I'm playing a guitar, most of the strings that I'm going to be hitting produce the bulk of their sonic energy in the low mids. Same with a male vocal or most of a drum set. This is going to be a section where if it's balanced well, then the whole mix is going to sound easy to hear. The whole mix is going to sound full. It's going to sound really nice. So this is where lots of problems arise in the mix because you've got all these different instruments that are competing for space because they all have so much sonic energy in this one section of the low mids. So this is where you're going to get a lot of mud and you're going to get a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say harshness, but just a lot of unintelligibility. Like it's hard to hear everything. It just sounds kind of gross. That's probably because of the low mids. So let's slide this along and see what it sounds like. things started to sound really boxy. They all started to sound cluttered. That's the sound I'm talking about. So let me solo this out so you can hear it. You also hear that you can now hear just about every instrument in the entire mix. Whereas in the low end, all you were really hearing was the kick and the bass. So this is where everything is going to be living. So the next section that we're going to be going over is the mids. And that's around 600 hertz to about 3 kilohertz. So that is, let me move this, about right here to about right here. This is where a lot of human hearing has been uh, attuned to listening for. Uh, especially once you get higher into kind of like the one to three kilohertz range. Now, the reason for that, I have no idea. We actually do hear different frequencies differently. You know, we hear the mids and the upper mids a lot louder than they actually are. Whereas I think we hear the, the lower mids a little bit softer than they actually are. I forget, I'd have to look at a chart. But because of that, we're gonna really wanna make sure that this area is properly balanced because a lot of really good stuff lives in here, but also a lot of really bad stuff lives in here. So let's see what it sounds like. Fire, fire. You hear how once we started getting towards the top of the mids, how it started sounding a lot more aggressive and also a lot more harsh, a little bit more brittle. That's because, like I said, those are the frequencies that we hear the best as humans. And so because of that, it's just like extra presence, extra exciting, but also it extra hurts your ears. So let me solo this out so you can hear it. So to me, the, the mids is actually the part, it's the range that sounds the most varied. 
you know, because the bottom sounds a little bit more like the low mids, top sounds a little bit more like the upper mids, which we're going to talk about right now. So the upper mids is between three kilohertz and eight kilohertz. It's a smaller range, very, very important range. Most of the presence, the character of sounds lives up here. Boosting something here could make it sound a lot more aggressive, could make it sound a lot more uh, present, a lot more exciting, a lot more in your face. But this is where a lot of the pain of sounds lives. A lot of the brittleness, a lot of the harshness lives up here. So let's see what this sounds like. Might hurt your ears a little bit, but important for you to know. So you can hear how some instruments were extra emphasized whenever we boosted that area. You know, the snare, the shaker, the cymbals, the vocals, all of those instruments have a lot of energy in the upper mids. And so whenever we're boosting the upper mids, we are emphasizing those instruments over the rest of the instruments. Whereas if we boosted the lower mids, everything lives there. So everything gets boosted. Now let me solo it out so you can hear what it sounds like. So there's one last section, one last frequency range that we need to talk about, and that is the highs. You could also call it the top end if you wanted to. You hear that a lot. And that's just 8 kilohertz, so right here, all the way up to 20 kilohertz. So just this little region right here. Now, the highs is going to be where we get what we call air. Now, air is kind of confusing until you hear it, but it's this idea that something without much in the high frequency range tends to sound kind of controlled, kind of muffled, whereas something with a lot of energy in the high frequency range tends to sound a lot breathier, tends to sound a lot more open. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So I'm actually going to just take it out, first of all. And when I take it away, everything just sounds like you just covered it up out of nowhere. Let me solo it out. It's hard to actually hear any pitches at this level. It's almost all just rhythmical sound. It's almost like it's um, the atmosphere of the sound is in the high frequency range. So that's all of the frequency ranges. To review, we have our sub bass, which is 20 to 60 hertz. We have our bass, which is 60 to 200 hertz. We have our low mids, which is 200 to 600 hertz. Our mids, which is 600 to three kilohertz. Our upper mids, which is three kilohertz to eight kilohertz. And then our highs, which is eight kilohertz all the way up to 20 kilohertz where we really can't hear anything anymore. So you're gonna to get to know these frequency ranges very well because this is how you're going to know where to EQ and when to EQ. You might hear a sound and you'll say, oh man, that sounds too warm. Well, you know, oh, the low mids is where warmth comes from. I must need to make a cut in the low mids. So I'd recommend bringing up an EQ, boosting one of the bands and sweeping it around in each frequency spectrum on your own instruments and your own mixes just to get a feel for what each of them sounds like, what the tone of that area is. The faster you do that, the faster you internalize what those areas sound like, the faster you're gonna get really, really good at EQ. So in this video, we're gonna be covering the anatomy of an EQ. What's all of the parts, all of the jargon. We're also gonna be covering 
any vocabulary that we are going to be talking about throughout this entire course that might seem confusing if you haven't heard that word before. So really, this is going to be our section of saying, hey, these are all the parts of an EQ. And here are the things that I know are probably going to confuse you if you are a beginner to the world of equalization. First things first, most of an EQ is built around this thing right here. Now, this is called a filter. Now, there's tons of different types of filters. There is the most common one, which is the bell filter, which is the one that I have right here. There is filters that cut out the bottom end and filters that cut out the top end. The filter that cuts out the bottom end is actually called a high pass filter or an HPF. Now, the reason that it's called that, it's a little confusing. You'd think it would be called a low cut filter since it's cutting the lows. But technically, it's called a high pass filter because it allows the highs up here to pass through. On the other side, there is right here, low pass filter or a high cut filter. You'll, you'll see both sometimes. And that's because it lets the lows pass through while it cuts the highs. The other kind of filter are shelving filters, shelves. And what these are is they just allow you to boost or cut the entire bottom end or boost or cut the entire top end, depending on what kind of shelf you've selected. Now, obviously, all of this deals with frequencies, which are the vibrations that the instruments uh, create whenever they make a sound. Where I put one of these filters is going to entirely depend on what frequency area I'm wanting to affect. So you can actually see right here that this particular area of the frequency spectrum, which is basically this entire graph, is about 248 hertz. So that's squarely in the low mids. If I move it up, you can see it goes up. So this is 5000 hertz or 5 kilohertz. And hertz are the unit that frequencies are measured with. Basically, the higher the hertz number, the higher the pitch of the frequencies. Now, the next part of each filter is the volume amount. So you can actually see right here, I have this boosted about 19 dB. dB stands for decibels. It's how we measure volume. If you are new to recording or mixing, you're going to see dBs on pretty much every tool that you're going to use. And you can see as I boost it, the number goes up. And as I cut it, the number goes down. We have a negative signal right there. So the number underneath that is the Q. And what the Q is, is basically just how wide your filter is. So if I go down here to my Q amount, you can see as I get higher, as the number goes up, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. And vice versa, as the number goes down, as it gets closer to zero, it gets wider and wider and wider. It depends on the EQ that you're using. Some EQs, you can actually go up to a Q of 100 and can go all the way down to almost zero. At that point, though, it starts to become kind of negligible because, well, if I'm boosting or cutting this much, I'm not really leaving anything good in the spectrum. So most of the time, you're going to be sticking somewhere between 0 0.5, 0 0.7, somewhere in there, or three or four for your normal cuts. And if you're trying to do more of surgical cuts, something to, to really clean, something really nasty out of the sound, then you might want to have a much thinner cue like this. So something that's going to be a lot more of a, of a spike rather than a wide cut or boost like this. Speaking of those spikes, the next piece of jargon that I want to cover is room resonances. Now, these are basically rogue frequencies that get pushed extra loud because of the shape of a room or the shape of an instrument. And usually room resonances are not multiple frequencies. It's not like, oh, there's a room resonance that is 200 through 400. It's usually one frequency. So let's say, you know, I'm listening to an acoustic guitar and there's a resonance that's happening at 230. Well, I can go to 230, I can boost it up. If I hear some really aggressive, like boo, single note sound, no matter what chord it's on, well, that's probably a room resonance. So what I would do, get a really, really sharp cue and just cut that fully out. 
That's the thing that you're going to hear a lot. You'll hear the term surgical EQ a lot. Anytime there is a spike like this, where you have an extremely tight Q and a very, very deep cut, that is surgical EQ. That's meant to basically take out these resonances that only existed because of the room. They only existed because of the microphone. They aren't actually natural to the recording. So you're wanting to just cut them out completely like a surgery. So another piece of jargon that I want to go over with you is what's known as the spectrum analyzer. So I'm going to play this mix right now. So you see all these random spikes and grooves, all these lines. This is the spectrum analyzer. Now what it's basically doing, and I'll stop it, but I'll freeze it so you can see. Now what this basically is, is it's showing you the frequency content of that moment that's going through the EQ. So I can see, okay, so this particular mix has a lot going on between 500 and 3 kilohertz, has a little bit of a hole around 4.5 kilohertz. It's got a hole down in the, the subs. These things are useful because they allow you to get a mathematical idea of what your ears are hearing. So it gives a, a visual aspect to what's primarily an auditory technique. You know, you usually do EQ with your ears and your ears alone. So this is a helpful tool to have and most modern EQs use it. Now, if you're using an analog EQ, then it's most likely not going to have a spectrum analyzer. And that's fine. Honestly, it might even be better to learn without one of these. But if you have them, it's great to at least be able to see what's going on in that particular track. It might help you find some of those resonances. You know, there might be some extremely high spikes, maybe like this one right here. It might also help you to find parts of a particular instrument that are lacking, that need some boosting or are maybe too much and need some cutting. Now, the last piece of vocabulary that I want to go over is the concept of masking. So masking is something that happens in acoustical physics. So in the world of sound, it's something that happens whenever two sounds that create similar frequencies, similar sonic energy are both played at the same time. So rather than both of those sounds becoming twice as loud because both of them are being played at the same time, they actually only get a fraction of the amount of loudness as you would expect. And while that sounds very, you know, sciencey and kind of like, okay, who cares if it's a difference of loudness? What happens is that you lose clarity because both of those instruments are fighting for the same space in the frequency spectrum. So whenever you have masking, usually what that means is things become hard to hear, things become covered up, masked, which is the, the reason why the term exists. Masking is usually helped by doing lots of EQ cuts, creating space for uh, for instruments in different parts of the frequency spectrum. If you're ever hearing anything and it sounds very full in your ears, and then you put it in context of the mix and suddenly it just vanishes, that's likely due to masking. We're gonna be covering all of these concepts throughout this entire course, but I just wanted to make sure that before we even started, we had the best foot put forward so that any jargon that you were confused about, we just got that out of the way now. So let's move on from here to our next lesson. So we are gonna talk about what an EQ can do. More specifically, we're gonna be talking about the four goals of using an EQ. If you can do all four of these things, then you are gonna have an incredible sounding song. So goal number one is to get rid of the nasty stuff in your recordings. Goal number two is to enhance the good stuff. Goal number three is to blend the recordings of the mix together. And then goal number four is to balance the tone of the entire mix. So let's look at these four goals of EQ in a little bit more detail. So the first goal was to get rid of the nasty stuff in your recordings. So what I mean by that is basically getting rid of room resonances. Now room resonances are rogue sound waves that bounce off of your room and get stuck 
in your microphone. And they basically cover up the quality of a track. It's kind of hard to hear the full splendor of a recording with all of these room resonances bouncing around. So throughout this course, I'm gonna be teaching you how to get rid of that nasty sound, the ringing that you hear in a lot of your recordings. So goal number two, to enhance the good stuff in your recordings, that is basically going to be creating a tonal balance in one specific instrument. So that might be you using your electric guitars, listening to your electric guitars and being like, man, you know, this sounds good, but it could be crisper or it could be warmer or uh, it's a bit too muddy or maybe ah, it's a bit too harsh. EQ is the solution for all those things. Now goal number three was to blend all of the instruments together. Now what that means is to create space in the frequency spectrum for every single instrument to sit nicely. So they're not all fighting for attention because usually what happens is whenever you throw a ton of tracks all in the same song and you hit play, it doesn't really sound like a song. It just sounds like a whole bunch of random instruments playing at the same time. So one of the goals of EQ is to shape all of these sounds so that it sounds like a mix. It sounds like a song. It no longer just sounds like a collection of random recordings. So finally, goal number four is to balance the tone of the entire mix. So what I mean by that is that we are wanting to make the tone of the whole mix as consistent throughout the song as possible and also sound good in any speaker you would want to play it in. Now, I know you've probably played your songs in your speakers and they've sounded great after you've mixed them and then you've taken them to your car and they sounded awful or you've taken them to your friend's house and they've sounded terrible. That's because your mix's tone isn't balanced. You might have awesome sounding instruments, but the tone of the whole mix is out of whack. So we're gonna be going over that as well. Now, we need to talk about that word, balance. Because balance is something that is absolutely paramount to learning how to mix well. And it's absolutely paramount in learning how to EQ well. So let me tell you a quick story. So back in the 40s and 50s, audio engineers, the people in the music studios who are actually recording everything, they actually used to be called balance engineers. And they didn't have all of the fancy technology that we have today. They didn't have EQs. They didn't have compressors or reverbs or any of the automation that we have, or obviously computers, all they had were volume faders. That's it. All they had was the ability to turn the volume up and the ability to move the microphone around. But their goals were the same as our goals are right now. They want to achieve balance in the mix. We want to achieve balance in the mix. We just have a lot more tools to do it. So when we talk about balance, in mixing we really mean three different things. We want to balance the dynamics, which that's going to be your compression. We want to balance the space, and that's going to be your panning and your reverbs and delays. And we want to balance the tone. That's what we're working on in this course. That is what we're going to be using EQs for, is balancing the tone of the entire mix. And because of that, if you go back and you listen to sounds from the 40s and the 50s, Obviously, the stuff now sounds a lot better than the stuff back then because we have more tools available to us to achieve balance. I'm going to be teaching you how to get rid of the nasty stuff in your recordings, how to enhance the good stuff in your recordings, how to blend your recordings together, and how to get the entire mix tone balanced so that no matter where you play your song, it's going to sound incredible. It's going to translate and it's going to sound ultimately professional. And if you're able to master these four things, you are going to have an incredible sounding mix. Now, before we can move on to learn the techniques on how to actually accomplish these goals, we need to learn what an EQ can't do. It's really, really important. And that's going to be in our next lesson. So let's talk about what an EQ can't fix. So this tool is not a miracle drug. It's not going to solve every single problem you could possibly have in a mix. Now, there's tons of tools that you use in a mix to solve certain problems. Compressors help to shape the dynamics. Reverbs and delays help to shape the space. Pan knobs also help to shape the space, make a mix seem three-dimensional. Different effects help to shape the emotion of the mix. And EQs, you know, they work to shape the tone of the mix. They work to balance the frequency spectrum, balance all that sonic energy. While that is true that that's what an EQ is for, there are certain things that it's just not going to be able to fix 
So you want to make sure that you are doing everything in your power to fix these things at the stages where they're set in motion. Now, that all sounds so vague. So let's just get into the five pitfalls of mixing, the five things that an EQ just can't do. Number one, an EQ cannot fix a bad recording. EQs can only change what's already there. It's boosting parts of the frequency spectrum, it's boosting the sonic energy, or it's cutting some of the sonic energy. It's not adding anything. It's not adding new sounds. It's not completely taking away old sounds. All of that is determined in the recording stage. So a bad quality recording is not gonna be able to get fixed in the mix. You have to get the best quality recording you can. Now it can be helped for sure. You can make a bad quality recording better, but getting it up to pro level, which is ultimately where you want it to be, just isn't gonna happen. So there's a rule of thumb that I always come back to whenever I'm doing any recording. And it's basically the idea that whatever quality that I create in the recording stage, I can only really raise that quality by one or two levels. Let's think of this quality in terms of grades. So if I make a really great recording, you know, let's say it's like B level, 80%. Well, I'm going to be able to take that up to an A level with mixing, be able to raise it to where it sounds like a professional record. But if I make just an okay recording, let's say it's a C grade, I'm only going to be able to take it up one grade. So I'm only going to be able to take the quality of that from C average to B pretty good. Now, most of us who have bad recordings aren't even really hitting that C grade. It's D or F failure. So I'm not going to be able to take it from F to A. I'm not even going to be able to take it to, from F to C. So you need to be able to focus on getting the best sounding recordings that you can. The problems for your bad recordings, well, we could take an entire course just on that, but there's four things that are probably affecting it the worst. And that is the room that you're recording in, the mic placement, the gear you're recording through, and the gear that you're playing on. All of those are kind of the main variables that are causing your recordings to sound really bad. Now there's ways to fix all of them, you know, you can get acoustic treatment for your room. You can maybe improve some really subpar recording equipment. You can learn how to do better with your mic placement to get the best possible sound, or you could upgrade your own gear. There are definitely ways to fix this, but the most important thing to remember is G-RATS. That's G-I-R-A-T-S. Get it right at the source. That's the most important job for mixing. If you can get it right at the source, your mix is gonna sound incredible. Even if you're not as good at mixing as I am. If I'm mixing with really, really crappy tracks and you're mixing with studio recording tracks, you might get a better mix than me. It's possible. So that's the first thing that EQ can't fix. The second thing is that EQ can't fix a bad arrangement. So if you have written, for example, four bass parts that are all happening at the exact same time, EQ is not going to save you. That's just going to sound jumbled. It's going to sound like a mess because all four of those bass parts are competing for the exact same spot in the frequency spectrum. It's all that sonic energy all existing in the exact same place. No amount of EQ is going to fix that. And on the same side, if you've written tons of different instruments that are all existing in the same octave, you know, the same musical octave, then you're probably going to really struggle with your EQing. Stuff just won't sound like it fits no matter how much you cut, no matter how much space you create in the mix. So one of the best ways that you can solve this is to spread your parts out musically. I might even go into your songs and say, okay, you know, there's five different things that are all happening at the same time. How can I put all five of those things in a different octave. Now you don't have to put forth tons of effort necessarily. It could just be looking at, you know, two or three guitar riffs that are all happening and saying, okay, maybe I can take this one up an octave, or maybe I can take this one down an octave, spread it out. Another thing you can do is if you can pick instruments that have different tonal qualities from each other. So for example, if you have two guitar parts, let's say maybe you've got some chords, 
and you have a riff. I would suggest, if you have multiple guitars, to record one of those parts with a brighter guitar and another one of those parts with maybe a warmer guitar. You're not going to have to try quite as hard to get those two parts to fit together because they have sonic energy in different parts of the frequency spectrum. So you're not having to fight against the two of them just to create space so that they're not elbowing each other trying to stand at the exact same spot of the room. Ultimately, the less buildup of sonic energy that you have in one spot of the frequency spectrum, the easier it's going to be to balance your mix, the easier your job is going to be. So the third thing that EQ is not going to be able to fix is a bad performance. And I, I feel like this is pretty obvious. I don't think you necessarily need me preaching at you about it, but EQ cannot create emotion. Now EQ can make it brighter or maybe a little bit less distracting, but if it's a boring performance or an out of time performance or an out of tune performance, then that's not really going to matter. The listener's going to be bored or distracted or will just lose interest. So you have to get it right at the source. You got to get it right during the recording session. I would rather someone give me a less polished recording that is super emotional than someone give me something that is maybe an incredibly good recording, but uninspired performance. So try really hard. Try to give the best performances that you can. Now, the fourth thing that EQ can't fix is a bad volume balance. Now, this is something that's actually overlooked a lot. All of the tools of mixing are really sexy. Learning about all of the gear and learning how to do everything and just feeling like a wizard. Whereas the volume faders are boring. You know, you turn it up or you turn it down and, and that's really it. But it's actually, in my opinion, the most important step in mixing because it's laying the foundation for the rest of the mix. Volume balance is almost like its own form of EQ. If a super bright instrument is pushed up really, really loud in a mix, even though all of the other instruments might be very warm or dark, that whole mix is gonna sound really bright. It doesn't matter how much you EQ out all the stuff in the other instruments, it's gonna be a very bright mix. The simple solution to that, just turn it down a little bit and all of a sudden, boom, it feels good in your head. That's a good rule of thumb to take from this. If you can't get an instrument to sound good with EQ, it might just be too loud. Try turning it down a few decibels and see if that fixes the problem. So finally, we get to number five. An EQ can't fix a bad listening environment. The room you're mixing in is affecting the sound coming out of your speakers quite a bit more than you might realize. I don't know if you've had this experience where you've sat down and you've just fought with the mix for hours and hours. You've tweaked and tweaked and tweaked until finally it sounds incredible. And you go and you show it to a friend at their house through their speakers and you listen to it and it sounds like crap. Well, there might be a lot of reasons for that, but one of the big reasons is that you might be listening in a poorly treated room. So the sound that's coming out of your speakers isn't accurate. So even though you might be making great EQ moves, great mixing moves, they're only gonna sound good in this one space. They're not gonna sound good everywhere else. You need to be mixing in an accurate space so that you actually know what EQ moves you're making because otherwise you might be turning things down that don't actually need to be turned down or turning things up that definitely shouldn't be turned up. That means investing in acoustic treatment. Now that's a bit of a complicated subject. So I've actually attached some resources so that you can go and start to learn what you need, where to put it, and how you can get your speakers to sound as accurate as possible so that your mixes sound good everywhere. So those are the five things that EQs can't fix, the five pitfalls of mixing. So now that you know that, you're going to be able to go out, make sure that you're getting great recordings, great performances, that you're getting a great arrangement, and that you're getting a great volume balance, and hopefully, mixing in a good listening environment, your mixes are going to sound 10 times better if you spend the time that you need to spend to get all those things right. Now, one of the biggest and most frustrating questions for beginners with EQ is where do I boost and where do I cut? You have this tool, you know how to use it, 
but you have no idea where to even start. So one of the reasons that this is such a hard question to answer is because music is so hard to describe. You know, there's no scientific terminology to describe what something sounds like. So we end up having to use descriptive words like, oh, that sounds warm, or like, oh, that sounds really distant, or, oh, you know, that sounds really aggressive. Now, that's all well and good, but what does that actually mean? Like, how can I use the word warm and turn it into something that I can create with an EQ? So enter the balance chart. So this is a custom chart that we've made at Musician on a Mission to be able to connect these words of feeling, these words of emotion, these subjective words that you use to describe sound with actual frequencies, actual frequency ranges. So now if you're saying, oh, you know, like that sounds warm, you can say, oh, that's probably because it's balanced in between about 100 hertz and 400 hertz right about here. So it not only shows you where the tone you're looking for probably lives in the frequency spectrum, but it also shows you where the tones you don't want to have live in the frequency spectrum. So you can see that the top of the chart up here has a lot of harsh words like boxy, muddy, harsh, sibilants, stuff that you don't want in your sound, stuff that as you're listening to your recordings, you might use to describe it. And you see over here, there's a little arrow with one part that says too much, and down here, one part that says too little. So if you have too much sonic energy in a particular part of the frequency spectrum, let's say around 200 hertz, well then your track probably sounds muddy. But if you don't have enough sonic energy in that area, well your track might sound pretty thin. So what we're going for is to balance the tones of our instruments and to balance the tone of our mix so that all the words that we'd use to describe it are all here right in the middle. Nothing is too much. There's not too much energy. Nothing is too little. There's not too little energy. We're living right here with a balanced frequency spectrum. So using the balance chart in your mixes is honestly really simple. All you have to do is print it out, maybe keep it to the side or maybe keep it up on your screen. And whenever you're trying to EQ a sound, just sit there, close your eyes and listen and say, okay, well, this sounds full. Well, awesome. That means that your mids are really well balanced. Or you might listen and just be like, man, you know, this sounds really hollow. You know, it just sounds oddly empty to me. Well, that means that there's probably too little sonic energy living down here in the low mids, maybe the bass, or maybe the mids. So all you have to do is find the words that you're going for and it's either saying, oh, I want this to sound full and then saying, okay, why doesn't it sound full? Or it's saying, oh, this sounds muddy or oh, this sounds hollow or some kind of uh, synonym for those words. Obviously these aren't all the words that you could possibly use, but most of the synonyms for those words are on this chart. Then all you have to do is go through the process of finding what part of that area is causing the problem. What part has too much energy? What part has too little energy? And then balancing it out, making some boosts, making some cuts, and making sure that it's sounding just like you'd like it to. Now we've used the word balance a lot. Why am I leaning so much into the phrase balance? Well, that's because it's not just about cutting or boosting, it's about creating balance in the frequency spectrum. That's really important. You're not just saying, oh, cool, I want this instrument to sound better, therefore I just need to boost it a bunch. Or, oh, this instrument sounds too much, therefore I need to cut it a bunch. Oftentimes, you know, the solution is, let's say, you know, oh, this sounds distant, well, maybe I just need to boost it in this area. But sometimes it might be a situation where rather than this area being out of whack, maybe this area over here is actually too loud. And so it sounds distant to your ears, not because the upper mids are out of balance, but because maybe the bass or the low mids are out of balance. So you might need to go and make a few cuts over there and all of a sudden, bam, it's no longer distant to your ears and you didn't even touch that part of the frequency spectrum. Now that comes with time. That's obviously something that you learn to do the more you practice with this, but it's important for me to tell you balance is the focus. It's not focused on boosting or cutting 
or enhancing, it's focusing on balance. And the nice thing about this chart is that the more you use it, the more you'll internalize it. This is ultimately something to teach you what parts of the sound live in what parts of the frequency spectrum. The more that you use it in your mixes, the more you'll be able to listen to a sound and just be like, I want that to sound warm. Okay, I should boost it in the lower mids. And you go and you do it. You don't even have to look at the chart. But until you get to that point, using this chart is going to be a huge help for you. So let's give it a shot with a few instruments and see how it actually works. So here we are with a few examples of how we can actually use this chart in practice. So first off, we're gonna start with the vocals right here. So I'm gonna hit play, and I just want you to close your eyes and listen and think, how would you describe this vocal? What's the problem with this vocal? You were meant to be adored by more than just me. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes recklessly. So now let's actually look at the chart. So to me, I could use two different words to describe this. I could describe it as, you know, maybe it's too warm or maybe it's muddy, um, but I could also describe it on the other side as distant. It feels really far away. And partially that's because it has some reverb on it, but it really does feel like it's lacking any kind of character, any kind of emotion. It's just kind of, it, it almost sounds like the person is talking into their hands like this. So what that means is I want to search in this area. So kind of between 1.5 kilohertz and about eight kilohertz. So I'm gonna go over here and we're gonna get myself an EQ, like right here. And I am going to make a band and let's uh, see what happens. You were meant to be adored by more than just me. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes Recklessly. Now you hear how all of a sudden that opens up, the emotion is there, and I'm boosting very aggressively because I, these are examples where I actually went and cut stuff out. I don't think it's necessary to boost this much, but you can hear the difference. Let's do a before and after. So here's before where it sounds really distant. You were meant to be adored by more than just me. And here's after, where it sounds quite a bit more balanced. You were meant to be adored by more than just me. Simple as that. So now let's go and check out these drums. I'm gonna loop them, same thing. I want you to close your eyes and listen and think what's wrong with these drums. To me, the word that I would use is harsh. They sound really grating. They kind of hurt to listen to a little bit. So if we go to our chart right here, search for the word harsh, well, boom, there we see it. So up here in the mids and the upper mids, so around one kilohertz, all the way over to about eight kilohertz. I would want to search in there and see if by boosting the sonic energy in that area, if that solves my problem, if that balances the frequency spectrum out. So we're gonna get another EQ up and let's see what happens. Ooh, that sounds real bad to me. I'm gonna take it down. Let's turn it up just a little bit. See, and that sounds balanced to me. Let's do a before and after. So here's before. You can hear all of that like that's going on. That is just so much sonic energy just sitting in that upper mids area. And then when we take it out, It's balanced again. 
So let's go and check out our acoustic guitar, or excuse me, electric guitar. We'll bring this up. Same thing, close your eyes, listen, see what comes to your mind. There's a few words that I would use to describe this. I might, you know, I might describe it as distant. I might describe it as maybe weak. Uh, you know, I would even more than that, though, I'd describe it maybe as busy. You know, it feels really busy, but then the part's not that busy. Why should the sound be busy? And I think the word I would use to describe it the most accurately is muddy. It sounds like it's just chock full of mud. So if we go to the chart, you can see that sits about right there. So that's kind of a hundred hertz to around 500 hertz. Let's open up an EQ, see if we can balance it back out. That sounds a lot better to me. So here's before. And here's after. We've just scooped a lot of that mud out. We've balanced the frequency spectrum. Turn it up just a bit. Easy as that. Now I have one more example for us. Let's go and look at this full mix and let's see what happens. So close your eyes and think what you think is wrong with it. Fire, fire. Fire. So what do you think is wrong with this? Now, most of the mix actually sounds pretty good, but if you're listening to it, you're realizing there's not really a lot of bass. Like there's not, there's not really a lot of oomph in it. You know, it, it sounds thin, I would say. That's the word that I would use to describe it. So if we brought up our chart, you can see that thin is in fact, it's the sub bass, the bass, a little bit of the low mids. So let's bring up an EQ and see if we can balance it out. Yeah, so listen to the before and after. So here's before. Fire, fire. Okay, and here's after. Fire, fire. Fire, fire. And after. It just sounds a lot more full. It's got a lot more warmth. It's got a lot more clarity. It's got a lot more bottom end. And ultimately, it sounds balanced. And that's what you're gonna be using this thing for. You're going to be using it to balance your tones. You're gonna to be using it to balance the tone of your mix. And eventually, you'll be able to get rid of it. You'll be able to know exactly how to do this by yourself without using this kind of tool. So hopefully this tool will help you out in the future with your future mixes. So when it comes to knowing where to boost and cut when you're using your EQ, there's one central question. What are you listening for whenever you're making your decisions? If you don't know what's causing a certain sound, then you're not really gonna know how to fix it. Or you might not actually be able to pick out what the problem is with the sound. You, you might just know, well, there's something wrong with the guitar. It just sounds off, but I can't really tell what it is. So that is where ear training comes in. So ear training is about tuning your ears to hear the details in a sound. So most people actually only hear 
the overall picture. You know, they see sort of broad strokes what's going on around them, or rather they hear broad strokes what's going on around them. Now, in order to mix well and EQ well, you need to be able to hear the details in the instrument that you're mixing. You need to be able to hear the sounds within the sound, the sounds within the instruments, not just, oh, that's guitar and it sounds weird. But you need to be able to say, oh, that's guitar and it sounds too brittle. And I know that that's probably because right there in around 2K is probably too much. Something along the lines of that. Now that might seem impossible right now, but if you train your ears, you'll actually be able to notice those small details. You'll be able to focus in and hear all of the intricacies of a sound. Now there's three techniques that I'd recommend doing to do your ear training. So the first is what I call the bench technique. All you have to do, grab a notepad, a pencil or pen, and go and find a bench in a local park or a mall or a busy section of town or a Starbucks or whatever. It honestly doesn't matter. Then I want you to close your eyes and just listen for five minutes. And I want you to write down everything you hear. And at first you might write down just, you know, the obvious things. Like if you're in a mall, you're like, okay, well I hear music happening and I hear, you know, people talking in front of me as they pass the bench. But then eventually the longer that you sit there, you'll start to write down, well, I hear footsteps and I hear the air conditioner and I hear uh, someone using a power washer in the back, you know, and I hear birds chirping outside and I hear uh, people rustling through clothing in the store that I'm sitting right next to. Things that you wouldn't have noticed had you not really sat there and tried to just pick apart the individual sounds. The ear hears 100% of the sound around you, but the brain does not. That's a big thing to know when it comes to ear training. The brain actually blocks out quite a bit of the sound so that you can stay focused on whatever is happening in that moment. So you're going to have to retrain your brain to hear all of the sounds that are happening around you. You're going to have to practice. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna go and sit on the bench, you'll write down what you hear, and then you'll be done. And then you move on to the next place, maybe on a different day. And you're gonna write down what you hear and you'll notice, oh, you know, I'm actually hearing more here. And you'll go to the next place and you write down even more. And then I want you to come back to that first bench. And I want you to write down everything you hear. And the more you do this technique, you'll actually notice that you can start picking out sounds that were fully blocked from your consciousness. I mean, that just you would have not have ever heard had you not sat there and practiced paying attention to everything going on around you. This skill is so needed in mixing and in EQing because you have to sit and listen and be able to almost spread the sound out in front of you and say, okay, I see the whole frequency spectrum. I'm listening with my ears and there, that's the problem. You know, almost like in the Iron Man movies and the Avengers movies, whenever Tony Stark is able to create those holograms around him and kind of mess with them and pick out the exact piece of data he wants, that's what you're doing with sound. That's what you're doing with your instruments or your mix or your vocals. You're trying to hear the sounds that make up the sound. So that is technique number one for ear training. The next technique that I'd recommend is to use training programs, ear training programs. They are actually out there. The two that I would recommend going and checking out are Train Your Ears and Sound Gym. Now, pretty much what they do is they allow you to upload music and they will play the music without any EQ applied. And then they'll actually, you know, they'll randomly boost or cut something in the mix. And you have to sit there and for all intents and purposes, guess, you know, okay. Well, this sounded like it lost a lot of upper mids. You'll click upper mids and it'll tell you if you're right or wrong. And what'll be interesting is right when you start doing it, it'll probably be pretty frustrating because you'll feel like, oh, I'm just guessing. I'm not really, I don't know what I'm doing yet. But the more you do it, the faster your ears will get used to those sound changes and the faster you'll actually be able to fully understand when something is out of whack 
and what's out of whack about it. That's the big thing. Not only just, oh, something's wrong here, but like, oh, something's wrong and it's a problem at 400 hertz. You'll be able to say that. It's honestly really incredible. So I definitely would go check out Train Your Ears and Sound Gym. Both of those are, are great options. There's also other ones that are out there that you know I am unfamiliar with. If you get a recommendation from another teacher, go try that one out too. So the last technique that I want you to try is what I call the vowel technique. And this one's kind of weird, but it's extremely effective. So stick with me on this. So basically, your voice can help you find problems in the frequency spectrum. Now, the vowel technique is based on this rule that when your voice produces vowel sounds, it's actually changing the sonic energy that's coming out of your vocal cords. So one vowel might have a ton of energy in one part of the frequency spectrum, and another vowel might have a ton of energy in another part of the frequency spectrum. So you can use these vowel sounds to determine what part of the frequency spectrum is out of whack. So let's talk about these words. And we're actually gonna whisper them because it basically spreads the frequencies out across a certain area, which makes it easier to compare it to a mix. Do you think of it like making white noise out of your voice? So the first word in the vowel technique is boot like a boot that you'd wear. And that is going to be roughly around 250 hertz. So like boot, boot, that kind of sound. And the next word is toe. That's gonna to be around 500 hertz. So toe, that kind of sound. The next word is father. And we use the word father just because it's easier to remember. It's really the fa sound that we're going for. So fa and that's gonna be around one kilohertz. Then we're going to use the word bet, bet, that sound. And that's gonna be around two kilohertz. Then we're gonna use the word beat, like a beat on a drum or a beat like a vegetable. So beat. And then finally, we're gonna use the word kiss. And with kiss, we actually are focusing more on the S sound than the I sound. So you're really just holding the S. So like kiss that sound. Right now, I am gonna actually go in, pull up some white noise, boost in those areas, and you'll be able to hear that what I'm doing with my voice is actually what's happening, for the most part, in those white noise areas. So, I have some pink noise set up here, and we are actually gonna use this EQ to test out this technique. So the first word is boot, and that's at around 250 hertz. So I'm gonna turn this up. Okay. I'm gonna turn this on. And I'm gonna solo it. So you hear that? Hold out the word boot. See how similar that sounds? It's got that ooh sound, ooh. Okay. Now, let's look at the next word, which is toe. And that's about 500, roughly. Toe, like that kind of sound. You hear that? You hear how the tone matches the pink noise? So the next word is father, so fa, and that is at one kilohertz, so 1,000 hertz. So let's listen to that. Fa. Fa. You hear how similar that sounds? This is something that you can do really any time that you mix. If you're trying to find problem areas and you just can't figure it out, you can use these words to find the exact spot. So the next word, bet. So, bet. I'm gonna unmute this. Bet. Okay, the next word is beat, and that's at about four kilohertz. So I'm gonna unmute it. Beat. 
you hear that sound is so similar. And finally, there's Kiss. And again, Kiss, we're really more going for the s sound at the end of Kiss. Kiss is more just a word to remember it. And that's going to be at around 6 kilohertz. Kiss. It's as simple as that. So how you would use this in your mix is you'd be listening to your instruments, you'd be listening to your mix, and as you're trying to figure out like, okay, well, where's the area where the problem probably is? Well, just go through your list. Just start going like, boot. Okay, well, it's not boot. Bah. Okay, well, it's not bet. Okay, well, it's not toe, so on and so forth. And until you get to one, maybe it's like you get to beat. And you hear the same sound happening. There you go. Now you know it's around that area in the frequency spectrum. Now, this is not a perfect system. Obviously, you know, there's no vowel sounds below, you know, about 250. There's not really any vowel sounds above six kilohertz. There is a workaround though, because if I go through all six of my words and nothing really sounds like it fits, well, I've pretty much narrowed out two thirds of the frequency spectrum. Now I know, well, the problem is probably in the bass frequencies or the problem is probably in the top end frequencies, somewhere in there. And then I can go and search around and try to find exactly where the problem is. So this is something that you can use to learn what different parts of the frequency spectrum sound like, but also use it practically in your mixes. So if you're able to combine all three of these techniques, you know, the programs, the vowel technique, and the bench technique, then you're gonna be able to train your ears really quickly to know exactly what you need to do whenever you're using an EQ to be able to see exactly where the problems are. Not only where the problems are, but just to hear the problems. Again, to be able to Tony Stark it and look at the entire frequency spectrum around you and say, okay, I'm listening and it's there. That's the problem, the upper mids. When you're trying to find a place to cut or boost in the frequency spectrum when you're using EQ, one of the best tools that you have in your toolbox is a technique called Sweep EQ. Now, it's something that you can use to find specific areas to change the tone. Like if you are, for instance, you're saying, okay, well, I want this to be brighter, but I don't know exactly where I want to boost, or maybe, oh, this is too muddy, but I don't know exactly where I want to cut. This technique is going to help you do that. Also, this technique is fantastic for finding things called resonant frequencies, which are really, really common in home recording. Without getting too technical and in depth on the acoustic physics, basically resonant frequencies are like rogue sound waves that because of the shape of your room, they just kind of bounce off the walls in parallel. And so they'll just sort of get stuck, which because they get stuck, they get louder and louder and louder as they bounce back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. All this being said, resonant frequencies are extra dirty, I could say, and they happen mostly in home recordings, not in studios, because usually studios are designed to avoid resonant frequencies. Now, they're a little bit difficult to explain what they sound like unless we go in and actually start, you know, listening for them and working with them and getting rid of them. So I figure we just do that. Let's get right into it. Let's listen to this acoustic guitar. I have three examples of different instruments that have some resonant frequency problems and also some tone problems, both of which that I can solve with Sweep EQ. And I'll teach you what that is in just a moment. But first, I just want you to listen to the guitar. So can you hear just the the note that pops up, just the do 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 up there, that's a resonant frequency. It's basically a note that's getting caught and it's making it extra loud. So what we're gonna do to find that is we're going to obviously turn on our EQ and we're gonna use sweep EQ. So what you do whenever you're trying to do a sweep EQ is you're gonna create a band like this. You're going to narrow the Q a little bit, kind of somewhere between 1.5 and 2.5, somewhere in there. You're gonna boost it up. And like the name implies, you're just going to sweep around until you can kind of generally hear that like, oh, this is the area that's sounding really bad. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. So I'm just gonna start at the bottom and slowly sweep up. There we 
we go. So you hear that? Doo, 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 doo. I'm not a singer, but you know what I mean. That the high note that's up there. So because we were able to sweep from the left and the right, we were able to easily find where that frequency was. So now what we want to do is we want to narrow our cue as we're listening back and sweep around in this area to try to find that exact frequency. So it's almost like we've been looking at the frequency spectrum through a telescope from really far away, sort of seeing the, trying to find like the general area. Now we're putting it underneath a microscope and we're trying to really zoom in and find the exact place. We're like, oh, that's the frequency. That's the area that's really blowing up. So I'm gonna do just that. Lower this cue and I'm just gonna sweep around. There we go. Hear that? All right, I'm gonna make it even narrower. And this particular EQ has a cool function where I can actually solo out just this one band. So I want you to hear exactly what a resonant frequency sounds like. So I wanna hit play. Right there. It's just one big note. So now that I've found it, I've zeroed in on it, I'm actually going to turn it down and cut it pretty dramatically. So the amount that you cut with resonant frequencies, it depends what you're going for. If you're just trying to get rid of it completely, then get rid of it completely. Go all the way down and that's okay. If you're just trying to rebalance it, maybe you know, it's a rogue frequency that got sort of just a little bit too boosted. You might want to just cut it by 10 or something like that. I, I would use your ears. If you start losing some serious tone, you've gone too far or your cue is too wide. If we're making these kinds of cuts with a wider width, that's a lot of frequency. There's a lot of sonic energy that's going to start to get cut. So we are wanting to keep it pretty tight so that we're just getting that one note. So let me make sure that I didn't just mess up the frequency. Cool, all right. So let me show you a before and after. So I'll actually show you after first because it's one of those things where, you know, it's, it's hard to hear resonant frequencies sometimes until you take them out and then you're just like, how, how did I not hear that? So here's after. Okay, and here's before. Hear that high note? It's just in there and you can't unhear it. But this one in particular, this acoustic guitar is interesting because it actually has multiple resonant frequencies. There's two notes side by side that I've been able to hear that are both causing problems. So we're gonna find that one as well. We're gonna do the exact same thing. We're gonna create a band we're gonna narrow the cue and we're just gonna sweep around till we find it. So kind of right there. There it is. You'll know if you find it, if one frequency just gets louder and louder and louder and louder, that's how you know, like, oh, I found something bad. So let me cut that. I'm going to tighten the cue up a little bit. Okay, so let's listen to the after. So here's before, or rather here's after. And here's before. Listen how nasty that sounds. We had no idea that was even there. Like our ears just didn't really perceive that that was there. And it just cleans it up. Resonant frequencies are something you really want to focus on whenever you're doing home recording because they're basically mud on a new pair of shoes. You know, you've got this really beautiful recording that you painstakingly worked over and these things just sort of sit on top of it. 
But the cool thing is that you can take them out. Obviously, it's like I just cleaned all the mud off the shoes. And all of a sudden, I can see the details. I can see the shine. Let's do one more before and after. So here's after. And here's before. So that said, I do still want to do some tweaking on the tone of this thing. You know, I'm hearing a lot of boom down here. I don't exactly know where, but there's just like some thump. And maybe there's a little bit too much, you know, harshness in this, which usually means, you know, somewhere in the upper mids is a problem. So I'm going to do two more instances of sweep EQ to try to find exactly the place that I want to boost and cut, but this time more for tone and less for, you know, something utility like this. Okay, same thing. I'm still going to make it a little bit narrow. For tonal boosts and cuts, whenever you're doing sweep EQ, you don't want to boost it quite as much when you're searching because then you could lose context of what the rest of the tone of that particular instrument sounds like. So, you know, if I was looking for a resonant frequency, I might boost this up by, you know, 20 decibels, 20 dBs. But since I'm just looking for a good tonal place to cut, I'm going to stick around 10 or 12. That's feeling pretty boomy. Ooh, so is that. So I might actually want to cut two different places. So your tonal boosts and your tonal cuts can be wider than the cuts that you're making for the resonant frequencies. So I'm going to keep the cue pretty much where it is. Let me actually zoom in here so that it's easier to move up and down. Okay, you know, that gets rid of some of the boom, but there's still that part down here that I really want to take care of. So I'm gonna do the same thing, sweep around. Yeah, listen to that. That's not even a note, it's just a boom. In fact, I actually think this is also a resonant frequency. It's funny that we looked around for a tone thing to, f to fix, but we actually found another resonant frequency. It's one note that no matter what chord is being played, it's just there. It's happening. Yeah, let's cut this. All right, let's do a before and after again. So here is after. And here's before. Listen to that. Listen to how dirty that sounds. Here's after again. Now, we did lose a little bit of volume, but I want to go in and make a quick boost. There's kind of something in here that's really harsh in me, but I do really like the sound of the mids on this. So I actually want to sweep around in here and see if there's something that, that is worth boosting. So I'm going to do the same thing. Lower the cue a little bit, and let's sweep. And then I'm going to do the same thing over here to get rid of some of the harshness. So you hear there's just that like crinkly sound, that like clink, clink, clink sound that's happening when I boost here? I don't really want that. So, ah. 
shoot, I hate it when I do this. Okay, there we go. So let's cut this. And finally, this actually isn't really a part of boosting and sweeping, but you're still doing some sweep. I want to get rid of some of this low end noise. And so I actually want to use a high pass filter or a low cut filter, whatever your EQ calls it. And all this is going to do is it's just going to cut everything beneath this yellow line. And the same rules apply. You know, I want to sweep, 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 sweep until I start to lose tone, you know, until stuff starts sounding less interesting, less big, whatever you want to call it. And then I'm going to back it back up just a little bit. Okay, that's sounding a lot better to me. Let's do a quick before and after. So here's after. Here's before. Way, way more cleaned up. So now that we've done all this cutting and boosting, we actually want to check and make sure if we've lost some loudness, you know, because we've cut so many frequencies out of this sound the volume's probably turned down a little bit. So I'm gonna to wanna to turn the volume of the output up to compensate, because I wanna make sure that the loudness stays the same, because otherwise I'm not really gonna know if it's helping or hurting. Let's try two. It sounds pretty close to me. I would say that that is pretty well cleaned, especially considering how rough it was before. So let me show you one more. I'm gonna show you how to do this on a drum set because obviously drum sets don't have pitches. They don't have tones, but they still get these kinds of resonant frequencies. And obviously you still want to shape the tone for your own ends. So let's listen to this. So this is just a room mic. It's not the full set. It's none of the direct microphones. That's why it sounds so roomy, but you will get these kinds of resonant frequencies in the direct mics too. Like this isn't unique to just room microphones. That said, I'm hearing something that's sounding kind of boxy to me, kind of just like ball, ball, ball. So I'm gonna search around kind of like the low mids, mids area. That's, that's where that stuff tends to live. So let's get up our peak, boost it up, make the cue a little bit more narrow, and let's do some sweeping. Getting there. There it is. Here's that like kind of sound. So let's narrow the cue. There it is. Yeah, that's definitely something that I don't want to have in my sound. So I'm going to narrow this and cut it. Let's see before. 
it's crazy. It's still there's still a lot of work to be done on this, but it's crazy how much just that one cut cleans the sound up. So before and after. Before. After. Great. Now I'm definitely sensing some harshness in this for sure. So I'm going to grab another peek, narrow the cue, and let's slide around in here and just see what happens. Yeah, that's definitely hurting. That's a little bit better. Now I'm also kind of wanting a little bit of this top end. There's there's some harsh harshness in the uh, in the hi hats that's really bothering me. Okay, let's boost this up. Ow. Woo, yep, there it is. Okay, let's cut that. Okay, and let's do before and after. So here's after. And before. And after. And before. It's a lot more controlled. Now we've definitely lost some volume on this. So let's turn it up a little bit and you know turn it off and on and see when it sounds pretty close. Sounds pretty good to me. Now, the cool thing about that, whenever you get these things level matched, is you're able to just, you, there's not necessarily too much of a tone shift, as much as it's just clean. It's a clean new pair of shoes again. So hopefully this technique is gonna help you find exactly where you wanna boost, where you wanna cut, and hopefully you've also learned a lot about ways to clean your tracks whenever you're recording them at home, whether that be changing some of the tone or finding the resonant frequencies so that you can have a nice, crisp, clean pair of shoes. Hey, Future Dylan here. So one piece of feedback that we got on the course after we initially released it was more people wanted to know how you hear resonant frequencies. You know, understanding the concept of sweep EQ is extremely important, but first you obviously have to be able to hear, you know, what is going on inside of a sound. You know, what makes a resonant frequency sound like a resonant frequency. So I actually have a few examples of resonant frequencies on screen right now. We're gonna be going through all of them and figuring out exactly what we need to do to find them, you know, figure out what we need to be listening for, and then using our sweep EQ technique and cutting them out. So before we get started, let's talk about what instruments are the most common with having resonant frequency problems. Usually you're going to see it with drum sets, you're going to see it with acoustic guitars, you're going to see it with uh, sometimes with upright basses, uh, with pianos, sometimes with vocals. Basically, if you have a microphone that is, you know, a little bit farther away from the instrument itself, these instruments are going to have more resonant frequencies because they are capturing more of the room. The farther the microphone, the more room is gonna be captured. There's just no way around it. So let's start off with our first example. We are gonna start with the acoustic guitar. Now, in my opinion, the acoustic guitar is maybe the most common instrument that has problems with resonant frequencies. Now, there's all these different instruments we just talked about, but the acoustic guitar is especially bad. 
Now, that's because not only are the microphones usually a little bit farther away from the guitar itself, so it's picking up more of that room sound, but also the body of an acoustic guitar, it does have some natural resonances that happen inside of it. And sometimes cheaper guitars, yeah, you know, they get to be a little bit too aggressive. So there tend to be more resonant frequencies in acoustic guitars, even if they were recorded in the same room as the rest uh, of your instruments. So let's listen to this example and see what we might be able to hear. And a great calling card for resonant frequencies is to listen to the, uh, the sustain of the chord. As the rest of the frequencies die down, are there any frequencies that are standing out, that are continuing to stay loud? That's the best trick that I've got for you for finding these kinds of resonant frequencies. Now, of course, these are things that you are going to eventually just learn to hear. Like the more you practice doing this, the more your ear is going to be able to pick out, oh, you know, there is a frequency around 600 that's being extra loud. You'll just be able to go and cut that. That takes time, but it is 100% doable. So if you're working with any instruments and you think there might be a resonant frequency, try and see if you can find a place where there's some decay happening, where maybe, you know, the bass hits a chord or the bass hits a note and it falls off or the guitar hits a chord and it falls off or the drums hit the cymbals and the cymbals slowly die down. So as I'm listening to the sustain of this, I can hear here there's some issues in kind of the low end and there's some also some issues in the mids. So listen again. Okay, so let's start up in the mids, in the low mids. It's just a little bit easier to hear those. So I'm gonna get up a band and I'm just gonna start sweeping around until what I think I hear in my head starts to become a little bit more focused in. Kind of around right there, you hear that? That doom doom. So as I was sweeping around, I knew I heard it, and so I'm going to basically center around that area, and as I continue to sweep, I'm going to slowly change the cue. Now this is something in Pro Q2 and Fab Filter. I can do that by just holding down a key on my keyboard. Obviously, for most EQs, you're gonna have to actually turn the knob, but that's okay. Basically, as you get closer and closer to finding this one frequency, just adjust the cue, make it a little bit more narrow, and we'll go from there. Right there. And you know you've really found it as you are making your cue more and more narrow it never ever goes away whereas if you're making it more narrow and it kind of pops out of your ears sometimes that means you're really close to the frequency but you're not quite on it okay so let's cut this That already sounds a lot better. Let's do a quick before and after. Here's after. Okay, there is another frequency that I can hear though, kind of there in the mids, the lower mids. It sounds like it's a part of the chord, but it's just lasting the entire time. It's a little bit above this one that we just cut. So let's find that. About right there. What is that? Mm, mm, mm. Ah, you can hear it. I'm not a good singer. So again, we're just sweeping around and slowly narrowing the cue until basically it is as tight as we can get it where, you know, we're still getting the frequency and we're never losing the frequency. That's the big thing. Like I just lost it right there. So too tight. All right, there we go. So let's cut that. Okay, so before and after, here's before. Here's after. 
Okay, so we've gotten rid of that problem, but now the base is really, really, really aggressive. And there is, I mean, partially, I would just probably do a big wide cut here because there's way too much low end in this guitar in general, but there are two resonant frequencies that sound like they're coming from the actual hole of the acoustic guitar itself. So let's check that out. Yeah, right there. So with resonant frequencies in the acoustic guitar, you often find ones that are so low that they kind of stop having a pitch and they're just a boom. So with those, they're not really sustaining for very long, but they aren't really contributing to the chord. They're just noise. Like right around there. Kind of like that. See, like that's not actually a part of the chord, it's just noise. Now, I think I'm hearing one more, and usually you don't want to get too aggressive with cutting resonant frequencies. After you do two or three, sometimes you really just start to get a little trigger happy, and you end up cutting all of the life out of the sound. But ultimately, there is still one more hanging out in these lows that I can hear. So let me grab that. Cut them around right there. Hear that? Right there. So let's take that down. Not bad. So we've obviously lost a lot of loudness by doing all of this cutting. So I'm gonna go over here, I'm gonna grab a VU meter and we are going to just make sure we're gain staging it correctly. You know, it's got to stay the same loudness. So here's before. Kind of somewhere between zero and three. So we've obviously lost a lot right there. So let's add three, ah, probably more than that. So before. And after. And at this point, it's still extremely bassy. That's where I would just, you know, have a really large wide cut there. This has nothing to do with resonant frequencies. It's just bothering me how bassy it is. Pretty huge difference, right? Let's look at this upright bass. So like I was saying before, it's an upright bass, so it's mic'd a little bit farther away from the actual instrument. Though sometimes you do hear stuff like this in bass guitars as well. It's really, really common. So I'm gonna bring up my EQ and let's just listen. And the same thing as before, we are listening for particular frequencies that are just popping out too loud. They are so loud that we, we just, hear them. They don't sound like they are a part of the note or the tone. They sound like in their own actual frequency. So you can really hear it again in the decay of this. Now this unfortunately doesn't have any sustained notes. It's all staccato. But listen to the decay again. There's some some kind of uh, wackiness going on in there. It sounds like there's something in the mids that is making it sound extra nasally. And I really wanna get rid of it. So I'm gonna get my peak and we're gonna start sweeping around. Yeah, there it is. Let me solo that. So now that we found it, let's cut it. Let's do a quick before and after. 
here's after. It's way cleaner, right? Before? And after. Now you can really focus in on the actual note and you're not hearing this weird octave above sort of mess that's going on. So now I wanna look at these piano mics. Now, every single one of these piano mics actually is picking up its own resonant frequencies. And that happens sometimes. Now they're all probably picking up the same resonances, but because particular mics are being pointed different directions, they're actually picking up certain resonances as a lot louder than other resonances. So let's start off with this one. You can really hear it again in that decay. There's just a few notes in the mids that are really, really standing out. So let's get up a bell, start sweeping. Hear that? Right around there. There it is. I found you. A lot of times it's it's very much a scavenger hunt. You are just moving around, slowly making the cue thinner, trying to zero in on exactly what you're hearing. Right there. There's actually one right next to it as well, which is interesting. So we'll probably be cutting out two. Right there. And when that happens, you're gonna wanna make your cue extremely thin because you're gonna be cutting out quite a bit just because they're right next to each other. So I'm hearing something else up here. Let's continue to sweep. Right there, I think. There it is. Hear that? It's lasting for a very long time as it decays. Now I can actually also hear a resonant frequency that's coming from the sustain pedal of the piano. And sometimes this is one single frequency, sometimes it's many different frequencies, but more often than not, it's gonna be living down in the low end. Yeah, right here. Just that big boom. Almost like it's a, like a percussive hit. So if that happens, you could zero in on the exact frequency, or you could still have a fairly wide cue and then just cut a lot of it. Cause there's not really any frequency, like there's no sonic energy around there that I actually really want. So I'm just gonna cut it. There's one more I'm hearing. Right there. So let's do a quick before and after and then we'll move on. Here's before. And here's after. Quite a bit cleaner. Let's check out this mid mic. So you can hear some of those same frequencies are also problematic, but different ones are popping out even more aggressively. So let's get up our bell.
right there. That's definitely a rough one. And I'm hearing one kind of in the mids as well. Out here. There you are. Oh my. Yeah, there's kind of just some noise right there, right? Obviously not part of the chord. Ooh, it's so much cleaner when you do that. So here's before. after. And I probably would want to go in here and actually do some gain staging as well. So I probably lost about 2 dBs. Yeah, quite a bit cleaner. And then let's check out this final one. Same thing, you can hear a different frequency that is really, really present in this. Do right there. So let's find it. Sometimes it's very helpful to have this tool where you can solo out an EQ. Ooh, this one's got a lot of noise from that sustain pedal. I'm hearing one more thing, again, kind of in the lower mids. One more. You hear that, like, let's go really, really high. Right there. Or there it is. Much better. So before and after. Let me actually add a little bit. So finally, let's look at a few drum examples, because this is another instrument that you see all the time having either resonant frequencies or potentially some like sizzle that's really annoying or some ring because maybe the drums are actually mistuned. That happens all the time with home recording. So let's check out these overheads. And again, we're gonna listen for the decay of the sound. See if there's anything that's really sticking out to us. And I'll give you a bit of a hint Listen into the symbols. See what's uh, what's sounding bad to you with the symbols. There's something in the top end that is almost like it's behind the entire set. Like as the decay happens, that particular note does not change. Let's find it.
yeah. Like right there. That hurts quite a bit. Now there's a few more that are really hurting my ears up here as well. And one trick, if you are doing anything with uh, like overheads like these, or maybe you specifically hear a resonant frequency in one part of the frequency spectrum, just throw on a filter just for a moment, just to allow you to focus. around here. Yeah. Now you've got to be careful with symbols because there's so many different frequencies that are happening that sometimes you can actually take out too much. So I tend to be pretty gentle with, with these. You could see like I'm not cutting out 20 dBs, I'm only cutting out a little bit. Like right here is really where I'm hearing a lot of it, but I am hearing some more up here too. Yeah, like right there. Oof. That's much better. Let's take this down. Okay, so here's before. And after. Way, way better. We don't have that just super harsh sizzle going on at the top. So sometimes when this happens, I lose a lot of top end and obviously the overheads are meant to be used for top end. So sometimes I like to compensate by adding a top shelf, a high shelf, and just boosting everything around these frequencies. It's my happy little compromise. So here's before. And here's after. Ah, oh, so much better. Okay, I have one more example for us to listen to, and that is the snare top and the snare bottom. Now, this is a really interesting example because you actually hear two different rings in both of these microphones. And this is just because of exactly what I was talking about earlier. You have a snare drum that is, it's tuned incorrectly. And so different microphones are picking up different sounds. And this isn't really a resonant frequency, this is actually just the ring of a drum. So let's start off by listening to the snare top. And again, you're listening for the notes inside of the notes. Listen to that decay. There's something kind of living up here that is just not nice. It's like, it's falling off too. It's like, boo, boo. So let's get up my bell, start sweeping. That's definitely too far. These ones are always interesting because they're very specific frequencies and you really have to go in with a magnifying glass.
right there. So here's before. And here's after. There's way more crack in it. So now let's check out the snare bottom. And see, this one has almost the opposite problem. There is a pitch that is bending up. It's like boom. Boom. It's kind of around here. There you are. So just a very, very different sound. So here's before. And here's after. Before. And after. Now, some people don't like to get rid of the ring of their snares. That's totally okay. If that's the tone that you're going for, then go for that tone. But sometimes when you get these issues where a snare drum might be misaligned, mistuned in some way, and you get sort of that weird contrasting ring, then uh, finding the resonant frequencies, that's totally okay to do. So obviously the thing you need to take away from this video is that Sweep EQ is your best friend for cleaning up resonant frequencies. But the other thing that you can take away is that if you listen to the ends of the sounds, listen to that decay, that's where you're gonna hear a lot of these notes because they sustain much longer than the rest of the notes around them. So now that we've gone over this, let's move on to our next video. So another tool you can use when you're trying to figure out where to boost and cut in your mixes is what's known as reference tracks. So reference tracks or reference mixes, depending on who you're talking to, are basically just professionally mixed tracks, professionally mixed songs that are in the same genre, as the song that you're mixing, have similar instrumentation as the song that you're mixing, and generally have a tonal color that is close to what you're trying to hit. Basically, you're not necessarily saying, oh, I wanna make a carbon copy of this mix, but you are giving yourself a target to hit. You're saying, if I sort of get into that general area, then my mix is gonna sound great. Now, there's a few reasons for why we would want to use reference tracks. The first reason is it's one of the best ways to be able to get your mixes to sound good in all speakers. It's one of the best ways to get your mixes to translate well. And that's such a hard thing for new mixers to do. You know, it's so often whenever you are finished mixing your track, you've mixed for hours and hours, it sounds incredible in your speakers and you take it to your car and it sounds like crap. You know, you take it to your friend's house and it sounds terrible. That's because of translation problems. Basically, the tonal balance of your whole mix is off. So by using a target like a reference mix, you're going to be able to base the sound of your track off of a track that has already been mixed in such a way to sound good everywhere. You know, a professionally done song, something that has like music label money behind it, the people who are mixing that are mixing it specifically to sound good on the radio. And if something sounds good on the radio, then it's been mixed to sound good in any speaker. Because think of everywhere that radio plays. I mean, cars, stereo systems, restaurants, clubs, giant venues. I could keep going. I'm not going to though. <laughs> but they have figured out the science to how to get your mix to sound good everywhere. So by basing your song off of that song, by basing your sound off of that sound, you're going to be able to achieve the same thing. Now, in terms of EQ, another big reason we use reference tracks is because it helps us to understand what's missing in our mix. We're able to listen to this professionally mixed song and then flip over immediately and listen to 
you know, our own mix and we'll be able to hear, oh, wow, you know, I didn't think that the low mids were so heavy, so muddy, but now that I'm listening to an actual song, it's like I can't unhear it. That's what happens. I actually like to refer to it as retuning the ears. So every half hour or so, I'll actually stop mixing, listen to a reference mix to readjust my ears, give myself another idea of what the target is that I'm trying to hit. And then whenever I go back, oftentimes I listen to what I just did and I go, man, you know, I, I made a few moves that actually don't sound very good. But in the moment, they sounded great just because I needed to be reminded of the target I was trying to hit. Reference tracks are also great for getting a really good volume balance. Now, that's not necessarily technically EQ, but I actually like to refer to your volume balance as EQ light because if something's really, really harsh, and your EQ just isn't fixing it, there's a chance it's just too loud. You can just turn it down or turn something else up if you can't really get it to pop with EQ. So being able to listen to a professionally mixed song and listen to you know, how loud is the vocal and how loud are the kick and the snare and be able to match that in your own mix, you're going to be able to create something that sounds professional much faster, much, much faster. And it doesn't hurt your creativity either. You know, using a reference track deals entirely with the science of mixing, not the art form of mixing. They're two different things. You know, for a long time, I never wanted to use reference tracks because I thought, you know, I was like, I'm, I'm an artist. I'm creating a sound. I don't want to just base my sound on someone else's sound. And I get why I thought that, because to me, it was cheating. It was using someone else's sound. It, it, was, it was almost like a paint by numbers, getting um, the Mona Lisa sketched out and then just kind of drawing or painting inside of it. Or at least that's what it felt like. The big difference is that you are using it to create a professional foundation for your mix. And on top of that, you can run wild with your creativity. It's not going to impact that at all. At a certain point, I actually stop using reference tracks because I start to care more about the tone that I'm going for. But while I'm creating that foundation, while I'm doing all of my initial EQ moves, I am constantly going back to it, constantly retuning my ears, making sure I understand what sounds good and what I am trying to do. It helps you to EQ with intention massively. So all this being said, let's look into what this actually looks like in the context of a mix. So I've got a song right here. It's kind of halfway mixed and I have two reference tracks down here, one by the band U2 and one by John Mayer. So let me show you what the original track sounds like. This is the final place. This is the big escape down through the valley line, deep in the darkest skies. I want to know my name. I want to see my face. There's gonna... You get the idea. So what I would do as I was going through this is I would, every 30 minutes or so, listen to both of these references to reevaluate where I was going, making sure that I could see the direction where I was pointing my boat, where I was pointing the rudder. I actually would recommend having more than one reference at a time. Now, sometimes I will make sure that all of them sound exactly the same. Sometimes I might use one because I like the vibe or I might use another one because I like the drum sound, like that's the drum sound I'm going for. In this case, you know, I wanted to have sort of the retro sound of this U2 song, like the retro arena rock and kind of more the upfront folkiness of this John Mayer track. So let me show you what they sound like. You can kind of hear the similarities. Let me show you the original track again. This is the final place. This is the big escape. Down through the valley line. Deep in the darkest skies. Now there's obviously a lot of differences that you can already hear in the tone. Even if the music is kind of similar. A lot more mids, a lot more upper mids in the U2 track. Whereas mine, it's a lot warmer. There's a lot more top end 
a lot more low mids. Now let's listen to the John Mayer one, which has a little bit more of that pop folk 2000 shimmer on it that I want. So that's going to sound, I think, probably a little bit closer to what I have right now. This is the final place. This is the big escape. Down through the Again, mine's still a little bit warmer. So sky. as I'm going and doing my EQing, I might want to back off a little bit on the low mids just to make it a little bit less warm. This is definitely closer to the brightness of John Mayer, but I actually would probably want to push the brightness even further to get a little bit more of that pop sheen that I was talking about. But the fact that I have these two songs available for me to listen to and constantly make sure that I'm not mixing blind is extremely helpful, especially because I know that this mix is going to be much more likely to be able to transfer to all different kinds of speakers. Now, there's one trick that you need to know to setting up your reference tracks correctly. And that's that you wanna make sure that you're setting the loudness the same across all three songs. So I, if you can see, I've actually turned this song down by, what is that, 4.2 decibels, and this song down by 6.2 decibels. So I have all three of these going to a VU meter, which uh, is a thing that measures volume, but really it measures loudness rather than just your sort of stereotypical digital volume. You can get these things for free on the internet. They're very, very helpful, but it's a much better way of figuring out how close the loudness is between two different songs rather than just looking at the volume meter and trying to sort of get the peaks around the same place. So what I did is I just listened to my mix. So I played it. This is the final place. This is the big escape down through the Okay, so it's kind of between three and zero dBVU. So I want to turn, let me actually just reset these. I want to turn my references down to where they're kind of sitting in that range as well. And they're most likely going to be limited because these are finished final masters, which means that they're going to have a little bit less dynamic range than mine currently has. So rather than being a whole range, it's probably going to be just kind of between one or two. So you can already tell it's just banging on all cylinders in comparison to mine. So that's pretty close. Okay, and then what I would usually do is I would get close on the VU meter and then listen with my own ears because it's not a perfect science. It doesn't have to be absolutely exact. It's just got to sound right to your ears. So I'd go back and listen. This is the final place. This is the big escape. Down through the valley line, deep in the dark. Okay, and then I'd listen to U2 again. I in so U2 sounds a little bit too loud to me. Yeah, that sounds a little bit better. Now, I will say, usually a greater dynamic range sometimes translates to less loudness. Like the human ear actually perceives it as being less loud rather than being more loud. And so because this is so heavily limited, sometimes it might actually just need to stick around at the bottom of the range of the song that I'm currently mixing. So let's do the same for John Mayer. Pretty good. So let me listen to my mix now. This is the final place. This is the biggest key. So I made that one too quiet, so now I'm gonna want to pop it back up to compensate. Listen again. There's gonna be a change. Food on a dusk. And I still made it too quiet. That sounds better in my ears. Usually the, the trick to this is you want to be able to flip back and forth 
and it not sound to your ears like, whoa, that was weird. Like al- almost like if a DJ at a party was to, you know, flip from one song to the next song immediately, it wouldn't just immediately be like, whoa, that's too loud or whoa, that's too quiet. But kind of like, yeah, you know, like that feels natural to me, even though it might be weird just because, you know, the song's playing one chord and then it's just all of a sudden playing another chord. You know, how music works. One chord and then another chord happens. But I think you know what I mean. So one thing that you don't want to do is you don't want your reference tracks to be influenced by any of the mix bus processing that you have on your stereo output that you have on your mix bus. You want to be able to route it to a different output. So usually what I do is I actually will create a bus and I will send all of my instruments to that bus. And I I labeled that bus mix bus and I basically say, hey, this is my new stereo output and I do all of my processing on it. And then I send that to the actual output, which is also where I send my references. So all of my tracks are getting sent to right here, this bus that I've labeled main out, main output. And then this, the output is just the stereo output, the regular output. And you can see right here, the output of these references is also the stereo output. So it's very simple. You just need to set the outputs of all these instruments to one single bus and then set the output of that bus to the regular output and the references to that output as well. And now you can see when I play U2, for instance, nothing's coming in on the mix bus. But whenever I play the actual mix, this is the that's going through the mix bus. This is the biggest key. Dump. Simple as that. It's going to save you a lot of heartache and it's going to save you from having your own EQ moves and your own, you know, mix bus compression and stuff like that influencing the sound of the reference. Because if that happens, you know, then you kind of start to create a like an unwinnable cycle where you make a change based on your reference and then that change is reflected in the reference and then you have to make the change more because it just sounded like the reference got louder or quieter or you know maybe got brighter or darker depending on what you're doing so you definitely want to make sure that you're not sending them both to the same output this is going to be a huge huge help for you in creating mixes that sound good anywhere you want them to and also to be able to create professional sounding mixes much much faster hello future dylan here so whenever we originally released the eq breakthrough course one thing that a lot of students asked for was a little bit more detail on how to use reference tracks to get a better overall eq sound on your mix so i figured i'd make a new video for you just to add a little bit of extra depth a little bit more uh, talk of techniques and stuff like that so that you feel confident going forward with this particular method. So right now I've got this fully unmixed song with the exception of just a little bit of volume balancing and I've got a reference track down here. And before we get started talking about how I would actually use this, the techniques that I would use, I just want us to listen to the two. You know, just listen and start to internalize the differences in sound. So first off, here's the unmixed song itself. Hello, tired friend. Hello. You found me, you found me hiding. In Madrid. And then here's our reference, which the band actually gave me. This is the song they most wanted the tone of this song to match. Same night, same humility for those that love you. Anyways, anyways. So you can already hear there's some pretty significant differences between the unmixed version and our reference track, which makes total sense. There's literally zero processing on this. We've just got a few raw tracks. So what exactly would I do to get the EQ of this particular mix to, uh, you know, better fit my reference? Well, there are three specific techniques that I like. Uh, One of them I'm actually going to link to a YouTube video that we've created in the past. This is down below the video uh, on the course right now. It's a great trick on actually creating a tighter low end. But another one, and in my opinion, a more foundational one, is using our balance charts. So if you remember from a few videos ago, the balance chart 
is this chart right here, which shows all of the different parts of the frequency spectrum. And usually the words that we use whenever either there's too little energy, too much energy, or a balanced amount of energy in that part of the frequency spectrum. So my favorite way to use reference tracks at the very beginning of the mix is to sit and listen to my mix and then sit and listen to my reference mix and think, okay, what are words that I would use for my reference mix that I wouldn't use for my mix? And with that, I tend to think of more words in the green. It's like, oh, you know, my reference mix has more definition or it's fuller or it's warmer. But if I was gonna do it the opposite way, maybe I wanted to listen to my reference track first and then listen to my mix, well then I would probably be looking more for words in the red, like, oh, in comparison to the reference, my mix sounds harsher, or my mix you know, maybe sounds darker or thinner. And we are basically gonna be able to use these words to create our mix bus EQ, and then eventually to refine the actual EQ of our instruments themselves. So let's try out this first method. We're gonna to listen to our, our mix just for a moment and I'm very quickly gonna switch over to our reference mix. And we are going to think of what words in the green apply to the reference mix, but don't apply to our mix. And before I start, it's very important to do your gain staging. You wanna make sure that the reference mix is at the same level of your current mix. To do this, I like using a loudness meter like this one and just playing each of them until you're getting around the same S level or the same I level, and then just turning, probably turning down the reference because it's most likely much louder than your current mix so that they're hitting around the same numbers. So let's listen to our original mix and I'm gonna bring up the balance chart so that we can have a look at this while it's going. Hello, tired friend. Hello. You found me, you found me. Okay, and now the reference. I'm definitely hearing a lot more definition, hearing a lot more presence, it feels a lot more forward. Kind of feeling a little bit more punch. Okay, so now let's do the opposite. Let's go back and listen to our original mix and see if we can hear any of those red words that we would use. I'm gonna play this one more time just to reorient the ears and then I'll quickly switch back. Same night, same okay, and now our old one. You found me, you found me so definitely pretty distant, a little dull. Kind of muddy. So maybe a little bit too much going going on around the, the low mids. Feels kind of weak, so maybe it needs more bass. And maybe a little brittle as well. It's feeling like it's distant, doesn't have enough character, but at the very top end, it's just a little fragile sounding. So this has already given us a fantastic starting point to actually use this to fix our EQ. We know that this particular reference mix sounded present in comparison to ours, which sounded quite a bit more distant. And then our reference mix had some nice punch to it, whereas ours sounded quite a bit more muddy. So that's telling us, you know, we don't have enough information, enough energy in the upper mids, but we have too much energy in the low mids. So what would I do with this information? Well, I would go and first start off with a mix bus EQ. So I'd bring this up and I'd use the information that I just got to start making some boosts and cuts. And we're gonna talk more about mix bus EQ in future videos. So if this is getting a little ahead for you, uh, don't freak out, we'll get here. But the point of a mix bus EQ is not to fix every instrument, it's to make the overall tone of the mix a little bit closer to something that's gonna make more sense out in the world. So for this one, I'd say I probably, like we said, want more energy in the upper mids, a little bit less energy in the lower mids. So what I would do is I would grab a bell and I'd start sweeping. Hello, tired friend. Hello. I'd try to find kind of an area that sounds the best to my ears. Hello, tired friend. Hello. Be like right here. You found me, you found me. 
And then I want to take out a little bit of these lows or low mids. Tired friend, hello. You found me. Maybe right, right here. Found me and it felt like I needed a little bit more of my low end as well. So. Hello, tired friend. Hello. You found me. You found me hiding in the tree. And then we talked about the fact that it feels just a little brittle. So I might add a, a high shelf and take it down just a bit. Hello, tired friend. Hello. Okay. And let's do some quick before and after so we can get our gain staging right. Hello, tired friend. Hello. Okay. Hello, tired friend. Hello. So it's around the same area. We might have lost maybe half a dB. Hello, tired friend. So let's listen before and after. So here's before. Hello, tired friend. Here's after. You found me, you found me hiding in the tree. See, it's a little bit closer to what the reference sounded like. Let's go back and forth. Hello, tired friend. Same humility for those that you found me, you found me. Now, I probably would want to get a little bit more detailed with this, you know, there might be rather than just one large boost that I needed to make right here, there might be like a boost here and a boost here that was a little bit more necessary. You know, I wouldn't want to just add a boost and move on. I do really want to make sure that I'm getting my mix bus EQ right, because if I don't get it right, you know, it's getting slapped onto the entire mix. It's really, really important to make sure it's sounding good. So that's the first method that I could use to match my reference track EQ to my actual track EQ. Let's talk about another one. Now, this one is a little bit harder to do, specifically because it takes gear that you might not actually have, and that is using match EQ. So what match EQ is, is it basically listens to your reference track or whatever track you want, and then it listens to the current track that you're working on, and it uses EQ to basically correct the differences in the average frequency level. It's honestly a pretty ingenious piece of tech. So I've got one right here that's just basically a part of Isotope's Ozone. And what I've done, I've actually already put in a reference track just to save a little bit of time. All I would do with this is just hit the capture button and it will listen to what the reference track is doing. And so now I'm gonna wanna hit capture on the target audio section and it's just gonna listen to our mix and you'll see what happens. Hello, tired friend. Hello. You found me, you found me hiding in the tree. So check out what's just happened. Pretty much what I thought was an issue was in fact an issue. You know, we needed a little bit more in the low end. We needed a, quite a bit less in the lower mids and a little bit of the mids actually. And then it looks like a lot of our upper mids was boosted and a little bit of our top end was cut. So this pretty much confirmed the suspicions that I already had. Now, the cool thing with this though, is that you can do it obviously very, very quickly. And I can also affect you know, how smooth it is and how much I'm actually adding. So let me put this on right here and let's flip back and forth between the reference track and the actual mix. Hello, tired friend. Hello. I love you. Anyways, any In the dream. Someone better it sounds a lot closer to the reference track, right? Now, obviously, it does kind of mess up a few instruments. To me, the vocals sound kind of thin now. So probably what I would do is during the mix, I would go in and I'd most likely be boosting some of the low mids and the vocals to fill them out. You know, this is like putting a filter on the entire mix. I'm still gonna have to go in and do some compensation in the instruments themselves. I still want everything to sound good, but this is bringing us as close as we can 
with as large of a brush stroke as possible. So if you were to use Match EQ, I personally don't actually like leaving this on my mix bus. Um, I like to have a little bit more control over what I'm adding. So I tend to use this more as a template, more as a guideline. And then I would use my own EQ and uh, try to copy it a little bit. And obviously I've kind of already done this a little bit, but I'd say, okay, well, you know, maybe a little bit of a boost around 80 Hertz and maybe a cut around 400 and another cut around 800, maybe a little bit of a wide boost between 2K and 10K with an extra little bump around 5K. And I would use that to just go in here and actually make what I'm looking for. Hello, tired friend. Hello. You found me, you found me hiding. So by taking some time and making something that looked a little bit closer to this, and it's not perfect, and I'm honestly, I prefer it not being perfect, you know, I'm able to get something that I have control over. Part of the reason that that's really important is because match EQ is matching the exact frequency spectrum of your reference. And so your reference might have an instrument that doesn't have the tone that yours has. And so there might be like one particular frequency bump that yours doesn't have, but it doesn't need. Like I'm making this up, but let's say right here, you know, this little blue bump was maybe because they were using a particular symbol that just had a lot of energy in this specific frequency area. And just because I didn't have a symbol that had energy in that specific frequency area, doesn't mean that I need to do a huge boost on the entire mix just to get it there. You know, I care much more about getting the overall average EQ, kind of nudging it in the direction that I want, rather than getting it to where it is literally exactly the same as my reference. I really don't care about that. So that's it for reference tracks and using them on your mix bus EQ. Now, obviously, you can also use them to get your volume balance right. All you need to be doing is just listening to your mix and then listening to the reference track and then thinking, how loud is the reference track snare? How loud is my snare? How loud is their vocals? How loud are my vocals? And seeing if you can parse just the general levels uh, between your mix and their mix. And you're not really ever trying to get it perfect. In fact, it's probably gonna sound bad if you get it perfectly the same because their mix has been fully mixed and fully mastered. Yours hasn't. You're just trying to get it in the right direction. And then as far as EQ goes, it's listening to that particular snare and thinking, okay, why does this snare sound the way it does? And then listening to your snare and saying, okay, what is it missing? And that is just using the exact same strategy that we use with the balance chart. But instead of using it on the entire mix, you're using it on just the snare. You know, maybe the snare on your reference track sounds extra warm to you and your snare sounds a little bit too muddy or a little bit too thin. Well, you know that that means you need to make some cuts or some boosts in the low mids. It's the exact same concept, it's just using a magnifying glass onto a very specific instrument. So hopefully this has been helpful. Let's move on to our next video. So if you're trying to figure out if you're making the right EQ decisions in the mix or not, there's another tool in your toolkit that's gonna help. It's called gain staging. So gain staging is just a fancy word for making sure that your instrument is the same loudness before you EQ it as it is after you EQ it. There's a few really important reasons why gain staging is necessary. So first, let's get into the obvious. If you were to go in and EQ something, and let's say you, you, know, you cut a bunch out of it using a filter, well, the volume is gonna go down. It's gonna become quieter. And vice versa, if you were to go in and boost a bunch with an EQ, well, the volume is gonna become louder. So here's the rub. Human ears perceive louder sounds as more exciting and quieter sounds as less exciting. It's a weird trick with the human anatomy that for some reason we attach emotion to louder sounds. So because of that, it's really easy for beginners to, let's say, boost a whole bunch 
maybe a lot of stuff that is honestly like really low quality boost stuff that's making it sound worse but because all of a sudden the track is louder you know they think oh it sounds better i'm more excited i'm more emotional right now and on the flip side maybe they make a bunch of cuts and they're all great cuts they're really cleaning up the sound they're really balancing the frequency spectrum, but they listen back and they just think, ah, you know, it's just less exciting. It's less interesting, less powerful, throw in whatever word you want to put in there. That is one of the big reasons why gain staging is important. We want to make sure we're hearing exactly what is supposed to be heard. We're not hearing our EQ inaccurately. So in reality, you can't know if you're helping or hurting an instrument with EQ until you gain stage it. You can't really know what you're doing. You've got to gain stage it. Now, the other important reason why we gain stage our EQs is because of what it does to the frequency spectrum. So let's go back to our example and let's say that you know, you've cut a whole bunch out of an EQ. When you increase the volume so that it's the loudness that it was before, you're essentially turning everything up except for what you wanted to cut. In reality, it's almost like you're boosting everything else. Like you're cutting something and you're boosting everything else. That makes it a lot easier to balance the frequency spectrum because you're not having to go and like cut a whole bunch of places here and boost a whole bunch of places here. You're just doing it right then and there. So let's actually go into what this looks like. And I want to use Logic's EQ because it does a better job, in my opinion, of showing you what's actually happening in the frequency spectrum whenever you're boosting and cutting and then gain staging. So I have a vocal right here. Let's, let's listen to it. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes recklessly. Let's just cut a whole bunch out of the lower mids. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes recklessly. Or let's actually cut, cut I this can right here. tell by the blaze in your eyes recklessly. So we're doing a really big cut. Obviously. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes recklessly okay so we're losing a lot of volume and we're going to go into a little bit how to actually figure out the exact uh, amount of volume to increase so that it's getting to the same loudness as before but let me just show you what i'm doing so i've made a really big cut here in the middle of the frequency spectrum you know if i was leaving it there all i have done is cut but let me go over here and turn the volume up See what's happening? So the EQ is basically saying, hey, I want to boost everything here, and I want to boost everything here, but I still want to cut right here. So after I've gain staged, I've basically just turned the rest of the frequency spectrum up. I've cut the sonic energy I want to cut, and I have enhanced all of the other parts of the sonic energy. Understanding this is actually going to keep you from making tons and tons of cuts and boosts in an attempt to enhance what you could just be enhancing with some cuts and a volume increase. So let's go and actually learn how to gain stage. So I'm going to go back in here. I'm going to turn off my EQ and I'm going to open up a VU meter and I'm going to listen back. I'm going to talk in just a moment about why I'm using a VU meter and not just the regular volume meter. But first, let me show you what we're gonna do. Let's listen before. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes. So it's kind of living somewhere between three and one on average. Now, let me turn the EQ on and let's see how far it dips. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes. So kind of seven to five, seven to four. So maybe try increasing it by about three decibels and see what that does. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes. Yeah, that's a little bit closer. So now all we have to do is bypass it, listen to it, and see if it really actually has level matched the loudness. So here's before. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes. Here's after. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes. So I might actually want to increase it a little bit more. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes. 
I can tell by the blaze in your eyes. That was maybe a little bit too much. I might take it down just a hair. But we're able to accurately hear now what's going on. And, and obviously, I made a massive cut, and so it sounds bad. But you're able to hear how bad it sounds more accurately, because rather than just cutting the mids right here, effectively I'm boosting the low mids. I'm turning up the low mids by 3.5 decibels. So now all of a sudden, even though I've cut a lot of the mids out, it sounds boomy. And you wouldn't think it would sound boomy. Well, like I didn't go in and you know, boost anything in the low mids. That's where the boominess lives. But this is exactly what we've been talking about throughout this course, which is that making cuts in certain places, once you've gain staged, is just going to boost everywhere else. And sometimes there is a reverse effect that happens. Let's really quickly talk about VU meters. VU meters are the meters that were used in older studios before the digital revolution came out in about the mid 80s. So if you close your eyes and you really imagine, you know, like think back to like the 50s and the 60s, the old sound boards and those knobs that are at the top of the mixing boards, those are your VU meters. This is basically the way that they told volume. So VU meters are not the same thing as your DAW's volume meters. They're different. They're very different. Even though they're both reading volume, that's all they're doing. Here is the main difference. And before I can talk about the VU meter, let's just talk about your DAW's meter. So your DAW uses what's known as DB full scale or DBFS for short. Now you can forget that name for the rest of your life. You are only gonna need to know it just so that I can explain the difference. Computer volume reading is extremely accurate. So every single microsecond, it's reading the volume exactly correctly and it's showing you exactly where it is at every single moment. Well, our ears don't perceive volume accurately. We don't hear volume accurately. We actually hear sound in averages. So rather than getting an accurate depiction of the sound every single microsecond, we're kind of just getting an amalgamation of it every half second or so. And, and I'm kind of making up the uh, actual numbers, the, the, the amount of seconds. It doesn't really matter. The important thing to know is computer volume, very, very accurate to what's happening, very inaccurate as it relates to the human ear. Now let's go back and talk about VU meters. So VU meters are actually less accurate. They are a less accurate way to tell volume, but they are a more accurate way to tell loudness because these were designed to read volume in the same way that humans read volume in averages. So it's a very slow meter rather than like going up and down and making all of these massive peaks really, really quickly like you would see on a full scale meter. It's a little bit slower. You're kind of just seeing it move up and down. It's not going to go up and down immediately. If a sound would just be all over the place, maybe it would be, you know, from negative 25 to negative 3 to negative 16 to negative 30 and, and back up and down again. On a VU meter, it's probably going to stay around here. It's probably just going to be between 0 and 7, you know, a, a much more manageable range of decibels, because that's exactly how our ears perceive it. And I would recommend using a VU meter on every plugin that you use, because you're going to want to gain stage every plugin that you use, because the concept of loudness applies to everything. I might throw on a distortion and I love it, but really I've just turned it up by four decibels. And if I gain stage it, I might listen back and say, oh, you know, actually this just makes it sound really brittle. I don't think I like it. So these things are cheap. They aren't something that come with your DAW, but they are either very cheap or free. In fact, I can recommend a free one for you. It is TB Pro Audio's MV Meter 2. It's a free VU meter. All you have to do is go to their website and download it. Just make sure that you select VU as the option instead of DB Full Scale, because otherwise, it'll just be a regular volume meter, just like you have on your computer. And at that point, then it's just a fancy looking user interface. It's not actually helping you at all. So to get a little bit more practical 
As for where you want to put your VU meter, I would actually put it at the end of your stereo output, at the very end of your mix bus. That way you don't have to add one to every single instrument channel whenever you're doing any kind of mixing. You only have to add a single instance of it at the very end of your plugin chain. And then all you gotta do, you know, I usually have it pretty small. I kind of just put it up here in the corner and let it go. And whenever I'm doing my mixing, you know, I'm listening and occasionally I'll look up and just be like, oh, cool. That's where it is. Let me go and turn this up and we're good. So let's look at another example. I'm still going to use the vocals, but instead of just doing a cut, I'm going to do a few cuts and a few boosts because you'll find that sometimes you've kind of leveled yourself out. Like you've boosted a few things, you've cut a few things. And so you've actually kept the loudness pretty much the same. So let me show you what that's going to look like. And I'm just going to make some random cuts and boosts. I'm not really even going to try. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes recklessly. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes recklessly. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes recklessly. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes. Red. Okay, so let's go back and look at this. So I've made two huge boosts, two huge cuts. Now let's look at what this was before. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes. Okay, so kind of three to one. Now let's look at what it what it is after the EQ. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes. So it's still around three to one. It's actually just a little louder. So I might take it down by one decibel. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes. So even though we made two massive cuts, the boosts overpowered it just a little bit, but just a hair. You know, if I was to take these cuts out, we probably would have made it five or six decibels louder, but we balanced it out, so we only needed to turn it down by one decibel. So let's listen before and after. So here's before. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes. And here's after. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes. Simple as that. Obviously, this didn't make it sound good, but that wasn't really the point. So this is something that you can do in every mix, on every track, with almost every single plugin and it's going to make your mix sound better. This is a trick that really just changed my life. But if you're gonna use it on nothing, then just use it on EQ, because that's going to allow you to actually see what you're doing with your EQ, rather than just making it louder and thinking it's better, or making it quieter and thinking that you made it worse. So here's a question for you. How do we know that the EQ that you just put on your instrument actually improved the sound? It's such a subjective thing. It's so difficult to listen to your EQ and actually know if you made the right choice or the wrong choice, especially because the more you listen to that instrument over and over and over again, the more you start to lose the ability to tell the difference between what it used to sound like and what it sounds like now. It all just starts to sound like one thing. You can't hear any of the subtle differences anymore. And not only that, but usually, you know, your brain is telling you, hey, you're mixing. That means that you need to EQ or you need to use this EQ. And it is so frustrating to finish a mix and go and take off some of your EQs and then realize, man, I don't think I actually helped this. I think I heard it. And I think I heard it because I was so set on just throwing EQs on everything and moving on. There is a technique to get you out of this EQ rut and it's called the AB test. It's very, very simple, really, really easy to do. We're gonna go over it right now. So pretty much what the A-B test does is it's a technique that allows you to listen to the before and after versions of the track 
without knowing which is which. That's the kicker. Because usually, you know, you just put a lot of work into that EQ that you just put on your instrument, you've got some sense of pride in it. It's like subconsciously, it's gonna sound better to you regardless if it is or not, because it's yours, it's your baby. So the entire point of the A-B test is to divorce your ego from this whole process, to allow you to make a choice without actually knowing which thing you're choosing. Here's all you have to do. Very, very simple process. So I have an electric guitar here that I've just created a random EQ for, and we are going to do the A-B test on it. Now, the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you gain stage your EQ. That's really, really important because your EQ might make your track louder or it might make it quieter. And pretty much no matter what, you're going to want the louder sound over the quieter sound, even if it actually sounds worse. What we are talking about right now is gain staging specifically for loudness, not for volume. And this is something that we've talked about in other videos. So we're going to be using a VU meter for this, which is a volume meter that pretty much just covers loudness rather than simply volume. And we're going to be using this to figure out if we are adding or taking away gain. And spoiler alert, we're adding or we're taking away a decibel. So I'm actually going to put this back to zero and I'll show you what we're talking about. So let's listen to this before. So it's hitting kind of around one. Now we'll listen to it after. It's a little bit too low, or rather it's, ar it's around the same area, but I need to turn it up a little bit. Yep, okay, so that's about the same loudness. Again, you wanna make sure that you're gain staging because otherwise, this process is not going to actually be blind. You'll be able to know pretty much instantly what the original version was and what the EQ'd version is because of the different loudnesses. So next thing you're going to do is you are going to hover your mouse over the bypass button right here. And this is the part that's weird. It's not particularly techy. You are just going to close your eyes. You can put your hand over your eyes if you want. You can just close them. It doesn't matter. And you are going to click on and off the plugin like a dozen times, just as fast as you can to disorient yourself. And you're doing this while you're keeping your eyes closed. You can even do it in a random rhythm. If you feel like you're gonna be able to count subconsciously how many times you've turned it on and turned it off. The entire point of this, like I said, is to disorient yourself so that you don't know if it's currently on or off. So once you've done that a few times, all you're gonna do you're going to use your ears, you're going to keep your eyes closed, and you're just going to hit the plugins power button, hit the bypass button, and listen to the changes. And you're going to sit and you're going to think, okay, which of these actually helps the tone of the instrument? And whatever the answer is, if you're sitting there, you're bouncing back and forth, and you're like, this one, cool. That's the one you're sticking with. Sometimes that will be the EQ'd one, sometimes it won't be. But let me show you what I'm talking about. So I'm going to do the A-B test right now. I'm going to shut my eyes. I'm going to click this a whole bunch. And now I'm going to play and we're going to go back and forth. This one sounds like it has a lot more kind of mid-range into it, whereas this one sounds a lot brighter. I think I, I think I actually like this one the best. Yeah. This one feels a lot less muddy, which makes sense because I've taken some of the low mids out. It feels a lot brighter, which makes sense because I've boosted some of the upper mids. So to me, I'm like, great, this EQ is well done. I like it. It's helped the tone. But what happens all the time is I go back and forth and back and forth and I'm like, great, this one has definitely improved the tone the most. And I open my eyes and it's just the original version. And there's no way I would have known that 
had I not done the A-B test. So here are the three things that you need to do or consider if you pick the original version. First next step, you can just leave the original track alone. Sometimes it doesn't actually need any EQ. And after you go and you do some EQ, you do the A-B test, you pick the original, you'll realize that and you'll just be like, okay, yeah, I think I'll just leave this one alone. You can also reset the EQ and just start over. I mean, you can literally just go in and for some reason it's not allowing me to do it right now, but go and recall the default on the plugin you're using, or you can just go in and delete all of your bands and just start over, hit play and go again and try to use your ears, try to EQ with an intention and fix the problem that you were trying to fix and do the A-B test again. The cycle will continue until you get it right. And then the third thing that I would try if that doesn't work is that you can try to find another solution to the problem. EQ is not always the best solution for every single problem. You know, sometimes compression is the issue. Maybe it's too dynamic and that's why it's poking out of the mix and hurting your ears. You know, maybe you need some saturation on it. Maybe there's just not enough weight in the upper mids and, you know, boosting, it's not really going to help. You need to actually add some new frequencies in there with saturation, or maybe it's just the volume balance. You know, I say that volume balance is like EQ light because as you turn things up, they get more present and their frequencies are able to be heard better. And vice versa, when you turn things down, it goes farther away from you and their frequencies are a little bit harder to hear. So if something sounds really harsh, you could EQ it out or it might just be too loud in the mix, it might be too present. You might just need to back it up a little bit. So try any of those three solutions and even, you know, any, any other solution you have. You might need to put some chorus on it or maybe it needs some reverb or some delay. Any of the standard mixing solutions could potentially work to fix this track. But those are the three things you can use if you pick the original track during your A-B test. Either leave the original track alone, try the EQ again, or try to find another solution to the problem that you're trying to fix. And by using this technique, you're going to be able to make better choices with your EQ every single time. So there are a few philosophies behind getting a great EQ balance. It's not always just use your ears and that's all you need to know. There are some things that you should use as your guiding lights, your guiding principles, whenever you're trying to decide what EQ moves to make. There's three main philosophies. So first of all, make sure to EQ with a purpose. Make sure to EQ with intention. Now, this is something that is really difficult for a lot of beginners to wrap their heads around, you know, to really be able to implement in their own mixes, because a lot of mix education is based more on, you know, tips and tricks than on actually learning how to use the tools on basically any kind of instrument. So this means you're not EQing just because you know, or because some internet man like me told you that you should. You're EQing to solve a problem or to enhance a track or to balance the tone of a mix. Those are your goals. There has to be a reason. Otherwise, you run the risk of over-EQing a sound or adding EQ where EQ isn't necessary just because you're following these kinds of tips and tricks. So let me show you an example. So right now I have up on my DAW two different versions of the same vocal. One that was mixed with sort of your standard tips and tricks, the things that get recommended to you whenever they talk about, you know, EQing a vocal. And then one that was mixed with intention. So like me sitting down thinking, okay, what are the issues with this vocal that I need to fix? And then making some EQ moves to fix those problems. So. Let's listen to the first one. Burning down a road I've yet to know. Mm. Memories. So it sounds pretty good. You know, let me show you what I did here. So 
I did three of kind of like the standard pieces of advice that you usually hear when it comes to vocals. You know, I made a boost around the lower mids to get, you know, a little bit more warmth out of the vocal. I made a boost around two kilohertz just to get the, the vocal to stick out in the mix a little bit more, give it a little bit more presence. You know, and I made a really substantial boost in the top end to give it a little bit more air. Now, all of those things are fine. None of those things are inherently bad pieces of advice or anything. But I didn't actually listen to the vocal when I did all these things. I just thought, okay, people tell me to boost here, boost here, and boost here, and we're done. Now, let's listen to this again just so you can get it back in your head what it sounds like. And then I want to show you the sound of the vocal when I mixed it with intention. So here's tips and tricks. Burning down a road I've yet to know mm. Memories And here is mixing with intention. Burning down a road I've yet to know mm. Memories You hear how it feels so much more airy and light and like an actual performance. It also just sounds almost louder than the original performance, even though they've both been gain staged. So let me show you what I did here. You know, I did actually almost the opposite moves of the last one with the exception of one particular move. So you can see, you know, I still have a boost. It's not nearly as aggressive as the last one, but I actually have a cut around two kilohertz and I've got a really big cut here in the mids, and I've got a little cut here in the low mids. So I almost did the exact opposite. And let's listen to it again. Burning down a road I've yet to know mm. Memories Memories calling me to come back home It's so airy, and it's because I got rid of a lot of the gunk that was living in the mids. And I never would have cut any of that stuff out had I just stuck with the tips and the tricks. Burning down a road I've yet to know. Here it just sounds, once you compare it, it sounds so muddy. Memory. And just not forward. And Memory's it's kind of hard to hear it, almost like it's been covered, home. even though we're boosting the top end. Burning down a road I've yet to know. Here's the original. Burning down a road I've yet to know. Now listen to the ones done with intention in context, because they sound really fantastic. Had I not actually listened and thought, okay, where are the problems? What can I fix? I would have missed out on a really incredible sounding vocal. So that is definitely philosophy number one, EQ with intention, EQ with purpose. Don't just throw EQ moves on there because some guy on the internet told you that's what you should do. So the next philosophy is this. It's a bunch of tiny moves that matter in mixing not just a few big ones. Throwing an EQ on the mix bus and calling it a day is just not gonna cut it. A good mix is made up of dozens of teeny tiny EQ moves, you know, one, two, three decibels, not just several drastic ones. That's why subtle two to four dB boosts are so common. You know, you're not trying to completely change the sound of the instrument that you're working on. You're just trying to balance the sound where it needs to be balanced. You're trying to balance the tone of everything that you come across. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't be bold. Be bold. I mean, look at literally what I did here. Going back to the vocal that I mixed with intention, I made a 10 decibel cut here. Massive, a huge cut. And I did that boldly, but 
The reason I was so bold is because I was bold with intention. It's going to come back to that first philosophy every time. There has to be a reason for your boldness, not oh, I just wanted it to sound different because I wanted it to sound different. Yeah, if you're trying to make a creative decision, sure. But if you're trying to balance the tone of your mix, which isn't really a creative decision as much as it's almost like a scientific decision to a certain extent, if you're trying to balance the tone, be bold, but be bold with intention. Otherwise, be okay with just making tons of one, two, three, four dB cuts and boosts because over the course of an entire mix, even stuff that you can kind of just barely hear is really gonna make a huge difference. And here is the final philosophy that I would hold to whenever you're doing any kind of EQing. Nothing is a rule, everything is a guideline. And I'll say that again, because it kind of messes with me a little bit. Nothing is a rule, everything is a guideline. So that's right, you get permission to ignore everything I say. Congratulations, you won the game. Don't listen to me anymore. <laughs> and really, you get permission to ignore everything I say as long as the track calls for it. That's really what it comes down to. Again, mixing with intention, EQing with intention. There's so many EQ tips and tricks out there that people think are gospel. They're like, you have to put this on everything. But really, they're only meant for certain situations. You know, for example, a lot of people have the bad habit of using EQ charts that just tell you exactly where to boost and exactly where to cut certain instruments. So they might be mixing a kick drum and they look at an EQ chart and they say, okay, I should boost in the, you know, in the lows because I want more bass sound. And oh yeah, I think I should cut around 500 because like that's usually where it's muddy or boxy. And oh yeah, I should probably boost around five kilohertz because like I want more click. And I should probably also boost around one kilohertz because I want more of the beater. And none of those things are inherently bad. If your kick needs more beater sound, awesome. Boost around one kilohertz. If your kick needs a little bit more beef, a little bit more bass, great. Boost in the lower mids. If your kick is sounding boxy, fantastic, cut in the lower mids. You should actually boost in the lows if you are looking for that boominess, not in the lower mids. But what I'm trying to say here is that if you do it just because, rather than doing it because your particular instrument needs it, it's going to be really problematic for your entire mix. You have to learn to use your ears. And I know that that's such a frustrating thing to hear as a beginner or an intermediate, and sometimes even as an advanced person or, you know, someone who's mastered this, because using your ears is such a vague piece of advice. It's like, what, what does that even mean? Really, all it's going to come back to is mixing with intention, EQing with intention. And that goes for the rest of this course. You know, anything that I'm telling you, oh, you have, you know, do this, do this, do this, do this. There are going to be situations where, you know, if I was sitting there next to you guiding your hand, I actually would say, hey, don't do the thing that I told you to do six hours ago. Do this other thing because this track doesn't need it. Or maybe there's a whole step of EQing that I talk about how necessary it is and how important it is. And you start your mix and you just realize you don't need any of it. Just for whatever reason, that particular song with that particular singer and that particular guitar player and those particular synths just don't need any enhancing or they don't you know, need any resonance frequencies cut or they don't need any mix bus EQ. If it needs it, do it. If it doesn't need it, don't do it. These are guidelines, not rules. So if you are able to follow all three philosophies, making sure to EQ with intention and purpose, making a bunch of tiny moves in mixing rather than just a few big ones, and making sure that you're following everything as a guideline and not as a hard and fast rule, then you're going to be on your way to making some incredible EQ moves in your mixes. Seriously, I could not do any EQ if I did not follow these three philosophies. It's going to change everything. Even if it's subtle, you might be doing this without realizing it. That happens sometimes. Or maybe you're doing the exact opposite and this is kind of the big moment for you, realizing, oh my goodness, I've just been following tips and tricks. Or I've, 
you know, just been making a few big, bold moves or, you know, I've been following every single thing that every single teacher has ever told me, no matter what happens and I'm not using my ears, well, then this is going to be a really big one for you. So either way, hopefully this helps and I will see you in the next video. So in this video, I want to talk to you about the different kinds of EQ. Now, all EQs essentially do the same thing. You know, they turn up frequencies or sonic energy and they turn down frequencies or sonic energy. There are a lot of different kinds of EQs, things that, you know, maybe are based on different technology or accomplish different tasks, but all EQ is trying to accomplish, for the most part, the same goal which is to balance the tone of an instrument or balance the tone of a mix. Right now, I want to go through kind of the main five differences that you're going to see in the world of EQ so that whenever you come across these kinds of EQs, as well as come across different kinds of jargon, it doesn't really trip you up. Let's start with one of the first big groups of EQs, and that is analog EQs versus digital EQs. Analog obviously is a word that isn't just describing EQ, but is actually describing pretty much any outboard hardware gear that's been made since the 30s and 40s. So analog is exactly that. It's hardware. It's actual physical outboard gear that you route your sound through and move actual physical knobs to change the sound. It's something that you can hold. Now, analog gear is primarily known for giving sounds a certain color. And that's a really vague word because it's kind of hard to describe what analog does to sounds. But basically, analog is imperfect technology. It's literal wires and tubes and bells and whistles. And so because of that, it's not completely accurate. But usually what happens is rather than that lack of accuracy being something that's detrimental to the sound, a lot of times it actually adds to the sound. And that addition is what we like to refer to as color. And really what that is, it's just saturation. It's subtle saturation. So if I send my drum set through an analog EQ, there's going to be some really subtle saturation that's being added to that, even if I don't move any of the EQ knobs. So it's giving it just a slight different coloration because what saturation does is it adds new frequencies to a sound. So new stuff is added on top of it, not just being boosted or cut. Now, digital, on the other hand, has only been around since about the mid to late 80s around the time of the digital revolution, when computers started to become on the markets in both the professionals industries and the home industry. So digital tends to get a bit of a bad rap. If you ever uh, talk to any older engineers, they're going to tell you how beautiful analog gear sounds and how harsh and gross digital gear sounds. And that's honestly not true. What digital does is it provides accuracy. So if you remember back to analog, analog gear is less accurate, but adds some color. Whereas usually digital gear is more accurate to what's actually happening, but it's colorless. And our ears are used to hearing a little bit of color, a little bit of saturation put onto sounds because, you know, up until that point, that's the only way that they could get sounds onto a record by sending it through physical, inaccurate boxes of technology. So sometimes digital EQs are actually what you want to have because you don't really want to affect the tone of the sound that much. Or rather, you don't want to add anything new to it. You don't want to add new frequencies. You just want that colorless sound. Whereas other times you might want an analog EQ, something that's going to give it more vibe. That's a word that gets used a lot with analog, something that gives it a little bit more of the sound of you know, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, a little bit more of that kind of pro sound that you hear. So to be clear, you're not hearing any harshness with a digital EQ. In reality, you're just hearing accuracy. And like I said, a lot of times people want that, a lot of times people don't. It fully depends on what your song needs and what you have available to you. Now, keep in mind, when I talk about analog EQs, I'm not actually referring that much to the actual hardware as much as I'm referring to emulations of that hardware. So plug-in emulations of that hardware. So for instance, like this plugin I have for the API 550B equalizer, and we'll go over this in a little bit, but this is a plug-in emulation 
of an actual API mixing board. So this is considered to be an analog plugin. So even though it's digital, it's still based on analog gear. It still gives a lot of the same color that analog gear gives. Whereas the Pro-Q, the thing that I've been using throughout this course, is digital. It's not adding any saturation. It's completely colorless. Whatever you add in here is what you add, not what the technology decides to add for you. Now, I will say this real quick. Analog is usually semi-parametric or graphic, and digital is usually parametric. Now, what does that jargon mean? This is a great segue into our next group of EQs, which is parametric versus semi-parametric versus graphic. It is the three main different types of how EQs process the sound. And you're going to see them all over the place, especially if you're working with analog EQs and digital EQs. So let's start with parametric because it's the most easy to understand. This is a parametric EQ. All parametric means is that you have, we create a band here, full control of where you put a band, what frequency you set a band at, how wide and how narrow you set a band at. So you have control of the Q factor and how loud a band is set at. Now, almost every EQ is actually gonna give you control over the loudness, the volume of a particular band, but there are some EQs that don't give you control of where you place the band and what Q you set it at. So this is a parametric, so let's look at a semi-parametric. So that's the API 550B, the one we just looked at. So semi-parametric, gives you control of the frequency, but does not give you control of the width. So there's no control uh, of the Q factor that we just talked about. So you can see here for one of these bands, I can set it at like 800 or 1.5 kilohertz and so on and so forth. So I can move this knob around and select the frequency that I want to use and I can turn it up and I can turn it down, but I can't actually change how wide the band is. And in some ways that's desirable, A, because it makes it less complicated and B, because a lot of times these units have a very specific width that actually lends a very pleasing tone to it. Now, every single piece of analog gear and every single piece of semi-parametric EQ gear is gonna have a different width. So it's not even worth me giving you any numbers or even any estimations. It totally depends on the one that you're using. But it's worth trying out a few different pieces of analog emulation plugins just to see which one sounds best to you. Because like I said, some of them are gonna have wider widths and some of them are going to have narrower widths. So the last type of EQ that you're probably going to see is what's known as a graphic EQ. A graphic EQ gives you no control of the frequency and no control of the width, but you get lots of frequency bands that you can choose from. So you can see here, I can't actually move like this, this band that's right here. I can't move this anywhere but 500. Like this is set at 500 Hertz. And if I turn it up, you know, the volume goes up, but I can't change the cue and I can't change the frequency. That's a bit of a misnomer. You know, there is actually a concept in graphic EQs called tuning, where if I move this up, you can see that all of the numbers move up with it and the same if I move it down, but I can't change where each individual band is placed. That is set permanently. Now, again, sometimes having fewer options is actually really helpful. Graphic EQs have their own tone that's different from semi-parametric EQs and is obviously different from parametric EQs. These are oftentimes really beloved by live sound engineers. You see these a lot in live sound rigs. There are a lot of times very beloved for how well they handle top end, which usually semi-parametric uh, EQs are also beloved for that reason as well. That's one of the things that digital EQs, parametric EQs tend to do the worst on. But this is also a type of EQ that you'll see. You don't need to get too freaked out by it because all it is is just looking around and saying, okay, well, you know, I wanna make some cuts in the low mids. Do I wanna just use this one and this one and, you know, cut it a little bit, or do I want to tune it up, find the frequencies that I like, 
and do that. So it's not too scary really at all. Now I want to show you just a quick example of what all three of these sound like so that you are able to understand some of the differences. So I picked out one particular frequency, about one kilohertz, and it decided to boost all three of these EQs up about six decibels just to see what it sounds like. And then I went back and did some gain staging because all, obviously all three of them added some extra gain. So here's what it sounded like before. I'm actually gonna get out of this. Okay, and here's the digital sound. Okay, here is semi-parametric. And here's graphic. Now, I know what you're thinking, there's not really that much of a difference between the three of them. And part of that is because, I don't know if one kilohertz was maybe the best place to boost, that's okay. But part of it is because a lot of the stuff we're talking about is very subtle, which is another great example of the fact that gear isn't going to be the thing that gets you a killer mix. Talent and skill are going to be the things that get you a better mix. So it's much better for you to practice and just become the best you possibly can, really improve your skill, then go out and blow a bunch of money on fancy gear like this. Because like I said, you know, I personally liked the API the best, but uh, maybe a little negligible, who's to say? But that's an example of what all three of them sound like. So now I wanna show you the next type of EQ that you're gonna come across, and that is a minimum phase EQ versus a linear EQ. Most EQs are minimum phase EQs. That's just the standard type of equalization. Now, what I mean by that is that, you know, anytime you use any kind of EQ, there is some phase manipulation that happens. So not only are you boosting or cutting certain frequencies, but you're also adding just a little bit of warbliness into the sound. So this is just your average EQ. All EQs are minimum phase EQs, with the exception of linear EQs. Now, linear EQs add none of that phase manipulation. They are completely clean, at least as far as phasing goes. Now, there's definitely problems with it for sure. They add a ton of latency into your session. And they also add this thing called pre-ringing, which it's almost like a delay that's happening before the sound. So if I clapped, they would be just like, like two milliseconds before there would be a clap and then my clap. The reason I bring up these two EQs is because Linear EQs are often talked about being used on you know, your mix bus because they're a lot cleaner. They're not going to mess with the tone you know, of your whole mix. There are times to use linear EQ, but honestly, linear EQs are really tools for mastering engineers because it's really easy to mess up your sound if you don't know what you're doing with one. And you can see, I mean, they look exactly the same as a regular EQ. You know, there's no difference. It's also a parametric EQ. It's exactly the same as this one. It's just that the back end is a little bit different. So I would definitely recommend, unless you're trying to get into mastering, maybe leave linear EQs for the professionals because since they know what they're doing, they're really gonna be able to make a great sound with it. But if you don't, then honestly, the fact that you're cleaning up the phase of the sound is probably not gonna be as beneficial as the pre-ringing could be detrimental to your mix. Okay, so now let's look at another type of EQ that you're gonna come across. And that is stereo EQ versus mid-side EQ. Now this is actually a type of processing that you see in the whole mixing world. You see that a lot with compression, for instance. You see a lot of mid-side compression. And what that phrase means, mid-side, is rather than focusing on processing the stereo channel, so the left channel, and the right channel, you are focusing on processing the mono signal and the sides, the stereo sides. Now that might seem a little bit confusing. There is some tech backend that allows you to split those two things into completely separate channels so that you can manipulate them. But functionally, what mid side EQ does is it allows you to clean up certain sounds, maybe in the middle, like the mono sounds, like your kick, your snare, your bass, your vocal, stuff that's 
right in the middle. Maybe do some cleaning there and leave certain frequencies alone in the side. So maybe you want to clean up that particular sound. Like maybe there's a lot of bassy boominess in the low end that you want to clean up, but you don't really want to touch those frequencies and maybe your guitars, which are panned hard left and hard right. Mid side EQ is going to be how you would fix that. Or maybe what you would want to do, and this is actually a thing that I like to do on my mix bus a lot of times if I really feel that I need it, is you can put a subtle top end boost on your particular sides. So rather than putting a top end boost on the mids, you're just putting a top end boost on the sides, which can make your song feel just a little bit more stereo, just a little bit more shimmery. Let me show you what that can sound like. Now, I will let you know, mid side EQ is definitely something to look into and experiment with once you've already mastered stereo EQ. So I wouldn't get too ahead of yourself and think that you have to go out and just like learn everything there is to learn about mid side EQ. It's a great tool. It can make some really great subtle moves in the right direction. But even me as a professional engineer and producer, I don't use this a ton. It's great when I do use it, but I would definitely focus on the fundamentals and the foundation with stereo EQ. So let me show you what this is gonna look like. So I'm listening to my mix, so here's what it sounds like. Fire, fire. And let's say I wanted to do just that. You know, I wanted to not boost stuff in the middle because it's already bright enough, but I wanted to boost stuff on the sides. Let me show you what it would look like first if I boosted in stereo. So this is just gonna be boosting everything. Fire, fire. It'll be pretty aggressive so it's more obvious. Fire, so before, fire. after. Okay, now let's do it in mid side. And I'll delete this. So now you can see we have two options over here. We can either select mid or we can select side, so the M or the S. So I wanna select side, and I'm gonna change this to a high shelf, and we're gonna do the exact same thing. And now listen to it. So before, fire, fire. and after. It's a lot more subtle, right? Fire, fire. You can even get, a, get away with a little bit more aggression up here. The good part about that is, you know, awesome. Now I have a little bit more of a wider stereo spectrum. The bad part is that it now feels a little out of balance from the rest of the mix. You know, the vocals don't feel nearly as bright as the sides do, which makes the vocals feel too dark. So again, mid side, easy to mess up. I wouldn't try to get too aggressive with it if you do decide to use it on something, but it could be a really great tool if you're just trying to mess with one particular part of the frequency spectrum. So let's move on to our next group of EQ, which is a static EQ versus a dynamic EQ. Now, what those two things are, you know, static EQs are 99% of EQs. Basically, if I'm able to go in here and turn on a band and I move it up and move it down, and whenever I let go, it stays there and it just boosts permanently that bit or cuts that bit, then it's static. It's not moving. But dynamic, on the other hand, let me go grab this right here. This is a great free dynamic plugin, uh, dynamic EQ plugin. Dynamic EQ works almost like a slightly more advanced version of parallel compression. So what this does is it says, okay, well, you know, there's a few frequencies in this part of the frequency range. So we'll say at 2.2 kilohertz, that for whatever reason, this singer is just getting too harsh there. And sometimes, not on every word, but like on every third or fourth word, there's just some frequencies there that are really sticking out. Well, dynamic EQ could be the solution to that. All you would wanna do is basically turn on your threshold, turn it down a little bit, and you'll see, and it'll be weird because I'm putting it on a full mix, but you'll see that during certain moments, it's just going to pop down. So it's not actually going to be static, you know, set in one place. It's only when particular frequencies become too loud and move above the threshold, just like it would with compression. It's the exact same thing. So let's see what this sounds like. And I'm actually gonna put it on a different 
instrument. Let's put it on vocals, because that's usually what you see it used on the most. So I'm going to turn my ratio up a little bit, turn my cue up a little bit, and let's see what happens. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes recklessly. You see how sometimes it goes all the way down whenever he gets more aggressive? Recklessly. Now, what I would want to do if I was wanting a more aggressive vocal is rather than just allowing it to turn it down is I might actually want to turn this entire part of the frequency spectrum up to compensate. And what I would want to do is just while the vocal was playing, I'd turn it up until whenever it dipped down, it was hitting that zero mark. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes. Just like that. Recklessly. I can tell by the blaze so in before, your eyes. Recklessly. After. I can tell by the blaze. So you can hear something happening. It's subtle, but it's there. Just like your mid side, you know, and your linear EQs, I would still recommend focusing more on the regular EQ. The reason for that being that this is a great tool to fix problems, but it's a very specific use case. I really only ever use dynamic EQs on vocals where, like I was saying before, maybe every third or fourth word just has a weird tonality to it. And it's just like, oh, you know, maybe they're moving their throat in a weird way whenever they pronounce one particular syllable. So I need to go in and rather than cut that whole part of the frequency spectrum, you know, maybe I only want to cut just a little bit to make it consistent. But that's not something I do on every mix. That's something I do on every few mixes whenever I'm working with maybe who isn't the best singer or just has a very unique singing tone where one part of it is that it's just not the most consistent. This is something you'll come across, but again, focus on the fundamentals before you get too deep into your dynamic EQs. So finally, there's one more group of EQs that you're gonna see when you're out there in the mixing world, and that is regular EQs versus smart EQs. And I'll give you a guess what regular EQs are. You're gonna guess right, it's just 99% of EQs. Again, it's, it's just the standard EQ that you would use to do most of the jobs that you're trying to do. Whereas smart EQs are based on a new technology. Smart EQs are like right brand new on the scene as of just a few years ago. We are all still trying to figure out exactly what they do, how they work, what we can use them on. They're a little bit difficult to explain. And part of the reason for that is because how a smart EQ works really depends on which smart EQ you're using. Every single plugin company has a different secret sauce. But to uh, to give the goal, at least, of a, most smart EQs, what they're trying to do is just balance the sound. Basically, you would put a smart EQ plugin on a particular sound, it would analyze it in some way, and then would spit out a new EQ curve for it automatically. So basically, artificial intelligence for EQ rather than you having to go in and do it manually yourself. So there's a lot of different examples of what these smart EQs are based on. So, you know, some are based on <laughs> industry trends, which I don't really know what that means. That might just be a marketing term, but maybe they've plugged in sort of general tones into the machine learning of the system. You know, some are based on pink noise, which is a type of noise that has all of the frequencies balanced correctly. You know, some are based on specific songs that you upload. And some are based on some kind of secret theoretical physics sauce. And the Gullfoss, which I have right here, which is one of my favorites, is exactly that. You know, it was built by two theoretical physicists who happened to come up with some algorithm while they were doing their dissertation that, you know, being musicians themselves, they realized that this algorithm that I, as your teacher, do not understand works extremely well at balancing certain sounds. So they made it into a plugin. Now, smart EQs, very easy to use depending on the particular EQ that you're using. But since we're sticking with Gullfoss, just to show it to you, it's very, very easy. Let me get this set up to our mix. Honestly, for Gullfoss specifically, it's only two main controls, Tame and Recover. Tame gets rid of some of the nasty sounds. Recover adds some good sounds. So I'll show you what this looks and sounds like. Fire, fire. Fire, fire. So 
here's before. Here's after. Pretty crazy looking, right? So it did a pretty good job of balancing this mix, you know? It saw that, for instance, you know, a lot of times there was maybe too much bass going on or not enough bass happening in between some of the bass hits. And it saw that it, you know, it's a little bit of a warmer track. So it boosted a lot of the top end to compensate for that. I really do love a lot of the smart EQs that are out there. Again, that technology is going to grow over time. So I'm sure future people who purchase this course are going to get a much more in-depth look at smart EQs as just the whole industry figures out what the hell they're even about. But I definitely am a fan of them if you buy one that actually has some really good usages. Gullfoss for me was a fantastic buy. I will be honest on that. So those are the main types of EQ you're going to come across. Out of all of them, really the one that is the most important is just your parametric EQ versus your semi-parametric EQ versus your graphic EQ. Specifically, parametric and semi-parametric. Those are the two EQs that you're going to come across the absolute most. So don't get too freaked out whenever you hear those words. I know they sound really sciencey and maybe a little out there. All that means is really a digital EQ and what's most likely an analog EQ. So hopefully that helps. You know, you'll be able to go forward with confidence that you're using the right EQ tools for the job. So now that we've gotten through the basics of EQ, it's time to get into the meat of the course, the chef method, no pun intended. This is an EQ workflow that's going to allow you to EQ the entire mix from start to finish. Now, one of the biggest frustrations that I've heard from new mixers is how vague EQ can seem, you know, how difficult it is to make decisions when there's just dozens of things that need to be done. You could go in this direction or this direction or this direction or this direction, and it's hard to pick a place to go. So when there's multiple goals that you're trying to accomplish with EQ, where do you even start? So I've separated these large, confusing goals of EQing a mix into five succinct steps, each focusing on a different aspect of EQ. And each of these steps is centered around the process of cooking a meal for your friends and family. You'll be surprised at how much EQing your mix from start to finish parallels with just cooking a dish. We'll take a deep dive into each of the steps in the coming videos, but let me give you just a little preview of the chef method. So first, you have to clean your tracks. This is the process of getting rid of resonance frequencies, low-end rumble, and any other nasty stuff that's popping up in your sound. This is cleaning the ingredients that you're preparing for the meal. Then you need to enhance your tracks. You'll be using an EQ to balance the tone of each instrument, getting it to sound clear and exciting and present before you even start the mix. In terms of the chef method, this is preparing the ingredients for the dish. This is cutting up your veggies, tenderizing your meats, and so on. After that, we have a little break in our EQing to set up the volume balance. This is combining the now prepped ingredients into the pan so that they can cook. Then you need to balance your mix's tone. This is the process of putting an EQ onto the mix bus output of your entire mix, and then making some moves to balance the overall tone of your sound to make sense with the reference tracks that you're using. This is the act of seasoning your dish in the pan right before you start cooking, just to get the flavor right. After that, you have to blend your instruments. This step is all about making your mix sound like a mix instead of just a random collection of tracks. We're going to be using our EQ to boost certain parts and cut certain parts of each instrument so that they all begin to fit together. This is cooking your dish in the pan so that all the flavors of all of the ingredients begin to combine together into one cohesive taste. Finally, we have our last step, which is to do your final tweaks. This step is all about using your ears to problem solve, finding any issue that's still arising in the mix and fixing it with EQ. This is the tasting and re-seasoning step. The stuff that you're going to do, you know, after you take your dish right out of your pan, you're tasting it, you're making sure that it's tasting just right, right before you put it on a plate 
and serve it to your friends and family. So before we start, I want to give a quick disclaimer. This system is all about giving you a workflow to learn how to accomplish each step of EQ without getting massive brain overload. But it is not gospel. Sometimes you're going to be working on a mix where certain steps just seem a little bit less necessary, and other times you're going to have to spend an extra hour or two on one particular step. Eventually, you might even develop your own workflow and stray away from the chef method. And I'm here to tell you that is okay. This method is first meant to teach you how to cook, but eventually it's meant to teach you how to turn from a cook into a chef. Now, what exactly do I mean by that? You know, what's the difference between a cook and a chef? Well, cooks make a dish by following a recipe, but chefs make their own recipes. It's much easier to break the rules when you know what the rules are. Then you're able to strategically pick and choose which rules to break in that moment so that you get the best sounding mix possible. Just like a chef creating their own spin on a particular recipe. My goal for this course is to teach you the rules of EQ as simply as possible so that you can follow the recipe that I've given you. And then once you've had enough practice and enough experience to go off on your own path, to use the parts that work best for you, to discard the parts that don't, and overall to just have a full understanding of how to EQ everything. I want to give you the tools to become a chef in the EQ world, of course. So now that I've given my disclaimer, let's get right into it. So let's move on to step one of the chef method, cleaning your tracks. So let's get into step one of the chef method, cleaning your tracks. Now, before we begin, I want you to close your eyes and imagine something with me. Imagine yourself getting back from the grocery store unloading the ingredients to prepare a meal. Maybe you've got some, you know, some lettuce and some beef. You know, maybe you've got an eggplant and a few onions and just whatever food you would usually use to prepare your favorite meal. What's the first thing that you're going to do to prepare that dish? After you've put everything away, it's, you know, everything's in the cupboards, everything's ready, you've got your apron on, you're ready to go. What's the first thing that you're going to do to prepare the dish. You're going to clean the ingredients. You know, you're going to take your onions and you're going to run them under water. You're going to take your lettuce, your celery, you're going to run them under water. You're going to scrub your potatoes. You're going to make sure that all of your ingredients are free from any dirt and grime that might have just gotten on them, you know, during the farming practice or the, uh, you know, the process of shipping all of the stuff to the grocery store or people, you know, different people picking it up, looking at it, smelling it, putting it down. You want to get all of that dirt and grime off of it because that's not something that you want to cook with. It's stuff that's been added onto the food itself. And this is the same thing that we are going to be doing with an EQ from the first step of the chef method. We're going to be using our EQ to clean out the nasty stuff. You know, the stuff that's in each individual track or you know, our ingredients that has been added just because of maybe poor room choice or the wrong microphone or a car passing by. You know, we want our individual tracks to sound right before we even start the mix. So to be more specific, we're going to be using what's called surgical EQ to get rid of any problem frequencies in the instruments. And then we're going to be high passing the instruments to get rid of any of that low end rumble that's usually unnecessary and is just adding a lot of noise and mud to your mixes. So let's talk about what these problem frequencies actually are. Now, most likely they're going to be resonant frequencies. These frequencies that have popped up in the recording because of the room or the instrument, the body of the instrument. We've actually already talked about resonant frequencies during earlier videos in this course, but let's get a quick review. So the way that sound works, you know, whenever I clap my hands or sing or strum a chord, sound waves go off in all direction. They're not just going to go right where my voice is pointing. They're just emanating all around me. Now, some of these sound waves get stuck in between parallel surfaces. So a sound wave might 
leave my mouth and hit this sidewall and go parallel, hit this sidewall and just keep going back and forth and back and forth. What that does is it basically creates a particular frequency that is extra loud in comparison to the rest of them because as it bounces back and forth it doesn't lose energy doesn't lose volume like you know most frequencies do it gains energy it gains volume and so resonant frequencies are especially obvious because as you're listening you might be like man you know there's just one note that's just there almost no matter what chord is being played. That's a really good indication that you have a resonant frequency. Or you might be listening to the snare and you might be saying like, yeah, you know, like there's just this ring that's just in everything or this frequency that, you know, even after the snare is gone, it's just there and I can't, I can't seem to get rid of it. And while that might seem maybe a little vague, the more that you practice this, the more that you search for resonant frequencies, the more easily it's going to be for you to actually pick them out with your ears because you'll know exactly what to listen for. Now, problem frequencies aren't always just resonant frequencies. Sometimes they can also be hum from a guitar amp, for example, or maybe the rattle from the lugs on a drum. You know, any kind of noise that doesn't really add to the sound of that particular instrument, I would consider that a problem frequency. Now, some of these can be fixed with EQ. Some of them you have to fix beforehand. You know, if the rattling of the lugs on the snare is just too much, no amount of EQ is really gonna be able to fix that. You just need to tighten them before you start recording. But some things you're able to go in and just slice them directly out of the frequency spectrum, leaving you with a clean, clear track. One that before sounded really covered up and now just sounds like the instrument, pure and simple. So let's go over a few examples. So throughout this part of the course, we're gonna be sticking in one particular song, one that we're gonna be going through every single step of the chef method on. So let's listen to what that sounds like. And then we're gonna dig into a few instruments to see if we can clean them up a little bit. Uh, you So, you know, it's pretty rough sounding. There's definitely some cool stuff that's going on in there, but there's a lot of room sound. Stuff sounds like it's really far away. There's a lot of honkiness in the vocals. There's a lot of things that need to be balanced again. So let's go in and start doing some cleaning first before we even start to get into the mixing. So we are gonna start, first of all, with this one particular electric guitar track. So let's listen to this. And I'm actually gonna turn it up for you so it's a little bit louder. So I don't know if you can hear it, but there's just this like, ooh, that's going on throughout the entire thing. Just one frequency that seems like it's just sitting on the entire track. So I've actually already gone in and done all of my cleaning. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna disable each one of these and we are gonna go one by one and see, you know, with some sweep EQing, what exactly I was hearing whenever I cut these. Let me turn this on. Uh, I'm gonna set my output back to zero. I'm gonna make a bell that I'm gonna use to sweep. And we are gonna sweep around and try to find this rogue frequency that I'm talking about, this high pitch just ooh, that's sticking out. Yeah, I'm hearing it right there. There it is. So once we get here, what we wanna do is begin to narrow the cue so that we can make sure that we are as close to the middle of that frequency as possible. Because the narrower the cue, whenever we make our cut, the less of an impact on the overall tone of the instrument that we are gonna have whenever we make our you know, pretty dramatic cut to get rid of this rogue frequency. <laughs> 
And you know that you have found kind of that particular frequency when it just gets extremely, extremely loud. So as you're moving it around, sometimes it might get a little bit more quiet, a little bit more quiet, a little bit louder, a little bit louder. And then once you find the middle, it's just boof, as loud as it possibly can go. So I'm pretty sure this is around the middle. So now all I'm gonna do is cut it. Not bad. So let's do a before and after. So before. And after. Sounds a lot cleaner, right? There's another one that to me is actually even more obvious that I'm gonna wanna cut. So I'm gonna sweep around. To me, it sounds like it's right next to it. So now I'm going to do a before so you can hear exactly what we are getting rid of. So listen to like how much just popped in and how much clearer it feels after I get rid of it. So here's before and after. This is one of my favorite steps, specifically because it's one of the steps where the EQ is just so obvious. It's so obvious what you just did. I am hearing one more resonant frequency. And keep in mind, you know, some instruments won't have any resonant frequencies. Some instruments will have one, maybe two. Some have a few more than that. So keep your ears open. Don't get too aggressive with it. You know, not every instrument has six of them or anything like that. You know, if there are any, there's probably only one. But with this one in particular, I'm hearing one that isn't quite as offending. You know, I don't think I'm going to turn it down all the way, but I do think it's still kind of sticking out, maybe a little bit too much. So I'm going to make a bell and let's sweep around. And to me, it's sounding like it's kind of in the lower mids. Yeah, right there. So part of the reason that I was saying I'm only going to cut it a little bit is because it's a pretty minor resonant frequency. And you know that because it's not there constantly. It's only there on one particular note. So what's happening is when that note is being played in the room, just because of the particular shape of that room, you know, however much acoustic treatment they had or didn't have, that note just got a little bit louder. So we are going to be just kind of controlling it. So we're not trying to get rid of that note. We're just trying to control it to make sure that its volume is sort of in line with all of the notes beside it when they're playing. So once I take it out, you can hear it a lot more obvious. It's that wah, 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 wah that's kind of happening. that right there. So let's do one more before and after. And I'm actually going to grab my uh, my VU meter so that we can do some gain staging. So here's before. So kind of between three and one looks like. Okay, and here's after. So it looks like we've lost one or two decibels. and after. Listen to how much more controlled that sounds. It's incredible. The other thing that we are going to be doing during the cleaning the track step of the chef method is we're going to be getting rid of some of this low end rumble. And all that's going to be is us going in with a high pass filter, 
moving it up until we are able to kind of just start to hear the tone start to slip away, just start to hear some of the volume slip away, then we're gonna back off. And all that's getting rid of is stuff that we really couldn't hear anyway. So listen to this, this is all I'm getting rid of. You hear that just like boom, boom. That's not even part of the sound of the guitar. That's actually just the room reacting to the amplifier. And it's not actually adding anything. It's just low end energy that's there to be there. So let's get rid of it. So before. Sounds a lot cleaner, a whole lot clearer. So let's try this out with another instrument. So next up, let's look at a whole different kind of instrument. Let's look at the overheads for the drum set. So the overheads, you know, obviously those are the microphones that are right above the drum set, looking down the ones that are picking up most of the cymbal sound, a lot of the ambient sound from the kick and the snare. These are pretty notorious for having a lot of room resonances because they're so much farther away from the rest of the instrument. Let's check out what we've got. Now you can see that there's actually three different room resonances that I found. So let's listen to what this sounded like before. And I'm gonna turn the volume up just a little bit so that it's a little bit easier to hear. So obviously there's a lot going on in this. And it's a little bit more of a complicated sound, which is actually why I wanted to use it as an example. Because this isn't just one instrument that's happening, it's multiple instruments. It's the kick, it's the snare, the hi-hat, some of the cymbals. So that means there are gonna be some particular instruments that are triggering certain resonant frequencies and some that aren't. And then the ones that aren't might be triggering completely different resonant frequencies. And that's actually what happened here. We'll go over this in a second, but there were actually two resonant frequencies that I was hearing more in the kick and the snare, and then one frequency that I was hearing way more in the cymbals. So let's turn all these off. So let's listen to what this sounded like after I gave it a good cleaning. So before. And after. You hear how it just got so much closer. It felt like it wasn't quite so far away. It's because I got rid of stuff that wasn't natural to the sound. It was stuff that was added on by the room. And so once I got rid of that stuff that was sitting on top, boom, it's right in your face. So let's turn all of these off, go through the process of finding them. So I'm gonna create a band. So the first thing I heard was kind of just some sound that was going on in the overheads. and. I heard it the most in the snare and the kick. So let's kind of sweep around the area where that tends to live. Yeah, you already hear that right there. So, without it. Okay, so now let's narrow the cue. Cleans it up really nicely. But I'm still hearing one other thing around there. Let's listen again. This I'm kind of hearing a little bit more in the snare. And it sounds like it's just a little bit higher pitched. So I'm gonna grab another band, start to sweep around there. Yeah, right there. kind of just that boxy sound. Mm -hmm. 
Not bad. Let's listen to Before real quick. I'll actually turn the volume off. Okay, and after. It's a lot cleaner, right? Now I'm hearing one particular frequency that's extra harsh in the cymbals. Now the cymbals usually live in the upper mids and the highs, so that's where I'm gonna start my search. Yep, right there. Pretty painful, right? I don't want to get rid of it entirely because it is an important frequency for all of the cymbals. It does give a lot of presence to them. So rather than just turning them down all the way to, you know, negative 30 decibels, I'm just going to take out maybe eight or 10. Okay, so let's do some gain staging and then hear what this sounds like. Okay, so that's kind of between five and three. And this is more between seven and five, so let's turn it up by maybe two. Yeah, that sounds good to me. And now finally, let's use our high pass filter to get rid of some of this nastiness that's existing down here. So same thing as before, we're not trying to really get rid of any of the tone of this particular drum set. We're just wanting to get rid of some of that low end rumble that's not really helping anything. You can see here, so I'm I'm starting to lose some of the uh, some of the sound of the kick now, so I'm gonna back off. It's a lot better right there. And it looks like uh, we might be able to turn it up just a hair more. Great. So here's before. And here's after. so much closer, so much more in your face, and it's going to mesh with the rest of the drum sounds way better. So this is something that you can do on any instrument that you have. And you can actually see, I went and did this on all of them. So this first line of EQs is basically my section of cleaning EQs. This is where I went and I cleaned every single one of these instruments. And you know, some of the instruments you know, I think the bass, for instance, didn't really have that much I needed to clean. You know, I took a little bit off the bottom because it wasn't necessary. And there was maybe a little bit of honkiness that was existing here in the mids, but that was really it, didn't need to do that much. And then there were other instruments, like the vocals, for example, where I had to just get aggressive about all of the cuts that I was having to make because there was just so much stuff happening in the room sound. So now that I've gone through and done all my cleaning on all the tracks, let's do a quick before and after on the whole mix on what exactly this does to the sound of the mix itself. So here's before. And here's after. A lot cleaner, again, not to be a broken record here, but a lot closer. So many of those resonant frequencies and the low end rumble got on top of the track. So it got harder and harder to actually make it sound like that particular instrument 
was close to the listener. It's one of the best ways to get upfront in your face tracks is to get rid of these kinds of resonant frequencies and low end rumble. It fully depends on what the instrument is, where it was recorded, what gear you used, how much acoustic treatment was around uh, the performer at the time. But making sure that you take time to do this step is going to be a huge, huge boon for the rest of your mix. Now, let's be clear here. This step, as well as the next step, is not a part of your mix. I'll say that again. It's not a part of your mix. That might seem confusing because it's EQ. If, you know, if you're using EQ, of course you're mixing. But that's actually not true. This is what I would call mix prep. You are preparing your tracks for the mix. Just like as, you know, as a cook, as a chef, you're not really cooking yet. You're just preparing your ingredients to be cooked in the pan once everything is ready and prepared. You should clean your tracks before you mix, specifically because your mix is gonna start to get cluttered, it's gonna start to get unorganized, and also you're gonna use a ton of CPU well, with all of these different EQ plugins that you're having to do. And then also usually surgical EQ tends to be a little bit more CPU heavy. So your computer could start to crash. So we don't want that to happen. So this is going to be something that's done before the mix. And then in step two, we're going to talk about after you finish doing your mix prep, what to do with the tracks, how to bounce them in place, how to export them and how to move on and start your mix. So all that being said, let's get started with step two, enhancing your tracks. So let's talk about step two of the chef method, which is to enhance your tracks. So close your eyes again and imagine with me. So you've just washed off your ingredients, gotten all of the dirt and the grime off of your celery and your potatoes and your lettuce. Everything is dirt free, drying on your cutting board. So. What do you do now? Well, we've got to prepare our ingredients for the cooking. We've got to cut up our veggies. We've got to tenderize our meats. We've got to beat our eggs. We've got to make sure that all of the ingredients are correctly prepared so that whenever we throw everything into the pan, it's ready to go. It's ready to cook. So in terms of our mix, this is the final EQ prep step before we actually get into the mixing. We're basically going to be going track by track, instrument by instrument, and enhancing the tone so that whenever we import everything into our mix, whenever we get started, we can make sure that we're starting with the best ingredients or tracks that we possibly can be. And then once we get to that point, we can start talking about blending those tracks together. But for now, all we're worrying about is making those tracks sound as good as we can individually. So in terms of our mix, this is our final EQ step for prepping our tracks. We're gonna be using EQ to enhance the tone of each of our instruments. Just like you'd be using the best quality ingredients to get the best tasting dish, we need to be bringing the best sound quality for each of our instruments so that we can get the best sounding mix. It works almost exactly the same way. We wanna bring in as good of sounding instruments as we can so that once we actually are starting the mixing process, we're able to cut confidently create space with ease and overall just have a better sounding track. So this process that we're going to be going through, you know, using EQ to enhance the tone of each of these instruments, this is something that happens in multi-million dollar studios as well. So during the tracking phase, whenever the engineer who's behind the board is working on the tone of, you know, the drums or the guitars or the bass, well, they are going to put the microphone, place it, get it as good as they can get it to sound, then they'll come back to the board, they'll listen and then they'll say, okay, you know, this tone sounds pretty good, but I need it to be a little sharper or I need it to sound a little warmer or, uh, you know, maybe it's a little bit too muddy. And they'll reach for the EQ on, you know, their big mixing board and they'll make some adjustments. They'll turn up the upper mids or they'll, you know, cut the low mids or they'll do whatever they need to do to get that particular instrument sounding as good as possible. And then, whenever the recording is done and they are gonna be sending the tracks off to be mixed, those EQ moves are basically baked into the tracks. They're baked into the master tape. That's actually why this technique is known as pre-tape EQ. It's putting EQ on before the tape, which is gonna get sent off to the mix engineer. Now, obviously you're not gonna be using tape unless you're working in a really, really nice studio. 
that doesn't really matter. What the purpose of this is for is to create great sounding tones and then basically bake those into the sounds, which we'll talk about at the end of this video, so that you're starting with fresh tracks that sound really, really good for the mix. So let's get into our session and start working on enhancing the tone of one of our instruments. Let's start with this particular electric guitar track. So already sounds pretty good, but there's definitely some stuff that we can do. And I've already made some tonal EQ that I'm gonna put on right now. So we'll do a quick little before and after. So you just heard before, so here's after. hear how you can hear a lot more of sort of that sharpness, uh, a little bit less of the mud that you originally heard, a little bit less of kind of the harshness that you originally heard. So there's still brightness in it, but it's not quite as muddy. It feels a little bit more upfront. So let's talk about how I made the moves that I made to enhance the tone of this particular track. So one of the best tools that you can use, which we've already talked about earlier in this course, is the balance chart, which is basically the chart that we use to, you know, assign specific areas of the frequency spectrum to words that we usually use for describing how certain tones are. So if I say, oh, you like, I want this to sound warm. Well, we know that warmth usually is a balanced tone, kind of between 100 hertz and 500 hertz. Or if you say, oh, you know, this just sounds too harsh to me. Well, we know that up here, harsh looks like it's having an unbalanced frequency spectrum. So too much sonic energy, somewhere between one kilohertz and maybe about eight kilohertz. So if we're able to use this chart, we can solo out an instrument, listen to it and think, okay, what words do I want this to be? Or what words are coming to my mind on how the sounds that are negative and what can I do to either increase that part of the frequency spectrum or decrease that part of the frequency spectrum so that we can balance the tone of the instrument. Because ultimately when I say we're enhancing the tone, I really just mean we're balancing the tone. You know, we're wanting to make sure that it's not too muddy. It, there's not too much stuff in the low mids or it's not too harsh. There's not too much stuff in the upper mids or it's too thin because there's not enough stuff down the low end. We want to make sure that the natural tone of that particular instrument shines. So we're going to be using EQ to do that. So let's look at this particular instrument. Let's look at what I did and then we'll talk about why I did it. So I have two EQs on here. One that's a Pultec, which is kind of an older style EQ. I just really like the color that it gives particular sounds. It's got a pretty wide Q. So all of these things are fairly wide bell curves. But you can see I made just a little bit of a boost at about one kilohertz, made just a little bit of a dip at 200 hertz. I made a little bit of a boost, so about two decibels, at about five kilohertz. And then finally, I was sitting and listening to it and I was just like, ah, you know, there's still something missing. There's still something that just sounds too, too harsh. So I went in and created another cut around 2.5 kilohertz. So the way I did this is I was able to use the balance chart of the frequency spectrum and sit and listen and think, okay, what's going on with it? So let's do exactly that. I'm just gonna loop it and we'll talk over it, figure out what we can change. Okay, so to me, I feel like I'd like a little bit more brightness. It's still, it's pretty bright as is, but I, I'd almost like a little bit of shimmer in it. It's such a pretty sounding guitar part. Um, you know, I do hear some of, some of that harshness uh, that kind of lives around here. So it's whenever I have too much of this particular area of the frequency spectrum. Um, you know, I think there's some stuff down in the low mids that's just sounding a little muddy. And it's interesting because it's not necessarily the actual guitar part. There's just kind of some tones from the particular reverb that this guitarist used 
that are kind of just just muddying up the sound a little bit. And if you look over here, you can see that muddy is roughly around 100 hertz to 500 hertz. So I know kind of that's the area that I'm wanting to look. So that means at this point I have, go over here, um, I've got a pretty good idea of at least where I want to look and what I want to change before I've even opened an EQ, which is really a fantastic way of doing it because that means you're going to be EQing with intention. You're going to know exactly what you're trying to do before you get in rather than just getting in and flipping knobs and just saying, oh, I guess that sounds better and moving on. So I'm going to turn this on and I'm going to turn this gain plugin on as well, just because uh, the Pultec tends to add just a little bit of volume and let's go about some of these moves. So one of the first things that I said was, oh, you know, I was really hearing kind of too much in the low mids. So on this particular EQ, I can choose 200, 300 or 500 to make a little bit of a dip. But one thing I like to do first is actually boost in that area and then sweep around just by moving it back and forth where the gain is as high as possible and just see what sounds worse to my ears. And that's kind of the way that I'm going to find where I want to cut. So you can maybe make an argument for cutting there because um, it's just a little bit, uh, a little bit boxy. That actually sounds kind of nice to my ears. And this just sounds like muck. You know, the, the notes themselves aren't actually being enhanced. It's just that background sound. So that's where I want to cut. So I'm going to pick 200. And what I usually like to do is sort of go too far and then back up until it just sounds right to my ears. Because obviously this sounds way too much. So the next thing that I want to do is I want to get some of that sizzle, some of that bright airiness. What I'm going to want to do is I'm going to come over here and I know that airiness, if we go back and look at our chart, the airiness is all the way up here at 10 kilohertz to 20 kilohertz. Now the electric guitar actually doesn't produce frequencies that high. So this is actually a situation where if I'm wanting airiness and that particular instrument doesn't produce stuff that high. Well, airiness in a guitar actually means something different then. So I'm going to take it down to kind of more of the upper mids because that's the top end of this particular instrument. And I'm going to search around there for something that sounds really good. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to boost it up pretty high and just sweep around till I find something that sounds good to my ears. So that sounds good to me. I'll keep going. And you can hear as I go higher and higher, I start to hear less and less of a change because there's not really quite as much stuff up there other than just room sound. That sounds good to me. Whereas, you know, this sounds too harsh to me, for example. So the whole point of this step is subtlety. I'm not trying to go in and make just absolutely massive changes to the tone. Just, you know, rebalancing two to three dBs here, two to three dBs there. You know, maybe a huge boost if you want to, but nothing that can't be reversed once you get to the actual mixing stage. So I'm just going to boost it up a little bit. That sounds good to me. If I remember correctly, back when I was doing this at first, I was sitting here and listening and I was kind of like, <sighs> you know, there's some harshness, but I would like just a little bit of sharpness in this. And I am going to stick around sort of like 700 to one kilohertz and see if there's something that's good that's sticking around in there. So that's a good presence area for the electric guitar. I'm just going to add a hair of that, just a little bit. That's too much right there. Cool. And that's all I did originally. So let's do a before and after. So here's before. And here's after. It's really subtle, but I do think it does a great job of bringing out 
the actual part, taking some of that modulated reverb back a little bit, making it just a little bit more interesting. But to my ears, it's still too harsh. And again, if we're looking at our balance chart, harshness is kind of between one kilohertz and about eight kilohertz. So at this point, I could have gone in here and swept around a little bit, found some harshness, but I, I just didn't really want to deal with it. So I got out of this and I got out another EQ, one that was a little bit easier to sweep with. And what I did, I'll disable this to make it a little bit easier. I just made a little peak right here and then swept around in that area. So one kilohertz to eight kilohertz to see if I could find something particularly bad. Now, I didn't really want to cut one kilohertz because I just boosted it. And if that was the problem area, I might as well just go back and fix that. Nor did I really want to cut five kilohertz because I, same thing, I just boosted that. And you know, if that's the thing that's causing too much, too much of that harshness, well, just go back and cut it. So really I'm sort of looking in the middle of those two things. And if you remember correctly, as I was sweeping around originally, when I was trying to find that five kilohertz boost, I was saying, yeah, you know, the, the three kilohertz just kind of a little harsh to my ears. So let's sweep around now and you'll hear what I'm talking about. Yeah, right there. So all I did is just went in here, cut that just to help it feel a little bit less harsh. So I went and I did some gain staging to make sure that the loudness was the same. So here's before. Turn this up so we can hear, see a little bit better. So kind of sticking around five and here's after. So let's stick around seven. So let's increase it by dB and a half. Yeah, there we go. So here's before. Here's after. Here's overall before. overall after. So like I said, pretty subtle, nothing crazy, but the tone is a lot closer to where I want it to be. And I'm going to feel a lot more comfortable doing some pretty aggressive EQing with it in the actual mix now that it's kind of closer to where I want it to be. So let's check out another instrument. So we are actually going to take a look at the lead vocals. And these particular lead vocals, I actually picked on purpose because they don't really sound all that great. And the reason I did this is because a lot of times you're gonna be recording your own vocals or guitars or drums or whatever in whatever room you have available to you. So they're not really gonna sound all that great. You know, there might be a lot of room bleed, a lot of you know room sound, maybe just stuff is not interacting particularly well with that microphone that you have. So you're gonna have to use the tools that you have to make it a usable track. So let's hear what this sounded like before. Are you, I'll solo it out. Are you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. And here's what it sounded like after. Are you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. So still some stuff that we probably are going to need to address later on, but it's a lot closer to where I want it to be. It's a lot brighter. It doesn't have quite as much of that harshness and that honkiness. So let's talk about what I did on this and the EQing on the lead vocals, a little bit more complicated than the last EQs that we looked at this one, especially, and we'll talk about what this means. So let's look at the Pultec, this particular EQ. So you can see, We've got a boost at 200 hertz, so low mids. Got a dip around three kilohertz, so that's the upper mids. A boost around four kilohertz, which we'll talk about why I would dip so close to a boost in just a moment. And then another boost up around 10 kilohertz to give it some brightness. And then with this, well, we'll talk about what this is all about here in just a second. Let's focus on the Pultec first. So let me bring up my balance chart. Now, as I was listening through this, I was basically thinking to myself, you know, same as the electric guitar, you know, what words are coming to my head on maybe things that sound good with it or things that I want it to sound like or things that it sounds like right now that are negative and are those words in this chart or, a, you know, a synonym, a, sil a 
similar word. And I found quite a few. So soul it out. Let's listen to it. Uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine, nine, So obviously nine, first thing that you hear, you know, there's a lot of harshness. And shape it into just, just chains and rings. A lot of pain, honestly. A lot of, as I listen to it, like it's hard to listen to, which, which sucks because like it's a cool melody. It's some really cool lyrics, but it hurts to listen to. So harshness that's living up around one kilohertz to about somewhere between five and 10 kilohertz, you know? And I was also hearing that it wasn't really sticking out. Like it sounds pretty far away. So interestingly enough, you know, a synonym for that word is it sounds distant. Distant is down here. That's almost the exact same frequency range as harsh. Now this is a great teaching moment because this can happen with EQ where there is one part of the frequency spectrum that's causing a problem because it's too loud. And then a part that's right next to it that's causing a problem because it's too quiet. And that's actually what I did with this, where, where I uh, cut at three kilohertz and then boosted at four kilohertz. And I was also thinking, I was just like, man, this feels out of balance. It feels like it doesn't really have enough warmth to it. It feels kind of thin. If you look down here, thinness lives between 20 hertz and about 400 hertz, 300 to 400 hertz. So if I'm wanting warmth, you know, that's between 100 hertz and probably 500 hertz. So I knew the place that I wanted to search for these frequencies, search for this, this uh, sonic energy that I wanted in my sound to try to boost that up. And then finally, you know, it just kind of sounds dull, a little dark. And down here, same thing, you can see that dullness usually lives between 10 kilohertz and 20 kilohertz. So I wanted to make a boost around that area to just bring some life to it, bring a little bit of that air, which there's that word again, which also with lead vocal specifically, usually there is a boost on the top end anyway. That's a pretty common thing that you see in a lot of modern production for vocals. Now that doesn't mean you always have to do it. That's a big important thing. Don't take my word as gospel, but it's not something that's particularly uncommon to see three to sometimes even 15 decibels of boosting up in that region, uh, just depending on how dull that singer was. So let's go step by step and figure out exactly what we can do to improve the tone of all this stuff. So first thing that I did is I actually wanted to cut some of this harshness and add back some of that presence. So what I did is I grabbed my peak over here, turned it up all the way, and I just swept around to try to find the harshness. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. And you can already hear the difference between three and four is pretty dramatic. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone so out of number nine And that's three. Nine. And three is just like, it's like right up in your face and it hurts. And then four kind of just a little bit more airiness. And that's usually what I do when I'm trying to find frequencies that hurts, which is just like, I'm literally feeling my ears while I'm doing it. And it's like, does four hurt as much as three hurts? And you know, four kind of sounded nice to me. I mean, way too much, obviously, but you know, it sounded okay. And then three hurt quite a bit. So I'm going to go over here, pick three and then slowly move it up until it sounds like I've gone too far, then I'll move it back a little bit. Uh, you make my tombstone out so that sounds like I've gone too far. Turn my body into gold. A little bit better to me. Now I want to go in and add back some of that presence. Also because, like I said, this is a fairly wide cue. It's a pretty wide boost and cut. So I've cut a lot of four kilohertz, which is the thing that I wanted to boost originally. So I need to go in here and uh, compensate for that. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. Turn my body into gold and shape it into chains and rings. Okay, that's sounding better to my ears. So the next thing I want to do is I was saying I wanted a little bit more warmth wanted a little bit more body. And that's usually in the low mid. So I'm going to turn this up all the way somewhere between where is warmth? 100 and about 500 hertz. So let's see which of these fits best. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond. Yeah, definitely not 500 because 500 starts to sound very nasally. 
Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out of... You can make an argument for 300, but to me that sounds too boxy. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out of... And 200 boosted at 10 decibels definitely sounds like it's too, too much. But I think that's kind of what I'm going for, that kind of sound. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. Turn my body and a go. Yeah, so that sounds pretty good to me. Really all I was doing is boosting until I was like, yeah, no, that's definitely too much. And then taking it back a little bit, because I obviously went too far. So, now that I'm listening uh, to it. You make my tombstone out of no and, you know, I've got the warmth down pretty well. You know, I'm handling a little bit more of the harshness, but it still sounds really dull to my ears. And it actually sounds kind of unbalanced. Like, I, I really enjoyed adding this 200 hertz. But because I did that, it almost like kind of like a, a child getting on a seesaw. It almost just kind of moved everything a little bit too far down to the low mids. So I'm going to want to compensate for that by doing a pretty sizable boost uh, up here somewhere around uh, 10 kilohertz. So I'm just going to turn it all the way up, sweep around. Uh, you make my so that's already too harsh to my ears. Number nine Sounds Julie. better to me. Turn my body and the gold and, and once you hit 16, you kind of start to run out of actual frequencies to boost. So I liked 10 quite a bit. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. Turn my body and the gold and shape it into chains and rings. Great. So let's hear before and after. So here's before. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. Here's after. Turn my body and the gold and shape it into chains and rings. So definitely on the right track. But, you know, I kept listening to this over and over again, and I just kept thinking, you know, like, it's just kind of dull at the top. Even though I boosted five decibels, which is pretty good, pretty good sizable boost at the top end. I still want more. So I decided to come in here and give myself a pretty good boost. Now we're gonna get to these things in just a second. I'm actually just gonna bypass them. But I decided I was gonna use an EQ shelf and I was gonna get a large boost. Like I kind of wanted to, again, rebalance this whole part of the frequency spectrum. I felt like there was, even though I got the warmth I wanted down here, I felt like it was too much. It added a little bit too much. So I just wanted to move this back up. And let's see what happens after I do that. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone. Oh, I gotta turn it on, that's important. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. Turn my body and the gold and shape it into chains and rings. What happens to my ears I achieve the sound that I'm wanting. Like I get a little bit more of that forward sound. I get a little bit more of the brightness, but I also increase some stuff that I don't like. I increase some other frequencies that to my ears just sound really harsh. So I actually went in and I did a sweep EQ and I found three particular frequency areas where I was just like, yeah, I don't want to boost these. You can see I'm not actually cutting them really at all. There's not really much of any movement down below the zero decibel line. All I wanted to do is I was just like, they sound fine the way they are. I don't want to boost them. I don't want to cut them, but I don't want to boost them. I just want to boost everything around it. So let me disable these. I'll do a little sweep and we'll see what I'm talking about. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. So kind of like right here to me. Turn my body and the gold and shape it in. This just hurt my ears, so I decided to take that down. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out and then I was like, there's still more. It still hurts my ears, so let's keep going. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. Turn my body and the gold. So at about nine kilohertz, I'm hearing another problem. Now, this is another great example of sometimes you have problems and good stuff right next to each other because we've already boosted 10 kilohertz over in... Uh, in the Pultec. So it sounds like 10 kilohertz to my ears was really nice, 
but nine kilohertz just had some nasty stuff in it. So I want to cut it. Uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. Turn my body into gold and shape it into chains and rings. And I'll pity all the young men who are... And to my ears again, I, I was just hearing one more problem, just a little bit higher. So I grabbed another one and just started sweeping around, seeing if I could find it. And if I couldn't, I was just going to leave it be. Uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine, nine Yeah, right jewelry. there. Just that really harsh my hiss. my body and a gold and shape it into chains and rings. And I'll pity all the young... And that's all I did. You know, this looks a lot more complicated than it is. I was just trying to find stuff I didn't want to boost while I had a very wide boost of basically the entire top end. So let's do a quick before and after. So here's before. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. Here's after. Turn my body into gold and shape it We'll do before on the whole thing. So here's before. And, and I'll pity all the so, young men. lot farther back, a lot duller. And then here's after. And the old man with the piles of shiny things. A lot brighter, a lot more forward. Maybe still a little too harsh from time to time, but that's something that we can deal with in the mix. We don't necessarily have to deal with every single problem in the preparation stage. So those are two great examples of how to use the balance chart to shape the tone of your instruments. So let's listen to what I did throughout the entire mix. So we'll listen to before I did any tonal shaping and then we'll listen to after. So here's before. A lot muddier, not, nothing really sticking out very nicely. Here's after. A lot brighter. Just generally feels a little bit more alive. The instruments sound a little bit more interesting. Again, that's really the point of this, is just to make all of the instruments sound like the best version of themselves. But to really drive this point home, Please keep in mind the key here is subtlety. You're not trying to go in and just blow out every single instrument with like 20 dB boosts and cuts. You are trying to make sure that you're doing stuff to rebalance the tones, but it's stuff that, you know, if you get to the mix and you realize like, ah, you know, this is, this is too much, you can still deal with that. You can take it down a little bit. You know, you can just add a new EQ and say, yeah, you know, I, I actually don't think I need all this stuff at uh, four kilohertz and I'll just take it back down a bit. But if you boost by 20 decibels, then that's not really going to be something that you can just fix out of nowhere. So broad cuts, broad boosts, not particularly narrow, stuff that's very, very fixable. You want to make the tone better, not different. Save making the tone different for the mixing stage. This stage is just about making it sound better. Now, before we move on to the mix, there's one thing that I'd recommend that you do. And it's actually something that I haven't done in this particular mix because I wanted to be able to show you all of the processing for this entire process all at once. But usually while I'm using this method of doing EQ, once I'm done with my mix prep steps, I'm actually gonna do what's known as bounce in place. Some DAWs call it different things, but really all we're doing is we're saying, hey, I'm gonna commit these EQ moves to tape. I'm going to make sure that they're burned into the sound so that I'm going into my mixing with completely blank, like just a complete blank slate. I don't have any plugins that I have to bring over with me. This is just what it sounds like now. So in order to do that, again, different in every DAW, I would just do some Googling on how to do it with your particular DAW. But as you can see, I actually have, you know, a lot of individual mics that are all going to one particular bus track. So for logic, all I need to do is go up to file, bounce, and then track in place. And what it's going to do, let me actually rename this. This is usually what I like to 
name the uh, name the track as. I want to make sure that bypass effect plugins is not selected because I want to make sure that it's listening to those plugins and I'll hit okay. Cool. And now you can see that I have my own little track. So let's listen to the original. Okay, now let's listen to the new one. Exactly the same, right? But if I bring up my mixer, you can see this one has all the plugins on it, and the new one has absolutely nothing on it. Now the cool thing about this is I can do this for all of my tracks, and then either I can drag all of these tracks into a completely new session that I'm gonna use to mix, or you know, what I actually do is I like to just take these original tracks. If your DAW has an on off function like this, you know, I just turn them off so that none of the plugins are being processed. And then most DAWs have a function for hiding tracks. So I'll also hide it. So I know that it's there if I need to go back and reference it, or if I need to go back and fix a mistake that I made. If it's really dire, again, if it's just a small mistake, you can probably fix it uh, in the actual mixing stage. But it's there if I need it. So if I'm like, oh man, I, I just totally messed up. Maybe I bounced it wrong, you know, or maybe I forgot to put in some fades or I, uh, I missed a few really key spots. Well, I could just go in, unhide my track, and here it is. And now, now that I've turned it on, I have access to it. And all I've got to do is make my changes and then do the exact same thing. Just go up to File, Bounce, and Bounce Track in Place. And that's all you got to do. Simple as that. Again, figure out how to do it on your own DAW. Just Google your DAW, Bounce in Place, and something's going to pop up that's going to tell you how to do this. But going into your mix with a clean slate, I cannot begin to tell you how much less stressed you feel going in, knowing that everything sounds just so much better already and not having to make a whole bunch of decisions in the middle of the mix. It's really, really freeing. So all this being said, let's move on to the next step, which actually is not an EQ step at all, but it's the first step of any mix. And that's the volume balance, which you'll find out is actually a little bit of an EQ step of its own. So I'll see you there. So let's talk about this little in-between step that I'm calling step 2.5, which is where we're gonna be going over balancing your tracks. So close your eyes again and imagine with me. We have already cut all of our ingredients. We've fully prepared our ingredients. We've cut our onions. You know, we've diced up our meat. We've beat our eggs. We've done whatever we needed to do. Well, the next step is we need to combine those ingredients in the pan. We need to start putting stuff in and we need to start putting the right amount of those ingredients in. You know, that's part of the thing with cooking is you're not necessarily just throwing as much of those ingredients as you possibly can into the pan. You're making sure that the proportions are right. You wanna make sure that there's, you know, more meat than onions because the onions are meant to just complement the meat. Stuff like that. This is the first step of our mix. We've already gone through and done all of our mix prep. Now we're gonna be doing the first step, which is the volume balance. And we're gonna be doing the same thing that we would be doing if we were cooking. We're basically taking all of our now prepared ingredients and making sure that we're getting the right amount of those ingredients in the pan so that we can actually start to cook them. Volume balancing works almost like an EQ of its own. If your mix is too bright, you might want to reach for an EQ and, you know, turn some of the top end down, but there's honestly a good chance that maybe one particular bright instrument is just too loud in the mix. Or, you know, maybe if your mix is too dull, the exact opposite could be true. One particular bright instrument is just too low and you just need to take it up. This is the first step of balancing the tone of your overall mix, the whole thing. You have to balance the levels before you can balance the frequency spectrum. That's really, really important. I would honestly focus more on getting the volume balance right, the initial volume balance right, than I would really spend on any other step in the entire mixing process. If you want to get a good mix, you have to have your foundation down perfectly. So the way that I like to set up my volume balance is actually using a method called height order. So what height order is all about is it's saying, 
you know, let's look at the most important instruments in this mix. And let's set those levels first, because we want to make sure that those instruments are balanced correctly. Anything that's in the foreground of the mix, we want to make sure that that's balanced well. And then one by one, we can start adding in background instruments and making sure those are balanced with our now balanced foreground. And that's really all that high order is about is like, for instance, us starting with the vocals, setting the levels for that, then say, you know, maybe the next most important instrument is the kick. So, you know, then I add in the kick and maybe the next most important instrument is one particular guitar part. So I'll add that one in and so on and so forth. They're just making sure that everything is balanced around these important instruments and really balanced around the most important instrument, which in the case of this song is the lead vocals. We want to make sure everything is balanced with the lead vocals so that the vocals aren't too loud, not too soft, and nothing is covering them up. So now let's go in and do a volume balance of our own. So I'm going to go over to my mixer so that I can see all of the tracks that I'm working with. And I'm going to turn all of them down. So I'm going to select them all and just all the way down. Then I'm going to loop the loudest part of my song. And that's really important because sometimes, you know, if you were to loop maybe one particular verse, you get the level set really, really well for that. But then as you move on into the rest of the song, the chorus, for instance, might be really loud. And if you're setting up any kind of mix bus processing after this, say, you know, maybe some mix bus compressors, well, you might set those mix bus compressors up to sound really good with that verse and at the overall level of that verse, but the chorus is just really overloading it now because maybe you've set the volume for that unintentionally way too loud. And eventually down the line in mixing, you're definitely gonna want to go in and do some sort of volume automation because in no way are you ever going to be able to do a volume balance that is perfect across the entire mix. You're always going to have to turn certain instruments up louder and turn them down softer so that they fit the entire time. But we're not really going to worry about that right now. We're just creating what's known as our static mix. And I actually have the loudest part of the song already ready for us. That's the chorus of this song, which I have chopped out. It's the song that we've been using so far. So now that I've gone in and taken all of these down, I'm going to start with the lead vocals. And my rule of thumb is usually to put the lead vocals at around negative eight dB. Now, the reason that I do that, it's not a hard science. I'm not, it's not some sort of special trick that I have. It's just that whenever I put it all the way up at zero, sometimes I can overload my stereo output, my mix bus, really before I even start doing any kind of processing. So I want to have a pretty solid amount of headroom so that once I combine everything, nothing is causing the mix bus to distort. Nothing's causing it to clip. So I'm going to set it at negative eight. And obviously that just sounds like this. Uh, you make my so now I'm going to start using the kick. I'll start with the kick. Uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. Okay, then I'll start with the snare. My body and the golden shape it in. And I kind of want this, the kick and the rain. snare to be at similar levels because they're usually not happening at the same time. The young men who are saving okay, then I'll, let's say, uh, and the, the bass. The Get our, our rhythm foundation things. sounding good. Uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. Okay, now we'll move on to the chords. The gold and shape it into chains and rings. And I'll pity all the young men. Okay, that's getting there. Now I'm going to take up uh, my melody, my counter melody guitar part. Okay. Now let's add in the rest of the drums. Okay, now the room mic. Just a hint of that. And we'll come back to the toms. Okay, now I'm going to add in just this extra electric guitar part that just fills the sound out. Shape it into chains and rings. 
Okay, now I'm gonna put in the harmonies. That's sounding pretty good to me right now, honestly. I might want to turn the kick up just a hair. Just to get it to stick out a little bit better. Okay, now let's find a spot where the toms are. And this happens a lot with tom microphones because they only pop in from time to time. So in order to set their levels correctly, you've got to just loop that one particular spot. Okay, that sounds pretty good to me. All right, let me go back and loop this again. I might turn my lead vocals up just a hair, just to keep them on top. That sounds pretty darn good to me. Now, again, I would really want to make sure that I'm going in, I'm spending as much time as I need to to get the volume balance right. But you get the idea of how height order works. You know, because I based everything around the lead vocals, the lead vocals don't feel like they're being covered at all. Everything feels like it's balanced. If I was just to go left to right, honestly, I'd start turning up stuff that didn't really matter. And I would get really excited about some of like the detail stuff. But then the detail stuff, effectively, the background instruments would start to push out the foreground instruments. So you always want to make sure that you start with the foreground instruments. You're starting with the most important instruments to your entire mix and then peppering in details as you go. So now that we have been able to make our volume balance pretty solid, we get to move on to step three, which is balancing our mixes tone. That's going to be us using mix bus EQ. So I'll see you there. So let's move on to the next step in the chef method, which is step three, balancing your mixes tone. So once again, close your eyes, and imagine with me. So you've just put all of your prepared ingredients into the pan. You've made sure to put the right amount to get the taste that you want. So what is the next step in cooking? Well, you need to season it. You've got to get the taste right. You know, you need to kind of start to flip around your ingredients. Well, maybe you throw in some salt or some paprika, some pepper, maybe some Italian seasoning if that's what you're going for, or some Old Bay if you're doing something a little bit Northeastern. I'm just going to start saying random seasonings. It doesn't matter what seasoning you put in it. That's basically what we're doing in this step is we are getting the overall tone, the overall taste, so to say, to sound the way that we want it generally. So this isn't necessarily us going in and making lots of tiny individual tweaks. This is us saying like, okay, I want the whole mix to be brighter, or I want the whole mix to be a little bit less muddy, or I want the whole mix to have some nice aggression to it, something like that. And the way you do this, once you have a good volume balance is with mix bus EQ. And that's basically just an EQ that you put on the output of the entire mix where any single EQ move you make on it is going to be applied to the whole mix, every single track in your song. So I've actually got one right here that I have turned off right now. You can see I've already pre-made it. Let me get rid of a few things. Now this might look a little bit complicated and we'll go in just a second and talk about how I got each of these particular boosts and cuts. One thing that I do want to point out though, is I do want to say, look how subtle this is. I'm not, I'm not making any massive boosts or massive cuts, you know, nothing really more than three decibels. You know, what is that? Like 1.5 dBs, about 2.5 dBs, about three dBs, one dB, that kind of thing. And all very wide on the gain, very wide boosts, wide cuts. This is because very dramatic moves on your mix bus EQ can wreck a mix like that if you don't know what you're doing. Same thing with very thin boosts and thin cuts. If you're having to use a really small cue, 
Well, that's usually something that you can fix on the track level. You can actually just go in, you know, it's usually one track that's causing the problem, you know, make the fix, solve the problem. The reason that we're not using very thin cues is because usually stuff like that, where it calls for, you know, a very thin band is a problem with one or two tracks. It's not usually a problem with the entire mix. So you would definitely want to go into the track level and fix that there. So let's see what this sounds like before and after. So here's before. And here's after. Got a lot brighter, right? Lost a little mud, a little bit more aggressive. After. Again, very subtle moves, nothing really too much. You know, I, I wouldn't really do too much unless you really know what you're doing. Like if you're more advanced, go for it. But right now I wouldn't really risk it. Now, the big question, of course, is how did I come to those specific boosts and those specific cuts? Well, I used what's called reference tracks. Now we've covered reference tracks already in this course, but what reference tracks are, basically they are mixes that are professionally done out in the world that are of the same genre, kind of have the same instrumentation, the same sound that you're going for that you can help to base your mix off of. So you're using it as a target, a mixed target, so that you're not mixing blind, just throwing darts wherever you want to willy-nilly. You have somewhere to aim, and that's really, really important. So I have one reference track right here, just for example. Usually I'd recommend having two or three, but for this example, I just have one. And I wanna show you what that sounds like. So it's a little bit brighter, obviously, than our mix, a little bit cleaner than our mix. And part of that is just that this is like a studio song and our entire recording was done in someone's living room. But this is definitely the vibe we're going for. It's that kind of indie rock, a little bit atmospheric sort of vibe. So in order to use this to uh, successfully figure out what we need to do with our mix bus EQ, the first thing we need to do is gain stage our reference track to where our mix is right now. Now, usually our reference tracks are gonna be quite a bit louder than our mixes because our reference tracks have been, you know, they've been limited, they've been mastered, they've been made to be put out on the radio. But ours is still in the mixing phase. There's not been any limiting, there's not been any mastering, we're still working all that stuff out. So we're, mo we're most likely going to have to bring the volume down. So in order to do that, we're gonna bring up our VU meter and we're gonna to listen to both mixes. And I'm actually going to take off the gain plugin because I, you know, I've already gain staged it to, to a certain extent. So let's listen to our mix and I'll make sure that our bus EQ has been turned off. Okay, it's kind of sitting around zero dBVU, kind of one, negative one to plus one. So let's check out our reference track now. Way too loud, right? So now I'm going to go in and start turning it down until it starts to sit around that same level. Okay, let's check ours again. Okay, then let's check theirs. So it's definitely close and you're never going to be able to get it right on the money because again, this has been compressed for one, you know, none of these tracks have been compressed yet. It's been compressed, it's been mastered, it's been fully mixed. There's a lot that's going for this track that we are not going to have. So we're kind of just trying to get it to roughly the same, the same loudness. So my usual rule of thumb, my little trick is I like to solo the reference track and then unsolo the reference track. And if the transition sounds natural to me, almost like I'm skipping ahead in a playlist, then it's usually the right amount of loudness. But if it sounds unnatural, then it's probably either too loud or too soft. So let's try it again. So 
so it might be just a hair too loud. Yeah, that sounds pretty good to me. Now, one thing you can do if you want, you know, I do this sometimes on some mixes. I don't know if I'd recommend doing it all the time, but sometimes I actually will keep a limiter just bypassed on my mix output. And I'll actually use it to get a more limited, louder sound for when I'm using the reference tracks. You know, just to make sure that we are on equal playing field. Because again, like once you have a track limited, it's kind of just a whole different beast than what you're using. Now, sometimes that's necessary, sometimes that's not, but it's good to at least know that if, you know, you just cannot for the life of you get your reference track to sound like your mix, well, you might need to just use a limiter while you're listening to the reference track and going back and forth. But definitely always mix without a reference track. Make sure that you're bypassing it anytime you're not using your references. So let's see what this would sound like if I did use my, my limiter. So I'm going to I'm going to have to get a pretty good amount of gain reduction because, you know, my reference tracks probably getting somewhere between 2 and 5 decibels of limiting most likely. So, I got to get around there. So it's probably going to sound pretty gross, and that's the point. Okay. Okay, so now my reference track sounds, you know, too quiet because I've limited this. So I'm going to turn it back up a little bit. That's pretty close. So I am actually going to turn it back down. We're not going to use the limiting for this particular example because I don't think it's really all that necessary for this song, but I just wanted to let you know that that's an option if you're really struggling to, to compare your references to your original mix. So let's bring up our cue here. And I'm actually gonna bring up a second one so that you can see what's going on. So you definitely wanna use your ears. I, I will say this is actually a moment where I also like to use my eyes to a certain extent, just to see if I can see any very obvious holes in between my reference and my actual mix. So let's listen to the mix itself. Okay, now let's listen to our reference. Actually, one thing really quickly, this is a good moment to talk about this. So if you're using a reference track, I would highly, highly recommend that you create a mix bus that is literally a bus and then route that to your stereo output so you can actually see that all of these tracks if i open up let me get out of all this uh, if i open up the mixing view all these tracks instead of being routed to you know the stereo output they're being routed to bus one and bus one which i'll move this you can see is the input of this this is my mix bus i've just made a mix bus before my output. Now, the reason that I do that is so that I can send my reference tracks to my output and have them not be affected by any of my mix bus processing. Because, you know, if I do mix bus EQ, as I'm making my EQ moves, well, every single time I do that, the reference track is gonna start to sound different. And I'm gonna have to start making more and more drastic moves to get the sound right. And the more drastic the moves that I make, the harsher the sound of the actual reference track. So we want to make sure that it's not being affected by any of the mix bus processing. So I like to make sure that it's being routed completely separately of your mix bus. So that said, let's go over here. This is my stereo output and I'm going to grab an EQ plugin just so that we can see what's going on. So let's listen again to our original track. And just get a general idea of sort of like the the curvature. And then let's check out our reference. So you can tell, you know, our reference has a little bit more of a smile curve. There's a little bit less mids than we have, uh, a little bit more uh, of the upper mids, a little bit more of the lower mids, but there's definitely just a little 
Just a little dip right there. And I would be hearing that if I was using my own, uh, my own ears as well, because I would kind of be listening through and I'd just be like, man, you know, this thing sounds so much more aggressive. Well, you know, aggression is usually a word that goes along with the upper mids. And if you might, you might also say, oh, this sounds so much more full or fullness is usually a word that goes along with the low mids. And then as you're listening, I don't know if you would necessarily say like, oh, you know, this reference track feels more midsy. I don't think you would say that, but you might be listening back to your mix and say like, oh, you know, my mix just sounds kind of a little boxy or a little honky, or maybe maybe a little, a little harsh at times because some harshness lives in the mids as well. So that's kind of how you can figure out just using your ears, now, what exactly is going on here? Where are the differences? So all that being said, let's check out our mix bus EQ again. You can see this is exactly what I've done. I've added a little bit in the upper mids to match some of that aggression, added a little bit in kind of the lows and the lower mids to boost up just some of the fullness. And I made, I've made a little bit of a cut down at the very bottom of the lower mids to get rid of some of that boxiness that we were talking about. And also to match the smile curve that we saw where the top and the bottom are boosted and the middle is cut just a little bit. I've also added just a small filter at the very, very bottom. So you can see it's only set to uh, 24 Hertz. You know, the only reason I've done that, I, I probably don't need to do this honestly, but it's just to catch anything that's down there that I somehow missed on any of the tracks. I'm not gonna need anything in this frequency range for this particular track. You know, if I was doing an EDM track, I would not do this because I want stuff in that sub frequency range. But for this particular song, it's just a little bit less necessary. So what I would do if I was going through the process of making this is I would, and I'll actually disable all these so that you'll be able to see me do it in real time. You know, all I would do is same process as I've always done. I would grab a bell, I'd sweep it around kind of in the area I was thinking of and I'd um, get it to just, just where I want it to be and move it up a little bit, increase the cue, get it to where I like it, and then listen to my reference track again and see if that helped. Yeah, that sounds pretty good to me. So, before, after. Definitely helps with some of the aggression of the overall mix. Okay, so now I'm gonna go and I'm gonna add a little bit here in the lows just to give it some of that fullness. Yeah, probably about right there is where I would put it now. You do want to be careful making boosts in the lower mids and sometimes the lows just because that's the traffic jam part of the frequency spectrum. You know, the low mids is where everything's fundamental frequency is, you know. All of the notes on a guitar pretty much just live in that part of the frequency spectrum. So boosting it sometimes can really create some mud issues. So I would, I wouldn't recommend just doing massive boosts down there. Just a DB or two is fine. Okay. Now I really wanted to go in, make some of those cuts, get rid of some of that boxiness. Yeah, right there sounded pretty good. Sounds pretty good to me. Before. Now, the only other thing that I did is I made a little tiny cut right here. And I, if I remember correctly, the reason that I did that was because this boost was boosting some stuff in the snare that I just didn't really want to get boosted. So I just made a tiny cut to compensate for that. Yeah, right there. That said, if I could go back in time, 
I actually think I wouldn't have done that, and I would have just gone and turned the low mids of the snare down just a little bit. Because again, I'm turning down, what is this, 181 hertz on the entire mix, when really the snare was the problem in my ears. So I, I really should just go deal with it on the snare rather than basically creating a hole in the whole mix to just to fix one little tiny problem. So I think I'm gonna actually just leave that out. Okay, now let's make sure we do some gain staging. That old chestnut. So here's before. So again, we've got kind of that um, one to negative one to plus one dBVU. Now let's look after. Honestly, they sound pretty similar to me, which makes sense because we made, you know, we made two boosts, but we made one pretty, uh, pretty sizable cut as well. So even though we boosted some volume, we also lost a little bit of loudness. And if you go back and forth, you know, it's going to sound a little bit louder no matter what, just because we've boosted the upper mids. And again, that's where the loudness tends to live. But, you know, as far as how it's working in the real world, it's around the same, same amount. you can maybe turn it down like half a dB. Yeah, cool. That's sounding pretty good to me. So after you do that, all you've got to do is go back and check your reference again, solo it out, see if that helped. If it did, perfect. And if not, go back and try again. So let's listen. Okay, and then ours. Yeah, I'd say that's a lot closer. Now this brings up one final point that I do want to make sure that you know. So sometimes the moves that you make with your mix bus EQ are gonna make certain instruments sound out of whack. Like to me, the vocals are starting to sound a little too aggressive, you know, the the overheads might sound just a little too aggressive, the overheads of the drums. And that is very natural because you're going to be dooming the mix bus EQ at the very beginning of the mix. You want to make sure that you are mixing everything into it. So this is literally, I guess, doing your volume balance is step one, but this is like step two. The moment you finish your volume balance, you're putting your mix bus EQ and any other mix bus processing onto your mix bus so that you are mixing into it because that's going to make a world of difference rather than slapping it on at the very end. And whenever you're mixing into it, sometimes you need to make some compensations, like for instance, in the snare that I was talking about earlier, you need to make some compensations in certain instruments. And that's totally natural, it's totally fine. That's something that we are gonna be dealing with in some of the upcoming steps in this process. Speaking of which, we have step number four coming up in just a moment, so stay tuned for that. So it's time to check out step four of the chef method, blending your instruments. So close your eyes again and imagine with me, you have put all of the stuff in the pan. You've put the correct amount of proportions of all of your ingredients, uh, and then you've taken your seasonings and you've seasoned it correctly. So what is the next thing you do whenever you cook a dish? It's pretty obvious. You turn the heat on and you cook it. Really, I mean, it's it's that simple. We're turning the heat on in the pan, we're stirring the ingredients over time, and all of the flavors, all these individual flavors from the individual ingredients all combine into one central flavor for the dish. So in terms of the chef method, we're going to be blending all of the unique tones and flavors of all of our instruments into one centralized cohesive sound, just like you would with your dish. With this particular step, I really like to talk about how this is kind of the step where your random collection of tracks begins to actually sound like a mix rather than just a collection of a bunch of instruments that are technically a song. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. You know, whenever you finish recording your song and you listen back, you're just like, man, this doesn't actually sound like a song. It just sounds like I recorded a bunch of instruments together. You know, this is the step that makes it feel 
like a mix. So that said, here's a question. Why do all of these instruments sound kind of random together? Like, why don't they just fit on top of each other perfectly? I mean, they're all just instruments. Shouldn't they just fit like they would in like a, a live setting? And the main issue with this is a concept called masking. Now, what masking is, is it's basically a, an acoustical physics property where if you have two sounds that live in kind of the same area of the frequency spectrum, then rather than being able to hear both of those sounds equally when they're played together, you can only really hear about half of them. And it's the phenomenon that happens whenever you solo something out and it sounds super full and really bright and it's you can just hear everything in hyper detail and then you unsolo it and it just vanishes into the mix. So let me show you an example of what masking sounds like. So let's listen to our kick right now. I'm just gonna solo it out. Okay, pretty full sound, you know, got some nice brightness to it, pretty loud. Now I'm just gonna unsolo it and I'm actually gonna play it for a second before I unsolo it and just see how it kind of just immediately fades into the mix, even though you had such a beat on exactly what it sounded like. Just gone. That's because of maskings, because there's so many other parts that are covering up the frequency spectrum where the kick is trying to live in. So how can we deal with mastering? You know, obviously this is one of the biggest problems with creating a blended sound, creating, you know, a bunch of instruments that sound like a mix. So how can we deal with it? Well, we are going to be covering that in this step. So to do this method, you need to ask yourself first three rounds of questions. Round one, ask these questions. What are the most important instruments in the mix? You know, what are the instruments that are meant to stay in the foreground of the mix? And then what are the less important instruments of the mix? You know, what are the instruments that are meant to stay in the background? And then finally, I want you to listen to your foreground instruments. You know, what, what background instruments seem to be competing for space which, with each of them? Now, I'd let you know this method in general is going to be a lot easier if you write this stuff down. So if you if you write down at the top, you know, foreground instruments and you write down vocal, kick and snare, one of the guitar parts, and then you write background and you write, you know, overheads, other guitar parts, background harmonies, stuff like that. Uh, because this means as you continue to ask more questions, you'll be able to keep track of everything around you. This step has a little bit more preparation to it than some of the other ones do. I also want to talk to you really quickly before we move on to these other questions about one of the best ways to tell what background instruments seem to be competing with the foreground instruments. So what I would do is basically listen to your mix and specifically listen to whatever instrument you want to focus on in that moment. So let's say the lead vocals and then do what I call the mute button method. And that's basically where you go through and individually mute one by one each of your background tracks and even some of your foreground tracks and see which one, once it's gone, which one opens the vocal up the most, which one makes the vocal the most obvious. So I'll do it for you really quickly just so you have an idea. So let's just start with the guitars. So that definitely helps a little bit. That one doesn't really do that much. And that one's that one does a ton. You know, just instantly I'm able to hear the vocals so much better. So that would be an example of one of these background instruments that I would want to write down because it's competing for space with the lead vocals. It's causing some masking to happen in between the two of them. So again, just to review for the first round of questions, what are the foreground instruments? What are the background instruments? And what instruments are competing for space with the important ones? So now let's move on to your second round of questions. And that's what the questions that you ask once you've answered these first few. So where does each foreground instrument live in the spectrum? And where does each 
background instrument live in the frequency spectrum? I'm not necessarily only saying, you know, where are the frequencies in this particular instrument? Because like, obviously, if I play just the vocals, uh, you, make you know, there's kind of some between 200 and then all the way up to 20 kilohertz. That's not really what I'm talking about. I'm kind of talking about where's the, you know, the one or two frequency ranges where that particular instrument shines, where that particular instrument has the most energy and the most character. So, for instance, let's say the snare. Let's look at the snare. Now, you can do this by listening, of course. But I would say the upper mids and the lower mids. The lower mids is where the punch is, and the upper mids is where kind of the, the crispness is. And you don't necessarily have to write down, you know, 100 hertz to 157 hertz or anything like that. Just understand low mids generally, upper mids generally, that kind of thing. So finally, after you've gone through and done that with all of your instruments, kind of figured out where they all live. And again, you can do it pretty quickly. You don't need to spend a lot of time doing this. Then ask your final round of questions, which is really just one question which instruments are in the same octaves. This is gonna cause some pretty serious masking problems, especially if they're similar instruments. One common instrument that has a lot of problems in this is the electric guitar, because a lot of times there's several parts going on, but they've all been written in that same octave. So let's check out our electric guitars and see if there's any that are kind of sitting around the same area. I would say these two. Specifically because the EG3 part has a lower octave inside of it that's similar to the octave that's in EG2. So I would want to write down EG2 and EG3. And I'd go through and do that with other ones. This is a pretty sparse mix. So honestly, that's likely going to be the only culprit here. You could also write down the bass and the kick. Now the kick obviously isn't a tonal instrument, but its main frequencies, its main notes, so to say, are in the exact same area of the main notes of the bass. So I would say that's a great example as well. You could also say the lead vocals and the harmonies are an example. Usually those are in the same octave unless one of them is maybe a male vocalist and the other one is a female vocalist. But in this case, they're definitely in the same octave. Number nine, diamond jewelry. Turn my body and a gold and shape it into... So once you've written down all the answers to these questions, then you can start the process of blending all of these instruments together with EQ. Now, to blend your instruments, you're going to have to go through three main steps, and we're going to cover each in detail, but I'll give you a quick little preview. So step one is you want to make a boost where an instrument should be dominant. Step two is to make a cut where an instrument should make space for another dominant one. And step three is to do what's known as pocket EQing for instruments that are in the same octave. So three steps and your instruments are gonna sound a lot more blended by the end of it. Now, I wanna go through each of these steps in detail. So step one is to make a boost where an instrument should be dominant. Now, this is mostly talking about your foreground instruments. So for instance, I might want to go back to my snare. You know, we were talking about how it mostly lived in the upper mids and the lower mids. So I might want to make a slight boost in the upper mids or maybe a slight boost in the lower mids and say like, OK, this is where the snare is going to stick its feet. It is living in this and we are going to make sure that it is heard by the listener by making some slight boosts, nothing that's going to really change the tone of the sound, but just something that's going to emphasize those areas. So step one is going to be you going through and doing that for all of your foreground instruments, and then maybe some of your background instruments. If you have lots of background instruments and maybe one of them you want to stick out a side of your other background instruments, that might be something you could do, but that's primarily something to do on your foreground. So your kick, your snare, your vocals, if you have a counter melody instrument, something like that, that would be the thing to do on that. And we'll go over all of this in a second as far as 
what, uh, what this is going to look like. So step two is to make a cut where an instrument should make space for the dominant one. Now this is where it's helpful to know where your background instruments live and also what instruments are competing the most with your foreground instruments because those are the ones that you're most likely going to want to make cuts in. So if I said that the snare, you know, I'm going to make a boost in the upper mids of the snare and maybe one of the electric guitar parts, you know, I felt like it was really competing with the snare. Then I might want to go to that electric guitar part and basically make a small cut in the exact same spot that I boosted in the snare. So if I boosted at 5,000 Hertz at a width of, you know, one Q and, you know, I boosted it by two decibels, then I'd want to make a cut in that electric guitar part two decibels width of one at 5,000 Hertz. I believe that's what I said earlier. That's all you have to do. You just have to mirror exactly what you had done before. That is going to help to cement your foreground instrument as the foreground and your background instrument as the background, preferably without actually affecting the tone of these instruments really much at all. It's just creating space. It's creating space in your mix for different instruments to live in. And this is also the step where you're gonna be doing any of your tonal shaping with your filters. So you might actually say, you know, there's a lot of top end information in this bass, but it's really not adding that much and it's causing some masking in some of the electric guitars or the vocals or maybe the acoustic guitars. So you'd actually go in, take a filter, cut some of it out. And if it doesn't really affect the tone all that much and it clears up the rest of the track, awesome. Later on down the mix, if it becomes too problematic, you can always take it off, which is really, really great about this stuff. You can take it off if you need to, but it's there to create that kind of space and blend these instruments together. And then finally, we get to step three, which is to do pocket EQ with instruments that are in the same octave. Now, what that means is we're going to be basically combining step one and step two into a single step and we're going to be focusing on very specific instruments. So let's look at, for instance, EG2 and EG3. Those were two that we were saying were in the same octave. So with these instruments that are sitting in the same octave, all you want to do is make a boost in one where it sounds really nice, make a boost in the other where it sounds really nice, and then make a cut in the first one where you boosted in the second one, and a cut in the second one where you boosted in the first one. You're basically just putting an EQ on one of them and then putting the, ag the exact reverse EQ on the second one. And that's really going to help those instruments to stop fighting because it's going to create some subtle space for them to live in. So now that we've gone through these three steps, let's look at some actual examples of what this looks like. So I'm actually going to start with the lead vocals. Now, obviously the lead vocals are one of the most important parts of the mix, if not the most important part of the mix. So I'm definitely going to want to do some kind of general small boosts, nothing really to change the tone, but something to just help this particular instrument be emphasized in the mix. Now, I know the vocals kind of live everywhere in the mix. They're obviously extremely important, but one of the most important frequency ranges for them is the upper mids. So I decided with this particular vocal, I was gonna make just a really small boost. You can see just, I mean, two decibels, something really small, around five kilohertz. Now, the reason I chose that particular area of the frequency spectrum, again, all I did was sweep around, found the area that sounded the best to my ears, then took it down to an area that felt more natural and wasn't really changing the tone too dramatically. It sounded pretty good. And you can see I've made it pretty darn subtle, so it's not really changing the tone. And I've made it fairly wide as well. You don't want to make it too wide, because if you make it too wide, then you could risk getting that particular instrument in the way of other instruments. So you're not necessarily wanting to do like a Q of 0.5 or anything like that. You know, I'd stick with somewhere between one and two, maybe 2.5 at the very most. So that's a good example of step one. We've made a boost. We've emphasized a particular instrument in a frequency range. Now let's check out step two, which is going through and making some cuts in that frequency range to help certain instruments get out of the way 
and keep them from masking the more important instrument. So one instrument that's kind of struggling with some masking is the harmonies. So what I actually did is I went in to around that same area and I made a cut. Now you can actually see that I made a little bit more of a dramatic cut than the boost in the vocals. And that was because, you know, I actually was okay with changing the tone of the harmonies on this one. And this happens sometimes. You know, the harmonies were really sticking out. You know, they had maybe a little bit too much personality, too much character to them, when in reality, I just want them to sit behind the vocals, kind of blend into the lead vocal sound rather than be their own individual part. So I decided to cut that out a little bit more because usually, like I said, sort of the emotion, the tone, the character of a vocal lives in this region. So let's do a quick before and after for these two things together. So here's before and I'll solo them. Usually I would not recommend doing any of this step in solo. The whole point of this step is to create a better sound contextually. But with this particular example, I'll solo it just so that you can understand exactly what it sounds like. So here's before. Of number nine diamond jewelry. And here's after. Of number nine diamond jewelry. You hear how the harmonies just kind of back up a little bit? Like they don't get quite as much in the way. The volume hasn't changed. The loudness hasn't changed. All I did was cut a little bit in an area where I wanted the main vocal to live in. So I'll show you one more time. So here's before. Of number nine diamond jewelry. And here's after. Of number nine diamond jewelry. Pretty cool, right? So I've done this across the entire mix. You know, I have certain instruments that I want to be more emphasized, those foreground instruments that I have, you know, a really small boost in. Then I have other instruments that are the background instruments that I want to make sure aren't cluttering up the frequency spectrum. I've got some cuts in those to make room for those foreground instruments. And like I mentioned before, the trick to doing this is kind of going through doing that mute button method to be able to figure out, okay, well, what background instrument is clashing the most with this foreground instrument? And it's going to be a lot easier to know what that is if you've gone through and figured out where each of these instruments live in the frequency spectrum, uh, which we had covered just a little bit ago. If I'm able to look at the lead vocals and say, okay, well, this lives in the upper mids and I want to make a little boost in the upper mids. Well, what background instruments also live in the upper mids? And obviously one of them is the harmonies. I can maybe make an argument that another one would be some of the electric guitars or maybe potentially the overheads. So that's gonna be a very, very helpful tool for you in getting this done quickly and not having to just sit there, not being totally sure what to do. Now, one quick tip, if you're trying to do all of this in context of the mix, which again, would highly recommend that you do, sometimes it can get kind of difficult to really know exactly what's happening when the volume is so low. So what's your solution to that? Now, all I would do is throw a gain plug in on the very end of your chain, and you can see I actually have one all the way across on all of my instruments. And I've just got a 7 dB boost on here. And anytime that I want to do something like this where the EQ moves matter in context of the mix, all I'm gonna do is just turn this game plugin on and all of a sudden I'll be able to hear that instrument way better. And it's almost like I'm using a magnifying glass on that one instrument. So I still see everything else. I still hear the context, but that instrument is the focus now. So I'll show you just what it sounds like. I mean, it's I'm just turning the volume up. There's nothing really special about it. But that'll help you out quite a bit. I will let you know there's nothing special about this number that I picked. Two, three, four dBs is fine. 10 dBs is fine. It's just whatever works best for you. For whatever reason, seven and a half decibels to my ears is the perfect amount of volume so that I can get a feel for a sound, but not so much that it drowns everything else out. Now, I want to show you an example of pocket EQ, which is the thing that we talked about for step three of this process. Now, two instruments that were living in relatively the same octave range were EG2 and EG3. So these two electric guitar parts. Especially because EG3 has this lower guitar part that's mixed into it. So what I wanna do is do some pocket EQing. Now, let me bring up over here an example of what I did. So you can see 
In EG2, I've got a cut around 1.3 kilohertz and a boost around 3.6 kilohertz. And over here, I have the exact opposite. I've got a boost at 1.3 kilohertz and a cut at 3.6 kilohertz. And all I did to figure that out was I went to EG3 and I was kind of sweeping around and I just was like, okay, you know, this part of the frequency spectrum sounds best to me. So 1.3 sounds really good. Then I got out of that, went over to EG2, did the same thing, swept around, was looking for what the best part of the frequency spectrum sounded like to me. I usually like to make sure that it's pretty close to the other one because this technique usually works a little bit better if the cut and boost are relatively in the same range. But I picked this particular area, 3.6 sounded really good to me. So all I did is I went back to EG3, I made a cut right here, and then I came back to EG2, made a cut at the same place that I made a boost in EG3. So literally just the exact opposite. I basically just copied, in fact, you could even do this if you wanted to. You could just copy the settings of this plugin. So hit the copy button. You could go over here, you could hit paste, and you could literally just type in the exact opposite. So rather than 2.59, it's negative 2.59. Five, nine. And rather than negative 1.69, it's just 1.69. Same thing. And we've gotten to the exact same place that we were before. So let's do a quick before and after. Again, it's more important to listen to this in the context of the mix. I'm going to keep preaching that, but just for ease, uh, let's just do it in solo. So here's before. And here's after. It's subtle, but it's supposed to be subtle. It's not supposed to change the tone. It's just supposed to create a little bit more space. And that's what I like about it. You know, I didn't really want to change the tone at all. I had it where I wanted it. So all I wanted was to create something that was gonna kind of glue them together just a little bit. Another thing I might wanna do in the future uh, once I get to my compression stage, maybe I'll do some parallel compression with both of them. So I'll send both of them to the same compressor to continue to create that glue that I was just talking about. But this is a great first step for that kind of thing. So now that we have gone through, you understand how to do step one through three, let's do an overall before and after so that you can hear exactly what's happening here. Okay, ready? So here's before. Here's after. You hear how like the snare and the vocals lifted up out of the mix a little bit? And the kick lifted up out of the mix a little bit, but everything else fell down a little bit? That's because we created that space. So before. And again, it's subtle. It's not meant to be anything else but subtle, but you are making sure people are paying attention to the foreground and that the background is there to be the background, to add more detail and intrigue and space to the sound. Now you can get more dramatic if you want to. You know, I know some people who will do massive boosts and massive cuts. Once you start doing that, you run the risk of changing the tone of each of these instruments. If you're okay with that, then go for it. That's what I would say, you know, if, You've been experimenting with this for a little bit and you're just like, yeah, you know, this just isn't really blending these sounds as much as I want them to. I'm going to get dramatic. Absolutely go for it. But at first, I would definitely try it subtler, you know, two to three decibels. And then if that's not enough, then go in and maybe make some boosts, some larger boosts, make some larger cuts and see what that sounds like. So before we move on to our next step, I wanna go over one really quick, important topic, which is where should this go in your plugin chain? Like when should you actually do this? So we've done a really good job of creating a foundation for each of our instruments. You know, we've already gone in, we've already done all of our cleaning, uh, we've already gone in and done all of our tonal shifting to make sure that the tone of each instrument sounds great. So a lot of the stuff that we would be doing during the mix, we actually did before the mix. So what I like to do is I actually like to go in and start doing my compression, maybe a little bit of my saturation, those kinds of effects first, and then I'll start doing my blending EQ like we've been doing. The reason for that being 
a lot of times compression changes how things tend to mesh together. And it changes it, in my opinion, a little bit more dramatically than this blending EQ does. So I wanna make sure that I'm doing my blending EQ on top of the foundation that I have rather than it being a part of the foundation and then I compress it. Like I said, compression first, maybe saturation, maybe, maybe some effects, maybe I would do some experimenting. It's gonna depend on your sounds and then do your blending EQ after that. So one thing I did forget to mention, one thing that you will see a lot in step two of this process is you'll see people start to do tonal shaping with their filters. So let me bring up EG3 again, because this is actually a good example of something I did that with. So you can see right here that I've got a pretty dramatic filter on this whole area. Now, the reason for that is that I already have an electric guitar part that's adding most of the low end that I want in this mix. And that's actually EG1, it's the chords. So I'll play this real quick. So I don't need a ton of extra low end information, just muddying up the mix. You know, and I also listened to EG3 along with the lead vocals, and I was hearing a lot of muddiness between the two of them, which we had seen whenever I had done the mute button method and found that these two instruments really seemed to clash a lot because whenever I took EG3 out, all of a sudden the vocals really started to sing. They started to really pop out. So I discovered that the low mids was the cause of a lot of that muddiness. So rather than going in and just doing a small cut, I decided it would be okay if I just took it out. I wasn't really gonna be able to hear the tonal change that much. And honestly, it helped to enhance other parts of the tone that I wanted for just other instruments in the song. So I'll show you a quick before and after. I will say, you can see, I've got a pretty light slope on this. So six dB per octave. You know, sometimes you'll do 12 or 18. I don't really think you need to get too aggressive with it. You know, if you start getting it much higher than that, then the filter becomes a little bit less musical and a little bit more obvious. So I would definitely stick with a lighter slope. And I'm really gonna show you, I'm gonna make sure I show you this in context and I'll turn the, the volume up so you can hear it because soloed, it's gonna actually make it sound worse. It's, it's not gonna sound better. That's okay. This totally depends on how it helps the mix, not how it helps the sound of that particular instrument. So here's before. Here's after. You know, you can hear it doesn't really change the tone that dramatically, but some of the other stuff started to come out a little bit. Let me just turn this off and let's do another before and after in context. So here's before. Here's after. So it doesn't affect the tone really all that much at all, but all of a sudden I can hear the chords a little bit better, the bass sticks out a little bit more, the lead vocals stick out just a little bit more. So this is something that you'll see on a lot of background instruments and even some foreground instruments. You know, One thing that you might see me doing is maybe cutting a little bit of the top end of the kick because it's just not quite as necessary. It's just adding sound that's covering up other stuff. Or you might see me doing the same thing in the bass, or you might see me cutting some of the top end of the electric guitar because you know, some hiss might be existing up there in a denser mix that's just not really adding anything. Or you might see me cutting out a lot of the low end of the harmonies. Because again, like I'm wanting these harmonies to really mesh with the vocals and most of the low mids just aren't really adding anything but warmth and character. I don't really want warmth and character. You know, I just want notes, I just want notes to happen and notes to exist behind the lead vocals to create a more consistent chord. So. With that in mind, we have successfully made our entire EQ foundation. We've gone through, we've cleaned, we have enhanced, we've made sure that the whole mix tone is exactly where we wanted it to be. Uh, we've gotten a solid volume balance because that's its own little form of EQ as well. And we have blended the sounds of all of our instruments together to make more of a cohesive sound for the mix. So. Now we're gonna be moving on to step five, and that's making your final tweaks. All right, so we've done it. We have gotten to our final step of the chef method, and that's step number five, making your final tweaks. So close your eyes and imagine with me one last time. Imagine yourself just right over the pan. 
you've finished up all of your seasoning, you've been cooking it for 20 minutes or so, been stirring it around, letting all of those individual tastes all coalesce into just one central taste. And finally, it's time to take the dish off the heat and out of the pan. What is the first thing that you're going to do once you do that? You're going to grab your spatula, you're going to dig it in, you're going to taste it, and you're going to see what it tastes like. And you're going to think, okay, something's not quite right yet. So you're going to grab some seasonings, maybe some salt, some pepper, paprika, whatever, and you're going to re-season it a little bit. You're going to add some more seasoning until it tastes right to your tongue. So tasting it, re-seasoning it till it's just right. This is exactly what we're doing in this stage of EQ. This is our problem solving stage. We've done everything we can to create an incredible foundation with these tracks to where all of them sound, you know, super well enhanced. We've gotten rid of all of the nasty gunk out of them. We've gotten to we've gotten them to fit together just a little bit better. Now we're tasting our dish, we're listening to our tracks, and we're just seeing what's a few small things that we can finish up. We can just tweak a little bit so that we can call this mix done. Because again, everything we've been doing has been creating a foundation. There's still some work that's left to be done. That said, this step is the hardest to give specific advice for. And that's because the problems that you hear are entirely dependent on your instrument's tones and how they sound together. I'm not going to be able to say, go do this, go do this, go do this. I've been doing that for the last four steps. This is where it's entirely up to you and your ears and seeing what you can fix now that you understand EQ. So this is just like, again, the re-seasoning process. You know, if you take a taste of your dish, you're not going to know like, okay, great. Well, now that this is done, let me go back and look at the recipe. Oh yes, it calls for a little bit more salt at the end. You're just gonna taste it and think, needs more salt, add some more salt, taste it again. That needs a little bit more salt. Add a little bit more salt, taste it again. Perfect. That's great. That's exactly what we're doing in this particular step. So as far as what I would do to finish this step up, I'd listen. I'd maybe even sit with a pad of paper or something like that. I'd sit and I'd listen and I'd ask yourself a few questions. I'd ask myself, is anything too harsh? Is anything sticking out too far? Or is anything covering up another element that's more important. You know, is anything too dull or too bright? And on the opposite side, is anything too bassy or too boomy? Or even, is anything too thin? The opposite side of that. In reality, this is going to be you doing your final balancing. It's going to be you taking out your balance chart, sitting and listening and thinking, this is too warm, I need it to be less warm, or this is too bright, I need it to be less bright, or this is too harsh, I need it to be less harsh. Your final problem solving. That's all you're doing. Also, make sure to listen to your references again. You know, it's going to be very, very important for you to update your ears as you go along so that you are finding the problems where they are. You know, you'll be able to ask yourself questions like, you know, are there any instruments that are too far off of your target? You know, is your mix tone, your overall mix tone good? Is your volume level? Is it set correctly? Are all of your volumes set the way that that they need uh, to be, especially when you're referencing it against this pro track? All of these questions are going to be extremely helpful for you. I will let you know the more you do this step, the better you will get at it because you're able to hear problems without really trying too hard. But at first, if you've just started EQing, this step might be a little bit uncomfortable for you, you know, because every step we've had so far has had a system. It's had an order. It's had a workflow. This one's all jazz, baby. You are improvising on the spot, hearing problems and fixing them. Let's look at just a few quick examples before we call this mix fully completed, or at least the EQ of this mix fully completed. So let me show you what this sounds like. So here's before. And here's after. And really, again, this is going to make a lot more sense in context of the mix, because I actually don't like this sound soloed. And that's something that you have to understand with a lot of EQ is sometimes you're going to make it sound worse in solo in order to make it sound better 
in the mix. That's obviously especially true of these last two steps, because a lot of the stuff we've been doing, if we soloed it out, we'd kind of be like, mm, I don't think that actually helps. But in context of the mix, the whole mix sounds better. So I'll turn this up for you. So here's before. And after. It just helps to open up a little bit more space for some of the other stuff that's all living in the low, the low mids. So now that you've heard a few examples, let's just go ahead and turn everything on and off so you can hear what it all sounds like. So here's before. Okay, and here's after. Subtle, again. But I think it really, any of the problems I had with this last bit, kind of just go away. And like, yeah, obviously it still needs a lot of compression. It still needs some other stuff. It still needs reverb. It's completely dry, but it's sounding pretty darn good for having only done EQ and volume balancing. It's sounding pretty fantastic. So let's do my favorite part of the course, which is going back and listening to what it sounded like before we added all this stuff and then listening to what it sounds like now. So here's the song before we did any of the chef method with no processing on it. It's pretty rough sounding, right? Here's after. It's bright, it's powerful, things mix together well. So before again. Now let's just go step by step, just for fun. So that's the mixing stage, first stage. Then we did the tone stage. Then we added our mix bus EQ. I'll wait till it starts over. Then we blended all the sounds together. And then finally we did our final uh, problem solving. Uh, our final problem solving fixes. Totally different mix, totally different sounds. Now the cool thing about this method is that usually you would have to do all of these things in one EQ at the same time. You know, you're trying to just think of every single tiny possible thing you could ever need to do to the frequency spectrum of this instrument. But because we've been able to separate this into I, I suppose four steps for each instrument and then the mix bus EQ, you're able to focus on one thing at a time, which means that you're going to be able to be more creative. You're going to be able to mix faster and mix longer. And ultimately your mixes are, are going to sound so much better. Hopefully this has helped and I will see you in the next video. So one of the most common questions that I hear as a teacher of mixing and recording is why is my mix so muddy? People talk about that all the time, how you know they do all of this mixing and they play it through their speakers and there's too much gunk in it. There's too much mud. It's too thick. Use whatever word you want to use. Now, another question that I'm asked all the time by beginners is, you know, why is my mix too thin? You know, maybe it just sounds brittle or harsh or it just sounds uh, weak or hollow. And I don't think many people realize that those questions are two sides of the same coin. Whenever you are asking, why is my mix thin? Or why is my mix muddy? It's honestly just saying, why is my mix out of balance on one side of the frequency spectrum? 
versus why is my mix unbalanced on the other side of the frequency spectrum. So we will get more into the details on how to fix muddy mixes and thin mixes, but in general, the reason that you have a muddy mix is that you have too much sonic energy in the lows, the subs, and the low mids, and not enough sonic energy in the upper mids and the highs and, and maybe the mids. On the flip side of that coin, the reason that your mix is too thin is because you don't have enough sonic energy in the subs, the lows, and the low mids, and maybe too much sonic energy in the mids and the high mids and the highs. It's honestly just a balance issue. It's not necessarily an issue with any particular effects or instruments or anything like that. It is a overall sonic balance issue. So let me show you exactly what I am talking about. So I've actually got a mix up here, full mix, and I'll show you what it sounds like. Fire, fire. Pretty good, pretty full. Maybe even a little, a little warm on its own, maybe a little, a little muddy on its own. But I actually have here what's known as a tilt EQ. And what a tilt EQ does is as I turn the gain up and down, it actually changes what is being boosted and what's being cut. So one side is always being boosted and the other side is always being cut. Let me show you what this sounds like. If I boost it, you know, at the very top of the low mids and cut it at, you know, the mids and the highs and the uh, upper mids. So here's before. Fire, fire. And here's after. turn it down a little bit so you can tell the difference before very balanced very full after way too much bass not enough top end sounds too thick too muddled like stuff is in the way of itself do this just to give you a better example. Usually this is what it sounds like whenever you talk about, oh, my mix is muddy. It's, it's usually pretty dramatic. So on the flip side of that, if someone is saying, oh, my mix is too thin, well, that's going to sound the, like the opposite. It's going to sound like this. Now there's just no energy down in the lows. Ton of energy up at the top. Here's the original. And you can just feel like, man, this is just too... It's almost boring. It's harsh. You know, there's no rhythm to it. That is the only difference between a muddy mix and a thin mix. So if you're able to figure out how to fix one of these problems, well, you're actually going to be able to figure out how to fix both of these problems. So you should be able to keep yourself from having both a muddy mix and a thin mix. So let's talk about some specific things that you can do to avoid having these kinds of mixes. Let's talk about one of the best techniques that you can use to figure out exactly what instrument is causing the muddiness. Now, sometimes it's a multitude of instruments, maybe just all of your instruments don't have enough low mids or low end, or they don't have enough top end if it's, if it's too thin. But sometimes it's just one instrument that's really causing the issue. So if that is the case, we want to use what's called the mute method. So this is basically where we just go through all of our instruments one by one, and we mute them, and then listen and think did that help the muddiness? In this case, we're gonna be looking for muddiness. And then at the end of each of those sessions of listening, we can say, yes, it did, or no, it didn't. And if no, it didn't, then we move on. And yes, it did, cool, we're gonna stop and EQ that one. So let's listen to this song. Land on so it's kind of muddy. There's just a lot happening down in the low end, I'm gonna to need to go through and figure out exactly what's going on. Now, with muddiness, sometimes the problem is the kick and the bass, for sure. 
But at the same time, you know, whenever I mute them, I'm going to lose low end no matter what. So you want to be careful with using the mute method with the kick and the bass. It's not that they are not the problem, but that you might just want to take these results with a bit of a grain of salt. It's like that, that helped a little bit, but we also just lost a lot of low end. So I don't want to get rid of that. I want the snare. That just got rid of a, top, a lot of top end. I want to keep that. Yep, and getting rid of the rooms. The room mics isn't the problem either, so the drums are good. So we don't need to worry about the drums. So let's try muting the bass. Now, obviously that helped. Again, no matter what, muting the bass is going to help your muddiness problem. But you want to have your bass in there because otherwise there's, no, otherwise there's no low end. So again, take that with a bit of a grain of salt. Let's keep going. Okay, that's helpful, but I lose a lot of rhythm. So let's keep going. Okay, nothing really changed there. Hello. You hear how once I muted that particular guitar part, everything just opened up. I could hear parts that I just couldn't even hear before. So let's do it again. So here's before. Here's after. So obviously this instrument is the problem. This is the one that's really causing a lot of the muddiness in this particular track. Okay, cool. So now that we know the instrument that's causing the most problems, let's unmute it. And I'm gonna bring up an EQ and we are gonna go about fixing it. So the main way that I want to fix this is I wanna actually create a sweep EQ. So kind of a medium Q around, you know, one to two. And I'm gonna sweep around the low mids and the lows and see if I can find the spot that it makes it the hardest to hear all of the instruments around it. So once it becomes difficult to hear the rest of the parts of the mix, that's the area that we need to cut. So let's sweep around and see if we can find the spot that's the least intelligible. That seems like it's adding a lot of mud right there. Yeah, I think that helps a lot. It still is a, maybe a little bit too muddy. I might actually need to get rid of some other frequencies that are getting in the way of the vocals, for instance, but it no longer feels just overpoweringly muddy. So let's do a before and after. So here is before. I'll turn this up a little bit so you can hear it better. And here is after. And here's basically what we're getting rid of. So I'll, I'll solo this so you can hear it. Just all that nastiness. And it sounds really good by itself, but when it's just too much, it is filling up the space in the mix. It's crowding other instruments out of the frequency spectrum. It's gotta get cut. Yeah, listen to how out of balance that is. And now how in balance that is. So that's the best way that you can figure out how exactly to deal with your muddy mixes, how to deal with your thin mixes, is just using the mute button method to find 
the tracks that are really causing the problems and then sweeping around, you know, the lows, the low mids, if it's muddy or sweeping around maybe the highs or the high mids, if it is too thin, making some cuts, trying to figure out kind of where's the area that's really causing this to get so aggressively out of balance and then cutting them and then listening, maybe turning the volume down a little bit, turning the volume up a little bit and just rebalancing your mix. Using this technique, it's going to be a lot easier for you to be able to actually create the balance that you've set out to create in your mix. So here's another common question. Why does my mix seem to sound bad everywhere else outside of just the room that I mixed it in? And this is a really, really common problem for, you know, beginner mixers all the way up to advanced mixers. You spend hours and hours tweaking your mix, trying to get it perfect. And then for some reason you play it anywhere else outside of the place you mixed it. And it just sounds crappy. It's too bassy or it's too bright or it's too thin or it's too muddy. Put whatever words you want to put in there. Something is really, really off. This is not necessarily because you are bad at mixing. There's actually three main variables that go into getting a mix that's going to translate well. And that's the word that we use to talk about mixes that sound good in all different kinds of speakers, small ones, big ones, the mixing speakers that you're using, you know, the speakers on your phone or in your car. There's the three main variables. So the first variable is bad acoustics in your listening space. The second variable is lack of context while mixing. And the third variable is an unbalanced low end. Let's talk about that first variable, bad acoustics in your mixing space. The room acoustics dramatically affect the tone of your sound and the accuracy of your speakers. Basically, because the sound waves are coming out of your speakers and bouncing all over the place, before they actually reach your ears, you're getting a very colored sound. You're not getting what it sounds like in a vacuum. Well, that's all well and good. What that means is that any mixing moves that you make are not going to be accurate. So you might need to boost the bass by four decibels. And you know, you do that, the mix sounds incredible, but you really only needed to boost the bass to get it to sound good here in this room. But then you take it to another room. Again, you take it to your car, you play it on your phone and that sounds terrible. It's extremely out of balance. And it's because you didn't actually need to put that much bass in it. It's just that that's what this untreated room needed in order for it to sound good here. So lots of things go into your room, the size, the shape of your room, the material of your room, the speakers that you use, where you place those speakers, all of those are going to color your sound. So not only would I recommend finding the best possible room to mix in and getting a really nice set of speakers, but I'd also recommend doing some research on where exactly you should be placing your speakers and doing some acoustic testing to make sure that they're in the best place so that you're getting the most accurate sound. Also, I would really recommend investing in some acoustic treatment. Now, there's all different kinds of acoustic treatment. I would primarily focus on getting some absorption panels, like the ones you see here and in the back. These are basically panels of fiberglass or insulation uh, that soak up rogue frequencies and give you a more colorless sound in your room. Now, I know these can get a little complicated, but there's some incredible resources out there that can tell you everything that you need to know about them, from which ones to buy, where to place them, how much you need. It's something that I would invest time and money in before I would even invest time and money in any expensive gear. That's the first thing that I would do is I would tune your room. Well, I would pick the best room. I would place your speakers in the best spot. And then I would tune your room with some acoustic panels. And I would recommend staying away from acoustic foam if you can. Acoustic foam is kind of a cheaper alternative to acoustic panels that sometimes gets marketed as being, you know, the same thing, even though it's half the price, it's not. I really would invest in some good quality acoustic panels to get the best 
accurate sound out of your room as possible. And we've attached some stuff to this video, some resources for you that'll help you out in this department. So the second variable that's causing your mixes to not translate is your lack of context while mixing. What I mean by that is that right now you're mixing blindly. You don't actually know what is the best way to get a professional sounding mix. You don't know if you're boosting the top end of your vocals enough or too much. You're just having to use your ears completely blindly and see just what happens to sound good to you. Instead, what I'd recommend is using reference tracks. These are some of the best tools that you can use to get a professional mix. They give you a target to hit rather than just mixing blind. You are constantly checking out these professional mixes that are in the same genre with the same instrumentation as yours that sound fantastic and you are going to be able to say okay i want to do that i want it to sound like that and these aren't meant to help you creatively just functionally this is not going to help you with the art form of mixing but it's going to help you to create the best foundation for a professional mix and the reason these reference tracks are such good targets to try to hit is because they usually have been mixed by professional mixing engineers who have a music label that is funding them to give the best possible mix, one that's going to translate on any speaker because these songs are going to be played on the radio. And obviously the radio is played from everywhere from your car to crappy restaurant speakers to your phone to the stereo in your living room. So those mixes have to sound good everywhere. And if you're basing your mix on a mix that already sounds good everywhere, then it's going to be significantly easier for you to make a mix that sounds good everywhere as well. I would definitely find two to three of these reference mixes to check every 30 minutes or so just to reorient your ears. You want to make sure that that target is consistently in view. You don't want to go hours upon hours of mixing before checking it again because then you're not getting nearly enough benefit out of it. You'll get to the end of those hours, you'll listen to the reference mix, and you'll realize that you pointed the rudder in the wrong direction. You didn't realize that you actually went too bright or too dark because you weren't constantly checking back up on it and reorienting, retuning your ears. Now, the final variable that's probably causing your translation problems is an unbalanced low end. So low end is pretty tricky to get right, but it's also the biggest part of the mix that's likely causing your mix to sound so muddy or so thin in different places. And the reason it's so important is because most speakers out in the world, you know, they all replicate the mids and the upper mids and maybe the low mids fairly similarly. You know, some are obviously better quality than others, but they all sort of have that. But the low end is something that a lot of speakers skimp on. And it's also something that a lot of speakers maybe put too much of. So if you ever see, for instance, a car driving down the street and you hear all of the bass that's coming out of it, well, they have a speaker in their trunk called a subwoofer that's specifically to create too much bass. And on the flip side of that, your phone, I can guarantee you, does not produce very many bass frequencies. And so because of that, it's very easy for a mix that was meticulously crafted to just fall apart. So the trick is not just boosting your low end to oblivion. That's a big, important thing to realize. A lot of people think, okay, well, if I want my low end to fit, I just need more and more low end. That's not necessarily what you want. What you really want is a balanced low end, something that when you're listening to the rest of the frequencies in your frequency spectrum, the rest of the tone of your mix, it sounds like it fits. It sounds like it's balanced. And using a good reference mix is one of the best ways to do that. Constantly going back and seeing like, are, are my levels right? Is my bass too loud? Is my kick too loud? Is it too soft? I also would recommend, although this doesn't have anything to do with EQ, I'd recommend using a lot of compression on your bass instruments because having a consistent low end is going to basically create a foundation for your entire song to sit on. But if your low end sort of keeps popping in and out, well, some speakers might play well with that, but other speakers that don't produce frequencies very well in that part of the frequency spectrum, they are going to just 
drop your song. Anytime that your low end is inconsistent, anytime the volume drops really dramatically, it's gone. So definitely a lot of compression is gonna help that out as well. I would also recommend that your bass instruments have a healthy amount of low mids and mids and upper mids, kind of somewhere in between those two regions, because those usually are the areas that are produced the most in those small speakers, the ones that don't produce much low end. So if your kick drum, for instance, only produces bass frequencies, if you just cut everything out except for everything below 100 hertz, well, again, might sound great in your room, might sound great even in your car, which has some good speakers, but if you play it on your phone, it's going to just get poof, instantly thin and quiet too, because bass is often the thing that compressors on your mix bus and limiters react the hardest to. And so it's just gonna sound extremely quiet because bass frequencies are so loud to our ears and all of a sudden they're just gone. So having a healthy amount of low mids and upper mids, which are the two areas, like I said, that are going to come out in those small speakers is really gonna help. Some ways to increase those, that could be using EQ to just literally boost those areas if it needs it. Obviously it could be compression to make sure that it is as consistent as possible. Could also be multi-band compression to make sure that those frequency spots specifically are really consistent. It also could need some saturation, specifically some saturation that adds frequencies in the upper part of the frequency spectrum. So some kind of saturation plugin that has maybe a tone knob that you're able to mix into the original sound so that it's creating stuff only in the upper mids of the frequency spectrum. That's gonna help out quite a bit as well for those small speakers. Even if you can't really hear it all that well in larger speakers, because the bass is very, very audible because it's balanced well. So really, if you're able to do these three things, if you're able to balance your low end, if you're able to give yourself context while mixing using a professional reference track, and you're able to tune your room to make sure your acoustics are great, then your mixes are going to improve dramatically when they're played in other spaces. Those are the three things to focus on. If that's your biggest problem, fix those three things, and I can guarantee you, you are going to hear an audible difference. So one common question is about the idea of mixing in mono. It's something that you see all the time at just different parts of the internet. It pops up in your recommended videos on YouTube, or maybe you've heard some of your friends talk about it. You know, we're just some random internet teacher has been like, oh, you gotta mix in mono, you gotta mix in mono. And there's a lot of confusion around it. You know, what is it? Why is it necessary? Is it really necessary? So I'm here to answer all those questions, make sure that we're all on the same page. So mixing in mono is when you sum your entire mix from stereo, which is where you're using two speaker channels, so the left and the right, down to mono, where you're using just one speaker channel. So stereo being, you know, you have your left headphone right here, your right headphone right here. If you pan something to the left, it's in the left. If you pan something to the right, it's in the right. Mono being basically you can't pan anything. Everything is dead center. Everything is one dimensional instead of three dimensional or rather two dimensional instead of three dimensional because you can still push things forward and back with reverb. But the whole point of the technique is to basically do the bulk of your mixing in mono. Now this is a little bit controversial because whenever you sum things to mono, it sounds bad like it's it's not fun to listen to and let me actually show you what i'm talking about so i've got a little bit of a demo mix right here i haven't actually mixed any of it outside of panning it i've panned stuff to the hard left and hard right but you can see like all of the levels are the same and i have a gain plugin on the output that i'm going to use to sum this mix to mono so listen to it beforehand Now let me turn on mono. Everything just poof, right to the middle, right? It sounds significantly worse. So before. After. You know, it not only 
takes away an entire dimension of sound. It makes everything sound so muddy and cluttered and it just, it's so much harder to hear everything. So if it sounds worse, why would we do it? It's very counterintuitive, but there is actually a good reason why people recommend doing this. And it's basically that mixing in mono is harder, but it's going to force you to get a great EQ mix. And the reason for this is because everything is stacked on top of itself. So it forces you to create great separation in between instruments using EQ and volume and sometimes, you know, compression, maybe effects. Whereas if you are able to do most of your mix with your instruments panned, well, in order to create separation, all you have to do is just pan to the left or pan to the right and you're done. And while that might be a great quick fix, if your mix ever gets summed to mono, which happens all the time in a lot of phones and restaurants and a lot of laptops or Bluetooth speakers, it's gonna fall apart instantly. Because again, going back to this mix, it's going to go from sounding like this to sounding like this. So it'll go from having a decent amount of clarity to just no clarity at all. So you have to create balance in your mix and everything, again, it always comes back to balance by allowing you to not focus on what's happening to your left and to your right and forcing you to focus on what's happening in the middle. You are going to create better clarity in your mixes, almost without even intending to. It's just going to happen. It definitely is going to make the process of mixing more frustrating. You need to be aware of that. There's going to be a lot more time that you're doing your mixing and you're just like, man, this is just not sounding good. Why is this not sounding good? You need to be aware of the fact that that's going to happen because you're going to want to give up. And you're going to want to just be like, man, like I, I suck at this. I'm not good at it. Why am I even trying? But what's going to happen is that once you get to the end of the mix, and I usually save my panning kind of for like the last 20% of the mixing process, you'll start panning stuff to the left and to the right. And just instantly your mix is going to go from sounding fine to just sounding insanely good. It's going to be a moment of revelation for you. where you are going to just be like, whoa, why does this sound good all of a sudden? And whenever you're able to use that in conjunction with reverbs and delays and maybe even some new volume balancing, some volume automation. Oh my gosh, I mean, your mix is gonna go from one dimensional where it's all just centered in this one point to three dimensional where it has depth, things are pushed back and it has width, things are pushed to the left and the right. It goes from sounding like a single point in space to sounding like an actual band that you are actually listening to at an actual concert. But if you don't start mixing, with it in that single point, it's not gonna matter. It's just not gonna sound as good. So could not recommend it enough. Certain people will do it differently. Some people will reference in mono, so they'll pan stuff at the beginning and kind of flip back and forth throughout their mix to make sure their mix is sounding good in mono. If that works for you, go for it. I usually just don't even mess with panning until the very end of the mix. Like I said, kind of like the last 20, 25%. Once I start getting around to adding reverbs, that's when I start doing all of my panning. So whichever works for you, I would recommend. As far as the best way to sum things to mono, if you do already have stereo files, I would definitely recommend doing what I've done here, which is putting a, you know, a gain plugin or a mono plugin or whatever your DAW has, putting that on the master bus. It needs to be the last channel, or rather it needs to be the last plugin on your channel and just turning it on. You can see I've got my little mono button right here and that's gonna take everything that you have panned left and right and boop, putting it right in the middle. Now I will say one little caveat, one little detail. If you have any mix bus processing, especially any mix bus dynamics, so compression or any mix bus saturation, I would recommend panning stuff that's supposed to be panned, you know, to the hard left and hard right at the beginning of the mix and then just mixing with this gain plugin on. So I'm talking about stuff like, for instance, you know, the overheads. The overheads are, let me turn this off, pretty much no matter what going to be 
pan to the left and the right. You know, there's one microphone in the left side of the drum set, one microphone on the right side of the drum set. The reason I would recommend doing that at first and then just mixing with your mono plugin on is because panning does change some of the volume balance. And especially for stuff where like it's going to be panned the entire mix, no matter what, it's going to mess with your compression, your mix bus compression or your mix bus saturation. If you pan stuff hard left and hard right, once you get to the panning stage and all of a sudden your mix loses some volume, which means your mix loses some dynamics. So I would definitely recommend doing that. That's just kind of like my one little trick that I recommend. But as far as, you know, like, oh, I want this guitar to be panned just a little bit to the left, just a little bit to the right or hard left, hard right. I would not worry about that until the very end of the process. So hopefully this helps you with your mixes in the future. This is definitely something where if you get into the habit of doing it at the beginning of every single mix, you are going to notice a difference. It's going to sound a lot better by the end of the process. So there's lots of controversy around whether or not you can and should use presets whenever you're doing any kind of mixing. Now, when I say presets, of course, I mean the things that come with the individual plugins that have different settings that the manufacturer has given you already that basically help you to set up a preset mix for your particular instrument. Now, the controversy is you know, obviously like, is it cheating? Is it going to help? Or is it only going to hurt? Is it going to achieve what you want to achieve? Or is it only going to cause more harm than if you had just done it yourself? So my take is this. Presets are very helpful learning tools, but not very helpful mixing tools. They're really great for learning how EQ affects the tone of a particular instrument. As you go through some of the presets that are in your stock EQs, you actually will start to find out like, oh, okay, I think I start to understand how certain genres get quotation marks that sound. But at the same time, every single instrument is different. Every room is different. Every mic is different. Every performer plays their instrument differently. So no preset EQ curve is going to get the results that you need because sometimes you might actually need the opposite of what that preset is giving you, even though that preset might be the preset for pop vocals and you want a pop vocal sound. But if your singer is extremely bright naturally, then having a really big boost on the top end that comes with that kind of preset might actually hurt you rather than help you. So these presets are fantastic starting places for while you're learning to figure out exactly what EQ is going to do to your instrument. But you shouldn't actually use them for your mix itself. Okay, so let's look at an example of what I'm talking about. So right here, I have a vocal track and I've got an EQ. And I actually put a preset on this EQ labeled clear vocals. You know, that's always nice to have. I want you know, some clear vocals that really stick out. So let me show you the before. You were meant to be adored by more than just me. Pretty smooth sounding. You know, obviously the reverb is maybe a little weird for this example, but honestly, it's a, it's a pretty good sounding, pretty good sounding uh, vocal track. Let me put on this preset. So here's after. You were meant to be adored by more than just me. It gets a lot weaker when I do that. It loses a lot of the warmth that I really liked at first, and it gets a little brittle on the top end. You know, it already had a lot of a top end boost added to it earlier on, and it, it just is unnecessary. It doesn't need to happen. So if I had decided to use this for my mix, ultimately my vocal would probably sound a lot worse in the mix. Now, if I was to go and do this with intention and use this as a good starting place maybe, but uh, really listen to the sound and think like, okay, what does this need? Here's what I would probably do. So first of all, I would take off this top end boost. I would take off this little mids boost. I might actually do a little bit of a cut in the low mids. You know, it is really warm, but might be a little too warm. So I'd hit play and I'd move this around. You were meant to be adored by more than just me. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes, 
recklessly. And, you know, maybe it could use just a little bit of a boost in the upper mid, so I might actually want to add something like this. You were meant to be adored by more than just me. I can tell by the blaze in your eyes. Sounds pretty good. Recklessly. So you can tell what I did is rather than just saying, okay, I'm gonna adjust the volume of each of these bands, I actually took the bands, found a better spot for them with this particular vocal, and got them to fit well with the sound. So, you know, I did end up cutting some of the low mids and I did end up boosting some of the upper mids, but had I left them exactly where they were and done that and had a large cut down here, well, I'd have just a much thinner, more brittle sounding vocal. But because I mixed with intention, because I EQ'd with intention, I was able to go in and ultimately make a better sounding vocal because I used what I learned from this preset and, you know, made it go for what this vocal actually needed. So hopefully that's going to help you out as you're traversing the world of presets. Again, just to drill this into your head, great way to learn what particular EQ curves do to particular sounds, I would not use them for mixing. So great for learning. Don't use them for mixing so much. Hopefully that helps. So a lot of beginners think that you have to buy your way into a quality mix, that you're not going to be able to really get that good of a sound using the stuff that we have learned about throughout this course, unless you actually have really high quality professional gear. And that makes total sense because prior to the digital revolution that happened in the late eighties, the only way to actually get a good quality recording was to go to a multi-million dollar studio, probably backed by some kind of label or record deal. You know, that's the baseline of our imagination. Plus gear manufacturers have spent millions upon millions of dollars to try and advertise and convince us that the only way you're gonna get a good sound is with their product. And after hearing the same message over and over and over again, you're inclined to believe them. You get what I like to call gas, gear acquisition syndrome. You start to feel like it doesn't matter how much I practice, how much I learn, how much I do. If I don't have the shiny toys, if I don't have the nice things, then my mix is always going to sound subpar. But I'm here to put that myth to bed. You can't buy your way into a pro sound. Money doesn't translate into quality. Skill translates into quality. My rule of thumb is that your mix's quality, like the, the sound quality of your mix, is going to come from 90% skill and 10% gear. I'm going to say that again, 90% skill and 10% gear. So you could blow thousands of dollars on premium plugins and expensive outboard gear and all the whole nine yards, but ultimately you're only going to take it up 10%. But if you constantly learn and practice and apply yourself, not only to the techniques that we've learned throughout this course, but to every other kind of education about mixing and recording and just doing the things that you learn, your mix is going to improve exponentially faster. Now, there is a time to purchase quality gear, for sure. I'm not saying that there isn't. Otherwise, I wouldn't be using it throughout this course. But you don't want to spend the money until you've mastered the tools. Because otherwise, you're going to spend a lot of money, you'll get your new toys, and then you'll be really confused why your sound is just as good or just as bad as it was before. Because premium plugins don't actually improve your sound until you know how to use the tool. It's not just an instant sound gooderizer. You have to actually know how to do it, and you can't learn how to do it unless you start with the basics and use your stock plugins. Plus, stock plugins are higher quality than they've ever been in the history of recorded audio. Seriously, I mean, the quality you're getting whenever you purchase your DAW versus what you were getting 10 years ago even is incredible. 
And I actually want to show you exactly what I'm talking about here on this session. So I have two mixes of the exact same song, one using only stock plugins and the other one using only premium plugins. Now, all the same mixing decisions were made. You know, it was to a certain extent, a bit of a copy and paste situation. I'm, I'm not trying to pull the wool over your eyes or anything by mixing one better and the other one worse. It's basically the same mix. Just one with stock, one with premium. I want to show you the difference because you will hear a difference, but it's going to be a lot more subtle than you expect it to be. So here is the stock plugin mix. Okay, and here is the premium plugin mix. Did you hear a difference? There is one, but it's pretty subtle. So I'm going to go just back and forth so you'll be able to actually hear what is changing. So here's the stock one. Here's premium. So the premium plugin mixed song is definitely a little bit smoother. It's more dynamically consistent. The instruments kind of blend a little bit better. It doesn't necessarily have the same kind of digital harshness that comes from cheaper plugins. But that said, everything that I just said was very, very subtle. And had you come to me and said, hey, I mixed this with only premium plugins and you showed me the stock plugin mix, I'd believe you. That's the thing to know because this was not mixed with good plugins and this wasn't mixed with good plugins. They were both mixed with skill. That is what's going to affect your sound, not your expensive plugins, not your expensive gear, nothing shiny like that. That said, if you are talking back to me from behind the computer screen saying, Dylan, I have a budget, I have a goal, I am gonna make this happen. I am going to go out and spend as much money as I need to spend to get the best sound I possibly can. Okay, if you have a little bit of money to spend, here is where I would recommend that you invest. Rather than buying a bunch of nice plugins right when you first start learning how to do this, I would invest in acoustic panels for your recording and mixing room before I would invest in dozens of premium plugins. This is because it's going to make a serious difference in the quality of your recordings and it's going to make a serious difference in how accurate your speakers are whenever you're doing your mixing. And the more accurate your speakers are, the more likely your mix is going to sound great everywhere instead of just sounding good in your mixing room and nowhere else. I'd also recommend spending some money on ear training and education, which obviously you've already done a little bit of. But again, not to be a broken record, if skill is 90% of your sound quality, then I would rather be really, really good at this and spend my money to get even better. Spend my money on tools that will, that will allow me to hear frequencies better, to be able to tell when something is sticking out, and then also spend my money on education to just learn how to do this better. Learn the art form, learn the science, understand the jargon and the physics, and the creativity. By doing all of that, you're gonna be able to increase the quality of your mix exponentially versus increasing it by just a hair. So one common question that I get from a lot of students is how do I use Dynamic EQ? And really, what is Dynamic EQ? What should I be using it for? So Dynamic EQ is honestly just the newer version of multiband compression. It is the perfect combination of compression and EQ all in one plugin. How it basically works is that you set a particular band and then set a threshold just like you would in a compressor. And then whenever a singer or a drummer or a bass player, you know, plays a note that has too much sonic energy in that one area, enough that it goes above the threshold, well, then the EQ kicks on and 
it turns that section down. It's a really great way of creating more of a consistent tonality out of a fairly inconsistent sounding performance. So let me show you what I'm talking about. So I actually have here a vocal that whenever it's unprocessed, it honestly sounds really inconsistent. There's a lot of random parts of the frequency spectrum that are just sticking out depending on what word and what syllable are being sung. So I decided to go in and use a dynamic EQ to kind of um, flatten it out just a little bit. So I'll show you a quick before and after. So I'll solo it out. Here's before. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. Specifically listen to those first few words, like the ah, oh, you make my tombstone. Now listen to this. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. Now it's pretty subtle. That's it's intended to be pretty subtle. It's not anything that's massive, but all of a sudden it feels just a little bit more smooth. You know, it's still pretty nasally. There's still stuff that I'm going to need to go in and do with EQ to fix up the tone, but it's a lot more consistent. Let's do it one more time just so that you can hear it. So here's before. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. And here's after. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. Now this is a technique that's most often used with vocals because there are some vocalists where, depending on how they're enunciating a word or pronouncing a word uh, or where that word falls in their vocal range, will actually change the formant. So they'll open up their throat more or they'll put, you know, they'll put the note farther up into their nose or something like that. And that will change the tone of their voice pretty dramatically. One easy fix to that is rather than going and, you know, cutting at 500 where on one note out of six, there's way too much energy at 500, you can grab a dynamic EQ just like this one and basically just set the threshold in such a way where it only grabs just that one note and turns that one note down at that part of the frequency spectrum. Pretty simple. Now, before we go on, I do want to give a quick disclaimer. Dynamic EQs are a very shiny tool. It, it feels like you have a lot more control over the instrument that you're working with. I'll let you know, rather than being a tool that you should be using in every single mix, this is more of a tool to fix one particular problem. It's a tool to fix inconsistent tone. So you don't really need to be using it unless you've come across an instrument with a very inconsistent tone. So I would much rather you spend 99% of your practice time getting really good at regular EQ than spending a ton of practice time getting good at dynamic EQ. Because like I said, dynamic EQ is a tool to fix one problem, whereas regular EQ is a tool to fix a host of problems and enhance the mix, balance the mix, balance your tones, the stuff we've been talking about this entire time. So before we got into it, I just wanted to make sure that that was all on the table. As far as how to use this specifically, all you have to do is go into one of your bands and we'll go with this band because this band isn't hit quite as often in this particular vocal. And you can see, you know, I have turned on this threshold, which has basically turned it into a little mini compressor and there's a ratio as well that you can see. And the ratio, you know, it totally depends on how aggressive you want that particular band to be. If you just want like a little bit of compression, then just a little bit of ratio is, is enough. I mean, it, again, it's the same rules as a compressor. If you are really wanting to make sure you're squashing just the stuff that goes right above the threshold, like basically if you're wanting to limit that particular band, you know, then you might want a higher ratio. Like all of these, I think I have set to infinity, which has made it essentially a limiter instead of a compressor. But all I've done, and I'm actually going to go over here and turn all this stuff off so you can just focus on this one, is I have, I had the threshold set all the way up. And as I was listening through, uh, I just turned the threshold down slowly until the notes that were really offending my ears were getting clipped off. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. Turn my body and a go. And if you remember correctly, it was especially at the beginning, it was very, very obvious at this particular band. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. 
Turn my body into gold and shape it into chains and rings. You see how only on a few notes uh, it's getting triggered. Now, there's a few things that you can do at this point. You can either turn the gain up if you're just trying to create a consistent tonality and maybe you're trying to enhance the performance a little bit. Then one thing that I like to do is turn the gain up to where the loudest notes that are triggering this are going back down to zero. So that's effectively leveling out that particular part of the frequency spectrum. So let me show you what that looks like. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out exactly like this. number nine, Dam and Judy. See how the, how the loudest parts, I guess with the exception of that last bit, the loudest parts are just falling right back down to zero. Now that's a trick that you see used a lot of times with multiband compression and bass guitars or bass synths. You know, if they have a very inconsistent low end, a lot of times you'll see people grab a multiband compressor, compress the low end quite a bit, and then turn it up so that the loudest parts are getting compressed all the way down and the quiet parts are getting turned up because that's the issue is that there are certain parts that are too quiet. But for this particular vocal, the problem isn't that certain parts are too quiet. The problem is that certain parts are too loud. So we are wanting, rather than to turn the gain up, we're wanting to make sure that the gain stays at zero. And basically the problem bits are turned down rather than just being set back at where they were originally. Finally, the last things you wanna do, you know, you wanna make sure you're setting your cue just like you would on a regular EQ. Uh, you just wanna make sure that the width, you know, just hits the area that you're looking for. Usually, unless I'm trying to fix like a, a resonance issue problem that pops up only just from time to time, I keep it fairly wide. And then also you wanna set your attack and release just like you would in an actual compressor. I usually like to have a bit of a faster attack and a bit of a faster release. I'm not trying to slowly grab stuff. Like if I'm problem solving, I'm wanting to grab it pretty much immediately. One of the great ways to find where you actually need to cut or enhance in these kinds of things is actually to solo out the band that you're working on. So if I was trying to figure out like, oh, you know, I needed this to be set at 420 hertz, uh, I could just solo this band out. Uh, you make my tombs and as I move it around, you can hear it changes. So I would just be moving it around until I found the part that to my ears, I was like, yeah, that's the part that was really, really sounding inconsistent. And for this particular vocal, it was 420. Uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. Uh, and now let's go ahead and turn on everything else and we'll listen again. Uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. Turn my body into gold and shape it into chains and rings. You know, one quick just cool thing to talk about. You might have learned about de at a certain point. Those are the things that catch the S sounds of uh, vocalists so that they're a little bit more controlled. They're not quite as aggressive in your music. That is essentially a dynamic EQ or a uh, multiband compressor, depending on how you're looking at it. Right here, I'm not using this as a de -esser. There are actually frequencies on the top end that I want to control, but you can actually see it's doing the job of a de -esser. Every time an S happens, this is getting turned down pretty dramatically. Ah, uh, you make my tombstone out of number nine diamond jewelry. Especially if I did this. Turn my body into gold and shape it See the like, sh shape it got taken down. I would personally rather use a de -esser than a dynamic EQ or a multiband compressor, just because they're programmed to actually handle that kind of stuff, whereas... I mean, you can fake it with this because it's essentially the same thing, but it's not quite as specifically made for S sounds and plosives and stuff like that, but still a really cool thing. So that's all you need to know to use a dynamic EQ. It's honestly not that difficult to use one. It is a little bit difficult to use it right. It just takes practice. You know, you got to get used to it in the same way that you have to get used to every other tool in mixing. But again, I do just want to put it out into the ether you know that this is not something you want to be using on every mix. You don't want to be using it on every single instrument. This is just something that you want to use every so often when that problem comes along, when a tone is really, really 
inconsistent. So hopefully when that day comes, you'll be able to look back on this and use this really, really cool tool to solve that particular problem. And really quickly before I go, I will say, so the Nova Dynamic EQ, the one that I'm using right now, it is free. It's a free tool. If you just give this particular, uh, this particular plugin a Google, it'll pop right up. If you're wanting to get some experience with Dynamic EQ before you actually take the plunge and purchase one, I would definitely recommend starting out with Nova. So hopefully all that helps. So now I wanna to talk to you about Smart EQs. Now, what a Smart EQ is, is basically a plugin that, you know, it reads the incoming frequency content of your particular track and, you know, it balances it for you. It automatically adds and takes away gain at certain parts of the frequency spectrum to do something. Now, as to what that something is, that's a whole different conversation. Smart EQs are pretty new onto the scene. They've only been around for sort of three to five years. And every single one of the plugins are different. Like they're trying to accomplish different things. They're based on different technologies. You know, some of them are based on songs, like other songs, maybe reference mixes that you input. And then you can put them onto your track and try to kind of match the EQ of your track to that track. You know, some of them are based on pink noise, which is similar to white noise, where basically all of the frequencies in a particular part of the frequency spectrum have uh, even loudness. So trying to rebalance an instrument based on that. Some of them are based on industry trends. So saying, oh, like, oh, I want to put this on my hip hop mix. And I want to make it sound closer to what a hip hop mix in 20 whatever sounds like. And some of them are based on just total rocket science, you know, secret sauce that we audio engineers aren't really aware of what they do and how they work. I want to focus on just one today as I show you how to use them. And that is Gulf Foss by Sound Theory. As we've talked about before, I'm not very big on you going out and blowing lots of money on shiny toys before you're good at using the tools that you have. Gulf Foss is maybe one exception to the rule. I don't I wouldn't go out and buy it right now based on, you know, uh, just this one recommendation, but it is definitely one of the best sounding plugins I've used in a while. And it actually was one of the ones that changed my minds on, or rather changed my attitude on how I thought about smart EQs. So Gulf Oz can do a few different things and it's fairly simple. And I think it's a pretty good even keeled example of how to use different kinds of smart EQs. And it's honestly fairly simple. So the first thing that a smart EQ can do is just balance the tone of an instrument. Simple as that. So right now I have an acoustic guitar that we'll start off with and I'll bypass this. And you'll just hear it's fine sounding. It's a little, maybe a little warm. So it's kind of boomy, right? It's, it's pretty out of whack. So I can go in here to my smart EQ a Gulf Foss has two main things that you can mess with to get the sound that you're looking for. So recover and tame. Recover essentially brings out some of the quiet stuff. It's, it's almost like the boost in this particular EQ, whereas tame is taming some of the stuff that's just really out of whack. This is almost like the cut if you're thinking about a regular EQ. And then there are some other things, but we will get to those in a second. Let me just show you what this is going to sound like. So one more time, here's before. And I'll just start messing with stuff. Pretty crazy, right? So here's before. So a lot boomier, a lot warmer. Here's after. Pretty impressive, right? You can see there's pretty much a boost across almost everything except for the low mids because there was so much low mid energy in that particular guitar. You could also see there was lots of little pockets. I'll play it again. So as uh, as the smart EQ was finding certain you know resonant frequencies, things that were really sticking out too much, it was actually turning them down as it was turning everything else 
up. So like I said before, it was recovering some of the stuff that was getting masked, but it was also taming some of the stuff that was masking doing a little bit of both. As for some of these other things, uh, they do give you a little bit more control. Some of them are a little bit more specific to Gulfos. Like for instance, Gulfos has this bias control, which allows the algorithm that sits inside of Gulfos to focus more on recover or more on tame because it's not always gonna be right. It's a computer. It doesn't really understand the ins and outs of your instrument as much as you might. It also has a really nice brighten function, which can basically tell Gulfoss, like, hey, I want you to focus more on the top end and maybe give it a little bit more oomph up there. Or you can actually go into the negatives and do the opposite, make it a little bit darker. And then finally, there's a little bit of a boost section, and that is mostly working on boosting the loudness, not necessarily the volume. More specifically, it's giving it like a smile curve. It's giving it a lot more low end and a lot more top end. So let's look at this example through an electric guitar. And I'll start this over. So let's listen to what this sounds like with nothing on it. It's fine, again, maybe a little too warm. Let's start messing with it. So now here's a great example. It's used to looking at the entire frequency spectrum and it's boosting a lot in the lower mids or excuse me, it's boosting a lot in the lows and like the bass and the sub bass stuff that, you know, there's just noise down there. There's nothing being uh, made down there by the electric guitar specifically. So I don't want it to mess with that. So all I have to do, grab this line right here and push it up and tell Golfoss, hey, I just don't really want you to mess with any of this. So now let's check out this electric guitar and let's see what it sounds like before we do any processing on it first. <laughs> Okay, just a little boomy, maybe a little harsh. So let's try messing with it now. So it definitely sounds a lot better. First thing I can see though, is it's boosting a lot in the very bottom and at the very top. And the electric guitar doesn't make any frequencies up there or down there. You know, it's primarily a mid-range instrument. So all I'm gonna wanna do is grab these little red bars and most uh, smart EQs have these as well. And just say like, hey, I don't really want you to process anything below, what is this, 152 or above, you know, seven kilohertz. So now let's see what it sounds like. <laughs> Making it a little bit too bright for my taste. So I'm gonna take it down a little bit. Sounds pretty good. So let's do before. A lot boomier, right? And here's after. Quite a bit more balanced. So it also does a great job of balancing an entire mix. So let me bring this one up here. And for, for the Gulfoss, this is actually where it all started. It was actually made specifically as a mastering tool to help to balance entire mixed tones. But eventually they figured out a way to make it work for just uh, one specific instrument. And a lot of smart EQs uh, could do that as well. So here's what it sounds like before. I wanted some summer, some summer okay, and now let's mess with it. I like the brightness. I like the fact that the drums really pop out. Let's hear it before. See how it just gets a lot darker without it? A really, really great tool to use on your mix, especially great if you're mixing through it. So now that we've looked at ways to use a smart EQ just on balancing tone, let's look at a few utility uses for them. And I actually love using this for these two specific problems. 
So the first of which is finding and fixing resonant frequencies. So I'm going to reset real quick. And this is actually a bit of a different technique, but you can uh, you can do this with any different smart EQ. Now let's listen to the original. Now you can kind of hear just like that that like doo -doo 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 that's going through. Let's just say I was really struggling finding that very specific note. Like I had gotten out my EQ, I was doing my sweep EQ around trying to find it, and I just couldn't get a hold of it. Well, one nice thing about Gullfoss is I can actually use this as almost like a magnifying glass to find that one specific frequency and then go back into my EQ and turn it down. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to turn Tame up by 200%, so all the way. Now, you see how this one note and this note or like no matter what, they are getting turned down. Odds are very high that one of those two places is where my resonant frequency is. So all I have to do is on Gullfoss, you can actually just click down and see where the frequency is that you're trying to target. So I'm just gonna hit play. So I'm gonna go right here. And it looks like it's at uh, about 500, 498. So I'm just gonna go over here, grab an EQ and I'm gonna make a little boost or about around 500 and see if Gullfoss was correct. Yep, listen to that, perfect. Let me turn that off. So now all I have to do, really laser focus in on it. There we go, and just turn it down. Not bad, right? So now, quick before and after. Here's before. Here's after. Totally cleaned up. And the cool thing about this as well is now that that's gone so easily, I can already hear a few other resonances that were maybe a little bit less obvious that I might want to tackle. And I'm not gonna do that because we have covered that in other videos. But like I said, this is a great way of finding those pesky resonances that you just, for whatever reason, can't seem to get a hold of. Then finally, there is one other specific use case that I really love using a smart EQ for, and that's fixing phase. Now, I would personally rather fix phase by either using a polarity flip or going in and manually moving around my waveforms to try to line them up or using a smart phase aligner like auto align for instance but that's all for another video we don't need to focus on that Goldfoss does a good job of phase correcting stuff where you know either you just don't have time to do that or maybe you've already bounced your stereo track down and you're stuck with a really phasey track so Let's listen to what this sounds like before, and then I will start adding some tame and recover, and you'll really start to hear the difference. Okay, now let's start messing with it a little bit. Now I'm gonna make sure that this stuff isn't getting messed with because those aren't frequencies that exist for the electric guitar. See how much more in phase that sounds? So I'm gonna hit bypass. See what it sounds like before. And now you can see what it sounds like after. It's pretty amazing, right? So that's definitely a specific problem that you can cover with a smart EQ like Gullfoss. So, Hopefully, if you end up deciding to invest in a smart EQ like that, hopefully this video will help you to actually get the most out of it rather than just kind of being like, ooh, look, a shiny new toy. And again, I do want to say, you know, I actually would recommend this more than I might recommend other EQ tools like, you know, like a dynamic EQ. But at the same time, it's still something that I would only get after you have really focused on learning how to do EQ yourself with an actual EQ and then use this 
to maybe balance stuff out that you're really struggling with, or maybe even just to lay out an initial balance so that you can go in and make your own tweaks as you see fit. So hopefully that helps and I will see you in the next video. So let's talk about how to EQ your mixes low end. So usually for most rock, pop, folk mixes, they're gonna have two main low end instruments. So a kick and the bass, usually a bass guitar, um, sometimes it's synth, sometimes it's like an upright bass, stuff like that. But we are going to be sticking with just your standard kick and your standard bass for this lesson. So there is five steps to EQing your low end to pretty much be balanced with your entire EQ spectrum. So step one, we're going to be using some high pass filters. Now that might seem kind of counterproductive. Why would we want to filter out some of the low end if this is our low end instruments. And I totally understand why that would be confusing. So high pass filters, whenever they are down in the very bottom of the low end, really do help to bring out the frequencies that we actually want to focus on in our mix. Now, this isn't necessarily counting genres like hip hop, or EDM, stuff that have a lot of sub bass frequency. If that's the case, then you might wanna not have any kind of high pass filtering at all on your bass instruments. But usually for a standard kick and a standard bass, the stuff that exists below about, uh, you know, 30 to 40 Hertz, honestly is just muddying up the mix and it's eating some of your headroom. So it's making the volume louder, but it's not actually making it any louder in actuality. Like our ears aren't perceiving it as louder. So it's making it more difficult to make the overall song louder because it's going to trigger the limiter during mastering and maybe even the compressor on your mix bus quite a bit harder. So I really like to just listen and take some of that out. And the way that I do that, I'll solo out the instrument and I will just do a little sweep until it starts to lose some of the girth of the low end. And then I'll back off a little bit and leave it there. So that's obviously lost a lot right there. So I feel like around here is where it feels best. You know, I. I'm kind of cleaning up some of that low end, the lowest of the low end, but I'm not losing that much of the energy. Now let me do the same thing on the bass. Yeah, you don't want to get too close to where the actual note is. So I'd say that's pretty good. And we actually cut a little bit more than uh, I had originally said. So, you know, originally I had said, you know, maybe 30 to 40 with the bass. We were actually able to cut all the way up to 50, which is great because, again, that gets rid of some of that sub energy that really is not adding anything to this mix. And so we are going to be able to turn the bass up louder without pushing the compressors quite as bad, which is fantastic. So the next thing we're going to do is use pocket EQ in between both of our bass instruments. Now, what pocket EQ does is it allows them to mesh better together in the frequency spectrum. So it keeps them from both trying to fight an elbow for space in the exact same part of the frequency spectrum being, you know, the bass section. The bass section is pretty well known for struggling for space. Instruments that live down there really tend to fight even more than the rest of the instruments in the mix. So we really want to make sure that we are doing everything we can to create the best sound possible for them. So what Pocket EQ is, is it's basically making two complementary EQ cuts and boosts, and then doing the exact opposite on the other instrument. So for instance, 
Let's look at the kick. So the fundamental of the kick looks like it's kind of around here. So about, uh, you know, 70 hertz. So I'm gonna make just a little boost right here. Let's just say a three decibel boost. Now let's go look at the bass. So the bass, it's more living kind of between, looks like between 90 hertz and 200 hertz, kind of right here. So I'm gonna make a little boost right there. Okay. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna decrease the cue of both of these just a little bit because I want to target just this particular range. I'm not trying to get a whole lot. So now what we're gonna do is we are going to cut in the areas that we just boosted in. So for the bass, you can see we boosted it about, I'll move it up just for ease, about 150 hertz. So we're gonna go over here, make a new bell. We're gonna go to about 150 hertz. We're gonna increase the cue a little bit and we are gonna cut it by three dB. So the exact same amount that we boosted over here. Then on the bass, we're gonna do the exact opposite again. So on the kick, we boosted around 70 hertz. So I'm gonna go over to 70. I'm gonna increase the cue just a little bit and I'm gonna take it down by about three decibels. And let's listen to a quick before and after. Here is before. And here's after. You hear how it feels almost like both of the instruments got a little bit louder and just a little bit more present. That's because they're not fighting quite as much with each other as they were. So that's all pocket EQ is. And it's actually something that you can do in a lot of different instruments, especially if you have instruments that are fighting for room in the same range of the frequency spectrum. So for instance, if I have two guitar parts that are both kind of living, maybe around 250 to 400, I can do this exact technique, but for those two guitar parts, just to get them to mesh a little bit better. Now for where you are actually placing the frequencies exactly, again, that's gonna depend on your particular instruments. Don't say, oh, I just gotta do it at 70 and 150 because that's what Dylan did. It's gonna be entirely dependent on where your bass lives and where your kick lives. If they live kind of in the same region, and that does happen sometimes, then just pick which one would you like to inhabit more of the sub range and which would you like to inhabit more of the bass range. And whichever one you pick, boost. Whichever one you don't pick, boost in the other one. So now let's look at cutting some problem areas. So I'm gonna go over to the kick. A very common problem area in kick drums is somewhere around 250 and 600 hertz. That sort of low mids, mids area, for whatever reason, tends to sound pretty boxy in some kick drums. Not every kick drum, of course, I'm not saying just to cut it just because, but it's definitely something to check and at least make sure that you're good with. So I'm gonna solo this out and listen and we'll see what it sounds like. We're gonna do a little sweep EQ. Yeah, that sounds kind of weird to me right there. I'm gonna be a little bit more aggressive just so you can hear the difference. You hear how whenever I cut that, it actually makes the kick drum feel fuller and bassier. It's because there aren't frequencies like this in the middle that are muddying up the overall sound. So here's before. Here's before. And here's after. Now, as always, we wanna make sure that we're gain staging. And this is sort of the first moment where gain staging is gonna to start to be important. Let's do before. So it looks like it's sitting around zero. Let's do after. So it looks like it's sitting around one. So we've actually added a decibel of gain. Cool. Mm, 
we might actually want to add 1.5 instead. Oh, excuse me, negative 1.5. Yeah, that sounds a lot better to me. Great. So now let's check out the bass. Bass guitars are a little bit more variable when it comes to problem areas. That's because every bass guitar is different and there's a lot of different variables that go into it. You know, obviously there's the guitar, there is the bass amp, there's whether or not you used a direct in input or not. There is the microphone you used and where you placed it, there's the room that it's in. And I'm not saying that all of those things aren't also there with a kick, it's just that kicks tend to be just a little bit more consistent with where their problems are. Not every kick has a problem there, some kicks have problems somewhere else, but for the bass, it's a lot more just sweeping around and listening with your ears. So I will say, oftentimes I tend to kind of find some problems, you know, kind of in the 250 to, 800 range. Sometimes there's some honkiness up there. Sometimes there is some string sounds up in the upper mids that sound maybe a bit too aggressive. So let's see what this particular instrument has. Okay. I'm kind of hearing something around here, maybe. Maybe some honkiness. Yeah, that kind of sounds gross to me right there. That's about 270, 290. Let's see if there's anything else. Yeah, you hear that? That wah 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 sound? That's that honkiness I'm talking about. I don't really want that, so I'm going to cut that as well. Okay, let's do some gain staging. So here is before. So kind of five to three. And here's after. So it's actually a little bit more erratic. That's interesting. This is part of the reason we oftentimes do a lot more of our problem solving cutting before we actually do compression is because sometimes it makes notes in the low end a little bit less consistent, which is why you can see the range is kind of going more up and down. I think it's probably adding about a decibel. Let's check again. All right, let's mute it. Okay, that sounds pretty good to me. So now that we've gone about cutting the problem areas, let's actually go and enhance the sound of the instruments a little bit. So one of the best ways to get your low end instruments to stand out in your mix is actually not by boosting more of the bass frequencies, it's by boosting some of the mids and the upper mids. Those are the frequencies that usually allow the human ear to perceive a sound as more present, as more forward, Basically, we're just more attuned to hearing that part of the frequency spectrum. So I'm going to go in and maybe do a little bit of boosting there. And I always want to sweep around, find the spot that sounds best to me. I like this area. I'm actually gonna give it a little bit of a wider boost. Okay, now let's do a little bit of gain staging. So before, okay, kind of sitting around zero and after. Uh, so it might have lost just a little bit, so I'll take it just to negative 
one decibels. So here's before. That sounds better to me. Okay, let's do the same thing for our bass. sounds pretty good to me. Again, I'm going to make it more obvious. Partially because this is a very bassy bass and I actually think I'm going to have to get a pretty uh, a pretty bold boost to make sure that it sticks through. Okay, let's do some gain staging. So here's before. Okay, so 4 to 3 or 5 to 3. Here's after. Yeah, so I think it's actually, we've lost a bit of gain, so I'm going to turn it up just a bit. Yeah, that looks better to me. So let's listen. Here's before. Here's after. And I think I actually want to add another boost. And I know this might seem really, really aggressive to put two boosts so close. But this is definitely a bass that needs a lot more of the upper mids because it's so bassy, it's hard to hear the articulation of each individual note. I might move this over a bit. Okay, that's sounding better to me. So let's listen to these together. Okay, I will bypass them. Hear how both of them just got a lot muddier. Both of them started fighting. So this sounds pretty good together. Now, usually we would be mixing these instruments in context of the mix, because obviously we want to make sure that it sounds good with everything else. And I'm also bypassing a lot of the chef method that we already learned about, simply because this is kind of some stuff that's more specific to this instrument rather than kind of the general EQ method that we've been learning. So this said, we want to make sure that this sounds good with everything. So I am going to grab this. I'm going to take it down. I'm actually going to turn off the automation that's already on it. And we're going to listen to the song and mix it in because step five is to tweak and check your volume balance. Because a lot of times, whenever the low end just isn't fitting or it feels like it's too much or too little, it's not an EQ problem it's a volume problem. It's either just too loud or too quiet. So let's try this and see what we can make out of it. So first the kick. Then the bass. That sounds pretty good to me. So let me take them out. Put them back in. Good stuff. So one thing that I'm already hearing like, mm, this isn't really fitting for me. I actually think that the bass is too bassy. I want a lot more of the mids and the upper mids. And I just think the bass frequencies are really covering that up. 
Now, this does not mean that I want less bass in the song, but I'm going to be doing some gain staging. So after I do a lot of cutting in the bass, after I turn the volume up, really what's going to happen is the bass is going to stay the same and the volume of everything above the bass is going to increase. So let's grab our VU meter again and I am going to turn the volume of the bass up just so we can hear it better and sweep around, maybe make a bit of a cut. Okay, so I just made a big cut. What was that? Seven decibels? Very aggressive cut on a bass instrument. It doesn't make any sense. But let's go in and do our gain staging and you'll see why I'm doing it. Okay, so look, we lost seven decibels of gain. Somewhere between seven and five. Quite a bit. And all that means is we're just turning all this stuff up by that much. Hear the difference? So now I'm gonna mix it in again. And this time you'll actually be able to hear the bass guitar much, much more before you start to hear the bass frequencies. So listen how whenever I mute the uh, the cut in the low end, that nothing really happens. I mean, it's just like you lose a little bit of the bass, but you don't lose any of the girth of the song. That's what's important. Even though I made a really, really big cut, all I was doing was rebalancing the tone so that you could hear it better in the mix, not trying to get rid of low end. And sometimes you do just want to get rid of low end. I'm not saying that that can't happen, but for something like this, where it was just so bassy that nothing else in the frequency spectrum was really coming out of this instrument, this was really, really helpful. And in fact, I'm actually going to do it even more so that you can hear more actively in the mix what I'm talking about. So let me really quickly do better gain staging. So look at that, took out 14 decibels of, of this. I am gonna actually add this just to get rid of some of this noise in the top end that's getting turned up. Uh, I think I actually turned that up too far, my mistake. It's crazy how that's the same volume. It sounds like a completely different bass guitar. It makes the mix a little bit more colorful. It helps the bass to stand out just a little bit. It helps to balance the tone overall. So it's important to realize this. The solution is not always just crank the bass. The solution is not always all bass instruments need a boost in the bass parts. I mean, neither of these instruments did we do any actual tonal boosts. We did some boosting for our pocket EQ, but really that was it. We didn't go in do any shelves. We didn't go in and just really crank it. Honestly, we added more to the mids and the upper mids than we added to the bass because we want them to be able to stick out in the mix without losing any of that low end. So these are the five steps to mixing low end. 
if you're able to work this in into your workflow in a way where it matches your own instruments and in a way where it fits your workflow well, this is really going to help the intelligibility of, this, of your song. It's going to help the foundation of your song. It's going to help the translatability of your song. And it's also just going to help the groove. It's just going to make it feel really good. So let's talk about EQing drums. Now, the drum set is the foundation of the entire song. That, along with the bass, is basically what creates the rhythm, the groove, and the drive of your entire mix. So making sure that you have a clean drum sound is really, really important. Now, it's important to talk about first that drums are particularly sensitive to the rooms that they're being recorded in. And that makes total sense. You know, there's lots of microphones you're using that are a few feet above the entire kit, or maybe even several feet in the back of the room, capturing the entire sound. And that means you're getting a lot more of the sound of the room. Basically, how well you record your drums is dramatically going to affect the tone of your drums. So keep that in mind. Uh, as far as EQing goes, we definitely can do a lot to fix drum sets, but I would put more effort into getting the best drum sound that you can than putting more effort into doing tons of EQing. But that said, let's go into some of the things that we can do to create a drum sound for an entire kit that works well in a mix and creates the foundation and the groove that you're looking for. So let's look into this. So we've already gone over how to EQ a kick drum. So we're not really gonna cover that in this video, but I do wanna show you a before and after. So I'm actually gonna start with after because that makes it a little bit easier for you to hear exactly what we're gonna learn how to do in this. So this is the drum set with all of the EQs that we're gonna be using already on it. So sounds pretty good, right? You know, it definitely needs some compression, needs maybe a little bit of saturation, but for EQ, it sounds pretty clean. So let's compare that to what it originally sounded like. And I'm actually gonna start with them on so that you can cycle straight into the unprocessed sound. So here's after, and here's before. So after. So you hear how much cleaner that is? It's really amazing what the right EQ moves can do to help out your drum set. So we're gonna be going drum by drum and talking about some of the most common problem areas in each drum, as well as some of the most common places where you might want to enhance the sound of the drum. So let's start with the snare. Let's listen to a before and after. So here's before. And here's after. So this one's a little bit more subtle than some of the other ones are. You can hear that one of the biggest things that happens whenever I turn it on is a lot of the boxiness goes away. Kind of just like that sort of sound gets a little bit more managed. So let's talk about some of the things that you want to check whenever you're mixing your snare. So first of all, during the cleaning stage of your mix, you wanna make sure that you're checking for any kind of ring in the snare. And you might be able to fix that with surgical EQ or potentially dynamic EQ if it's something that only pops up from time to time. Now this particular snare didn't actually have any ring to it. So there wasn't anything that we needed to cut out dramatically. We didn't need to necessarily find one frequency, cut it out and make it as narrow as possible. It just wasn't a thing that we had to do. Let me turn this off. But we did have to do just a little bit of rebalancing just to get a better crack in a cleaner snare. So one thing that you want to check on your snares is kind of 250 to 600 hertz. Snares are very notorious for having a lot of boxiness in their sound. 
Drums in general are notorious for having sort of that boxy sound. And this is the thing that we cut right here. So let me show you what this originally sounded like. I'll actually turn it up so you can hear the sound. So you hear that sound? Just that whoa, whoa, whoa kind of sound. So I wanted to just cut that out. It wasn't really adding anything at all. Now you don't want to get rid of too much of it because a lot of times a lot of the crack of the snare lives in this area as well. So sometimes it can get a little bit less punchy and that's not really what you want either. So it's a balancing act. Just, you know, turn it up and down and see if it helps. Now, of course, this is not going to be a problem with every snare. I'm saying this with basically every instrument in this entire module because it's just going to depend on what your snare needs, not what my snare needs. If it sounds off, this might be a good first place to start your search. So another problem with snares is they often get buried in the mix. It's kind of hard to hear the, the crack of that snare. So what you might want to do is make a boost or two in the upper mids or right at the top of the mids, because that's where the crack of the snare, it's where the presence of the snare really lives. So I'll show you what I'm boosting right here. You're just like that. And I'm being subtle with it. You don't need to be too aggressive. And this is more just for presence. This isn't necessarily going to get you a harder hitting snare, but it is going to get you a brighter snare. And a snare that potentially sticks out a little bit more in the mix, even if it's not hitting harder. Now, one other thing that you can keep in mind, if you have a snare that you do want more punch, and when I say punch and crack, they're not actually the same thing. Usually crack is sort of like the sound in a snare, whereas punch is more of like the hard boominess of the snare. The thing that really hits you in the gut. Usually that tends to live around the lower mids. So 150 to 300, 400 hertz, something like that. So let me show you what it sounds like right here. So you can feel not only is the volume, the overall volume getting quite a bit louder because we're boosting those lower mids, but also it literally sounds like if you were wearing a boxing glove and we're just punching your hand, just boom, boom. That kind of boominess is the punch that I'm talking about. So let's do another before and after because I definitely wanted to enhance the punch. I wanted to enhance the crack and the kind of the sizzle, the presence and get rid of some of this boxiness, this mud. And I do think it helped even though it was pretty subtle. So here's before, and here's after. So let's move on to the next step, which is the overheads. So the overheads are the two microphones that are above the kit that are capturing the general tone of the kit, but really more specifically, they're focusing on the cymbals. They're the main microphones for all of the symbols. So overheads and uh, subsequently your room mics, which we'll get to in a second, they are well known for causing a lot of problems with your drums. That's partially because they tend to be really harsh, especially if you are in maybe a smaller room that has very aggressive reverb in it, or maybe you have some cheaper symbols or you hit your symbols extra hard. You know, a lot of the harshness of the drum set is gonna be living in here. This is also the microphone that's going to be picking up the most room resonances along with your room mic. Again, it's because it's picking up so much of the room sound rather than just the direct sound of, say, the snare, where the snare microphone is right on the snare. So the first thing that we are going to want to do is check through and see if we can find any resonant frequencies. And as you can see, there actually are two that I found in here. So before we get started, I am going to turn this off so you can hear it before, and then I'll show you what it sounds like after. I'll turn this up a little bit so you can hear it. So this is before, and this is after. Before. 
and after. You hear how much more present everything became? It's almost like I took a blanket off of the sound. We're going to be going over the two parts of EQing your overheads. Obviously, like I said, the first part is finding your resonant frequencies, if there are any. There's not always resonant frequencies, but sometimes you're able to hear them pretty obviously. Now, I'm going to turn off both EQs because we need to make sure that we are hearing it in its raw form. So let's, let's listen to this, and I'm going to turn these off as well. So I'm definitely hearing kind of like a like a shh sound that just seems to be there just constantly, even like above the sound of the cymbals itself. And that's kind of a hard concept to describe when I say that a sound is above a sound, but it's almost like it's a sound that is not natural to the actual cymbal sound. It's something that's been added on after the fact, and that's our resonant frequencies. So the first one I found was around uh, around two kilohertz. But yeah, about right there. You kind of hear that right there. So I'm just gonna turn this back on. But you definitely can tell once I take that cut out, it's a lot more obvious how loud that was. So here's before. Here's after. Before. And after. So there was one other one that I was hearing, kind of just like that that I was talking about earlier. So I made a peek and started doing my sweep EQ. Kind of around there. Right about there. I'm going to get rid of this, turn the, my original one back on. So let me solo this. So as I turn this EQ off, I want you to listen and see if you can hear both of those frequencies. So both this one and this one. So here we go. So to me, this one right here was actually much more obvious. And once I cut this one, this second one popped out pretty aggressively. And like I've said in previous videos, that's pretty common. Sometimes when you cut one resonance frequency, it becomes more obvious that there's another one that's living in kind of that same area because one of them was masking the sound of the second one. So now that we've cleaned our resonance frequencies, let's go and do some actual EQing. So let's do a quick before and after. So here's before. And here's after. Before. And after. You can hear how all of a sudden the snare sounds so much more present. There's so much more crack in it. The cymbals seem to open up. And there's just not that constant low level noise that's happening throughout the entire track. So let's just go step by step. So the first thing that I did is I cut a pretty sizable chunk out of the bottom end of this entire microphone. And the reason I did that is because I want to make some space for the kick and the snare in this whole drum set. So I don't know if I necessarily would say that it makes this particular set of microphones sound better. I actually think it might make it sound worse, but in context of the entire mix, it helps the overall sound of the drum set. Depending on the genre that you're working with, that might not actually be true. Certain genres like jazz or folk or genres that require a more natural sound, 
you usually aren't going to be quite as aggressive with your low end cuts. But if you're doing something that's a little bit more poppy, maybe a little bit more polished, where you really want the kick and the snare to be very present in the mix and really ring out, then getting rid of that sound down here is really going to help your kick and your snare from getting masked throughout the entire course of the mix. So as far as how I did it, I basically just started down here. I gave it a pretty light slope, so usually kind of six or 12, nothing too aggressive, and just slowly moved it up until it sounded good to my ears, and then I backed off a little bit. So the next thing that I did is that I, I was really thinking that the cymbals just weren't bright enough. You know, they were really harsh, which we'll get to in a second, but there wasn't really the air that I was looking for, the openness that I was looking for. So I decided that I was going to do a boost up here in the top end. Now, a lot of people will use a shelf for this kind of thing. I actually really like using bell curves. See how gradual the slope is rather than just being a hard slope? I just think it makes it sound a lot more natural. I think it boosts some of the stuff up here that's kind of harder for people to hear anyway. So I definitely would recommend trying that technique out, seeing if you like it. If not, you could just stick with uh, you know, your standard shelf boost like you would usually see on your drums and your acoustic guitars, your vocals, stuff like that. But let me show you what that sounded like before. So just like this. And I'm gonna use my cue as basically a width control for how many frequencies I want to become brighter. But I'm always gonna have it kind of around two kilohertz or 20 kilohertz. Yeah, something kind of like that. So after I did that, I definitely had the thought, man, you know, this seems still really harsh to me. And let me take this out so you can hear what I'm talking about. You know, I was listening to it and I was just like, you know, it's, it's opened up, but there's still a lot of harshness. And that's very common in overheads. We'd already talked about that, how just because it's so close to the cymbals and the cymbals are usually the harshest part of the drums, sometimes they can just get a little ornery. So you want to search around, kind of around one kilohertz to eight kilohertz, somewhere in the upper mids. Find the spot that feels the worst to your ears and then cut that. How much you cut fully depends on your particular sound. I was pretty aggressive with the cut. You know, I got up to, what was that, eight decibels. But a lot of times I only need to do two decibels or three decibels. I'm being very bold with a lot of these cuts and boosts, but that's only because this particular set needs them. Not because that's just what I'm going to be doing no matter what. I actually would rather be subtle than bold unless I have a reason to be bold. But let me show you exactly what I did to find this. So right there, this is kind of the moment where I was like, oh, that's, yeah, that hurts. So then I came in there, found the area I wanted to cut, and then made the cue just a little bit smaller. And it's very obvious. I'm gonna take it out. So that was sounding a lot better. There was only one thing left for me to do, and that was that I was hearing a lot of boxiness in this particular set of microphones. And, you know, I've been a broken record this entire time, but boxiness is a problem in a lot of drum sets, especially if the drum set was recorded in a poorly tuned room or a really small room. For whatever reason, drums just love to make too many frequencies in this kind of area around 250 to 600 Hertz. So I decided I was gonna sweep around, see if I could find it. And right there, that kind of sound. So I decided to cut that. And I 
cleans it up a lot. So here's before. Here's after. And that's all I did. You know, honestly, not terribly complicated other than having to take the time to find the resonant frequencies. All I did was, you know, add a little bit of presence boost up here at the very top, cut some of the harshness, cut some of the boxiness and make some space for the low end and for the snare. So let's do a quick before and after. So here's before. And here's after. It's amazing how much farther forward it comes. So let's talk about room mics next. The process with room mics is honestly pretty similar to the process with overheads. They're both microphones that are kind of picking up the general sound of the entire set. They're both microphones that are picking up a lot of cymbal noise. Rooms though, I will say, they tend to be even harsher than your overheads. And that only gets worse after you start using some compression on them. And a lot of times engineers and producers put a ton of compression on room mics because it's got like a really vibey sound that a lot of them really like. So you wanna make sure that you are taking care of that before you ever send this stuff off to get compressed. So let's do a quick before and after. So here's before. Okay, and here's after. So same thing as the overheads. All of a sudden, there's a lot more present. Feels like a blanket's been taken off of it. Doesn't have that like high end kind of sound. The snare is a lot louder, which is awesome because that gives some crack to the snare. So let's look at what we did. I had two resonance frequencies that I wanted to cut. And I actually made the cues a little bit wider because really this area in general was just too much. It was, it was like everywhere I moved, my sweep EQ just sounded awful. So I, f I actually found the two worst offending frequencies to my ears. And then rather than just cutting those two, I made those two sort of like the center of almost like a, a dual peak filter. Cut those two and then made, made them just a little bit wider. And you can see as I narrow it, fewer and fewer of these frequencies that are in between are getting cut. And as I widen it, they're getting cut deeper and deeper. So you can almost use this as a volume knob of its own. Let's do a quick before and after. So here's before. And here's after. So it definitely gets rid of that like kind of sound. Hear that sound right there. And that sound. So when you're looking for resonant frequencies in your room microphones, definitely be aware of the low mids and the upper mids. That's where they tend to live if there are any. Now let's look at the actual EQ. Let's do a quick before and after, and then I'll talk about why I made the moves I made. So here's before. And here's after. Same thing with the overheads. You know, I wanted to create some space for the overall mix with this particular cut. You know, I wanted the kick to have some space to live. I wanted the snare to have some space to breathe. So I cut a pretty good amount out of this. Again, that is kind of dependent on genre. And then after that, I went about dealing with some of the boxiness. So let me disable all of this and I'll show you exactly what I did. It's kind of the same process as the overheads. Peak filter, sweep around. <laughs> really obvious in this, right? Honestly, I could probably cut that too if I wanted. Just that sound. I wanted to cut that. I'll bring this back in. And one thing that I'll show you that's really interesting, I actually was pretty aggressive with the cut at first, but I want you to see how hollow it starts to feel whenever I get deeper and deeper in the cut. You know, it just sounds like, like almost like your ears are uncomfortable. Like the equilibrium of the kit is gone. It's 
part of the reason why you want to be careful with the cuts that you make in the mids, because the mids, you know, it's really where the balance, the overall balance of your sound lives. And if you get rid of too many mids, it really can start to sound hollow. So after that, you know, this is just such an aggressive room microphone. So I really wanted to make sure that I was handling it. So first of all, I went over here and turned this on. I'll solo that for you. This is actually around the same area that we made cuts for the resonant frequencies. It just didn't do enough for me. I needed to make even more of a cut. And again, uh, making cuts up here in the upper mids for these kinds of drums, very common. And then I also felt like it was a little bit too present, a little bit too bright up here on the top end. So I wanted to make a cut up here as well. You can hear how that gets rid of just something like that sound. That's especially bad with the hi-hats. And then finally, I kind of just wanted a general cut right here just to sort of handle a lot of the upper mids. You can see it's very wide. I actually might even make it wider just to sort of turn the general level down. So before and after, here's before. Here's after. So still really harsh for sure. But honestly, I still want the harshness. I don't want to just get rid of all of the harshness of the rooms because the room is my vibe microphone. It's my tone microphone. It's the microphone that I kind of just want to mix in ever so quietly just to get some cool sound. So let's do one more before and after. So here's before. Here's after. definitely rebalanced. So finally, let's look at the toms. Now I'm actually going to go to a different part of the song for the toms because there's not any toms in that particular spot. So let's listen to this. So even though toms are pretty different drums than snares are, they actually have a pretty similar EQ structure, a pretty similar response as far as the frequency spectrum goes. Kind of the same thing if the toms aren't sticking out enough, you might want to boost some of the upper mids or even maybe some of the top end or right at the very top of the mids. And if you want a little bit more punch, just like the snare, you might want to boost some of the low mids because that's where the punch usually lives. They also have a penchant for having some muddiness, having some boxiness, just like we've talked about with all these drums. Uh, and then finally, sometimes there could just be a little bit too much attack in them, a little bit too much crack, maybe too much drum skin sound, I might say. So that usually lives up towards the uh, upper mids of the drum. So you can see this one in particular, I wanted a little bit more crack, a little bit less muddiness, a little bit less boxiness. And I wanted a little bit less of that drum skin sound as well. So let's listen to before and after. I'll turn it up a little bit so you can hear it. So here's before. Okay, and here's after. You know, I did make it darker, but I think that actually gave it a little bit more of an air of mystery, if that makes sense. You know, emotionally, I feel just like a little bit more aggression from it rather than sort of bright bubble gumminess. Even though, you know, overall, it's pretty subtle. It's three decibels boost here, four decibel cut here, four decibel cut here. The same thing that I did with all the other drums I did here as well. You know, first thing I wanted to figure out is I wanted to find where the muddiness, where the boxiness was living. So grabbed a peak and started moving. To me, it was kind of right here that was just sounding a little bit too bloopy. You can already hear how much that cleans it up. So after that, I wanted to get rid of some of that drum skin attack sound. Kind of right around here. 
It's a very cool sound. It's just maybe a little bit too aggressive in this particular drum. So I think that does a really, really good job of kind of pushing the toms a little bit farther back in the mix. I'm actually gonna solo this so you can hear it a little bit better. And then finally, I wanted a little bit more presence, a little bit more crack from the toms. So I made a peak and I started sweeping. And to me right here had the most crack. So let's listen to it in context. I'm gonna turn the gain off. So here's before. And here's after. So really subtle, but I do feel like it helps it to stick out a little bit more, gives a little bit more intrigue, a little bit more power behind it, just kind of generally cleans it up a little bit. So those are the main drums that you are gonna be EQing whenever you're doing drums like this. And I wanna show you just, just one more time what a good EQ can do for a drum set like this. So here's after, here's before, after. One of the biggest keys to getting professional drum sounds is meticulous EQing like we've been doing throughout this video. So hopefully this is going to help you to create a great foundation for your mix. So let's talk about EQing guitars. Now, usually the words that tend to describe guitars that maybe are a little weak in their tone, they tend to be words like brittle, harsh, honky, muddy, or maybe they need some bite something like that. And I wanted to go in today and show you an example of each of these. Now, as far as tips and tricks for electric guitar specifically, there aren't really a ton of them. One of the main ones I do want to bring up, really the only one that I will tell you like, hey, it's, it's maybe worth experimenting with, is for electric guitar specifically, there's a lot going on in the uh, upper mids, and the high end, the high range, that this isn't really necessary to be there. Most electric guitar amps only really go from kind of between 100 and 150 hertz up to about 6 kilohertz. So everything above 6 kilohertz, sometimes it's honestly just adding noise. If it's a particularly dense mix, I would cut that out. It'll save you some headroom. But if it's a very loose mix, maybe it's just the guitar and a vocal and a bass or something like that, I wouldn't be quite as aggressive with your cuts because although there's a lot of noise up there, there is also some air, a little bit of presence, stuff that in a dense mix you wouldn't hear, but in a very loose mix you might. So literally all I'm talking about is creating something like this and just moving it down. I'll actually show you what I'm talking about, I'll disable this. Just moving it down until you start to lose some energy, then popping back up just a little bit. So it should be just like this. Do you hear how I've lost some energy? Now if I turn this off, we do that. There's not that much of an audible difference, but when tons of tracks are piled on top of each other, it's really gonna help your mix. If I have a looser mix, you know, maybe around here is fine. If I have a denser mix, I might be more okay with cutting into the tone a little bit just to save some of that noise. But I would be careful, once you start losing tone with the top end, you might start to get a more boring sounding electric guitar. So definitely listen in context of the mix, see what it's doing. If it's not hurting anything, it's fine. If it is, maybe back off a little bit. But let's talk about some of these common problems. 
So because electric guitars are so dramatically different in tone, depending on what kind of guitar you're using, what kind of amp you're using, what pedals you're using, there's a lot of variables. So there aren't really common spaces that are always harsh, always too much, always too little. It really fully depends on whatever gear that you're using. And then also whatever mic you're using, what room you're recording in, you know, the basics. But I want to go through and just show you some of these common problems. So one of the first common problems that you come across is what's known as a honky guitar. So it's a guitar that just sounds too, well, you know, the hard thing about these kinds of words is that honky is the best way to describe it. So it just sounds honky. So let me show you this guitar. This has a bit of a honky sound to me and I'll do a before and after. So here's before. just kind of like a wolf, 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 wolf kind of sound, almost like a, like a bit of a duck sound in it is the best way I can describe it. Now, if I turn this on and you can see I have a pretty sizable cut here, it's going to sound quite a bit clearer. So you can hear there's a lot more warmth in it because, you know, I did gain stage. So the low end got pulled up a little bit. There's a lot more aggression in it because this stuff got pulled up a little bit, but all of these low mids, uh, they weren't quite as necessary. So let's do a before and after again. So before, you can hear how muddy that is now. And after. And now it's just a lot easier to hear the definition of the guitar. So before. after. Now to find that problem, it's just your standard sweep EQ. You just grab a band, give it a little bit of a more narrow cue, sweep around until you find something that sticks out to you as the sound that you're hearing as you're sitting there thinking like, God, there's something wrong with this and then cut it. And however much you cut, it really just depends on, you know, after you've done your gain staging, does it sound like it's gone too far? Then back off a little bit. If it still sounds like it's there, you could be a, a bit more aggressive. So like this. It's like this sound to me was just too much. So I wanted to cut it. So let's look at another example. So this guitar is too harsh. And usually if a guitar or really any instrument is too harsh, if that's the word you're using to describe it, the problem is probably somewhere in the mids, the upper mids or the top range. So let's listen to before. So you can hear how that's just a very difficult part to listen to. Like it just actively hurts your ears. So what I did, so I went in and I made a cut around 2.5 kilohertz and it looks like I made another cut around 4.8 kilohertz and we'll do an after and then we'll talk about why I did that. Let's listen to the rest of it. So here's why I did this. So there, as I was sweeping through, it sounded like there were two particularly harsh parts to my ears, and then I decided to cut them. But sometimes one cut just isn't enough. So let's listen to this as I sweep through. Right there, oof. Listen to that. That hurts too. I honestly could have picked that as well. Either one of those would have worked. Now, as I was sweeping through, when I originally found this, I found another spot as well. You hear that? There's barely any note in it. It's almost just all sound. So I wanted to cut that as well.
Now, after I had done my gain staging, you know, what that effectively did is that brought the rest of this up. So it helped to balance the overall frequency spectrum because not only was this stuff turned down, but all of the other stuff was turned back up. So here's a before. Here's an after. And you could maybe make the argument that I was a bit too aggressive. I might agree with you on that one, but I do think it would fit better in the overall mix if I have a cut like this. And also, I just wanted you to hear exactly what a cut up here in the upper mids is going to sound like. One quick trick, two kilohertz is actually known as the pain frequency. So around that area is where our ears are particularly attuned to. And so sometimes, you know, when we hear that, it sounds really exciting but it's also the frequency that tires our ears out the most. So if something sounds really harsh, that's usually the first place I look. It's kind of one kilohertz to three kilohertz, somewhere in there. And if it's not there, then usually it tends to be somewhere a little bit farther up, maybe five or six or seven, something like that. So now let's listen to what a brittle guitar sounds like and how we can fix that. So here's what it sounded like before. Now this is a bit of a special case because it does have some warmth to it. It's not so brittle that it sounds like I could snap it at any moment, but it does have that kind of just plinkiness that I really just didn't want, that like brittle plinkiness. So I ended up going up and cutting some of the upper mids going up into the high end. So in the electric guitar, this is where brittleness tends to live. So let's see what this sounds like now. Actually turn this up just a little bit. So before and after. It's a lot warmer now, which is really nice. That's a nice side effect of getting rid of brittleness is usually by getting rid of a brittle sound, you are creating a warm sound. So you can see I basically found something up here in the upper mids. I'm actually gonna hit play and I want you to look at the frequency analyzer because you can see it's pretty low. It's not particularly loud, but it was just some pick noise that was really causing that brittle sound. It's kind of right here. You see how low it is? I'll solo it. That's what it sounds like. We'll turn it up so you can hear better. So I'm not necessarily talking about this. That's more harsh. But it's that just fragile sound, like you could snap it if you just pressed hard enough on it. Now the issue with this, of course, is that you're losing some top end, so it doesn't sound quite as open as it did before. Now, if this guitar is by itself, that might be a little bit more noticeable, but if this guitar is mixed into tons of other guitars or instruments, I honestly doubt that that's really going to be heard in the mix. So I would rather just get rid of that brittleness. So I've got a two for one final example over here. So muddy, is a word that gets thrown around a lot in mixing. And then sometimes you also want to add some bite to a guitar, some aggression to a guitar. So this guitar is a great example of that. So let's listen to before what it sounds like. Super muddy, right? so muddy that it's almost hard to hear each individual articulation. It just hurts. So where muddiness tends to live is your lows and your low mids. Stuff that is just really overpowering the overall tone and the presence of the sound. And you know, usually the presence of a sound tends to be kind of in the mids, the upper mids and the highs. So if something sounds really muddy, not present, maybe pushed really far back in the mix, you might have a low mids problem. 
where it's just too out of balance. So let me turn this back on and you'll hear what it sounds like now. So here's before. And here's after. Here a lot of that muddiness is gone. Sounds a lot brighter now. So before. And after. Let's check our VU meter to make sure that our gain staging is good. So we're sitting around zero. So I can actually turn it up a little bit more. What's crazy about this is that even though it's showing the same volume, it actually sounds louder to us. We have increased the loudness by getting rid of some of just this nasty mud that's living down in the low mids. Now, as I was listening through on this particular guitar example, I kept thinking, I just want more bite. It needs to have a little bit more aggression, especially so that it'll stick out in the mix. Because right now it's not muddy, but it's still kind of boring. So I went in here and made an extra boost up here in the upper mids. So let's listen to what this sounds like. And really anywhere around here would work. That sounds pretty good. Take the volume down a little bit. Listen to the difference. Now I will say sometimes when you're adding some bite, you can get some harshness. Now when that happens, you might wanna make a bit of a cut just to compensate. So I might come in here, take my cue down a little bit, sweep around sort of this pain frequency area and see if I could find something that's creating this harshness. Yeah, like that. Or that. Yeah, that's helping. It's crazy how much that changes the tone, right? Now, I will say for stuff like this with electric guitars, you have a lot of control of the tone of this instrument before you ever record it. So I would really lean into G-Rats, get it right at the source, rather than trying to come in here and completely fix the tone. If it's already been done, that's okay. You can come in here and fix it here. But if you do your first recording and you're like, wow, it sounds like this. Don't think, oh, I'll just fix it in the mix. Go to your amp, turn some of the trebles up, turn some of the bass down, maybe change your guitar out, change the pickup, do something like that. Get something that has a little bit more bite, a little bit less mud, and you'll be able to get a fantastic tone that will fit your mix better without you having to go in and do just tons of scooping out of the low mids. So let's talk about how to EQ acoustic guitar. Now, there are a few things that tend to be problematic with acoustic guitars. Things that pop up a lot more often in this instrument than in other instruments. Now the biggest of these is resonant frequencies. Acoustic guitars are notorious for having a lot of resonant frequencies. Now the reason for that obviously is the room and things that we've already discussed, but one of the reasons is because of the body of the acoustic guitar. So whenever you strum an acoustic guitar, there are tons of frequencies and sound energy, sonic energy that gets shot into that hole and bounce around and come back out. And it's actually what makes an acoustic guitar sound louder than say an electric guitar, which doesn't have that resonating body. So the problem with that is that sometimes the frequencies that pop into that hole, that pop into the body, and go around, pop back out, they stay in for too long. There's certain ones that for just whatever reason with maybe it's that particular guitar or that particular guitar in that particular room or that microphone or whatever, there are just certain notes that seem to be problematic. So the first thing that we want to do whenever we look at an acoustic guitar is start to search 
for resonant frequencies. So let's listen to the guitar that we have. So obviously really muddy, not particularly bright. You can already hear some frequencies in it that are just sticking out so loudly, just a very, very loudly. So let's go in and start trying to cut those. Let's open up an EQ, make a peak filter, change the Q a little bit, make it a little bit narrower, and let's start sweeping. So I think I've already found one that I was hearing. Let's narrow this to make it more obvious. Hear that? Here it's just it's just one note, one frequency the whole time, no matter what chord's being played. So let's cut that. Okay, I'm hearing another one. I can actually see it here too. Right here, you see how just one single thing is just staying in the same place? So let's sweep around there. Way too fast. Right there. Mm -hmm. I'm going to cut that. a little bit narrower. And sometimes, sometimes there's one that sits in the low mids as well that might be causing some of the muddiness we're hearing. So let's sweep around there. like right there. It's just one note the whole time. So let's try cutting that. You hear how so much of the muddiness just cleared up? Now I'm hearing maybe one more, and you can see this acoustic guitar in particular has a lot of resonant frequencies. Most guitars don't have nearly as many as this. There might be one or two, if any. But if we're really trying to clean this up, let's make sure we're finding all of them. There's one that I'm hearing kind of, like kind of really high pitch that's sticking out. It's a little bit harder to find resonant frequencies once you get higher up. Most resonant frequencies live down here. Most resonances are kind of more in the lows and low mids, but sometimes you get some in the upper mids as well. Kind of right there, yeah. Yeah. Let's cut that out. So let's do a before and after. So that's before. And that's after. Now we got to make sure that we're gain staging like always. So I'm going to turn this off. We'll see where we're at. So it kind of looks like it's uh, around one, one to zero. So it looks like we could add a little bit away with it. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm actually hearing one more. And this is actually, I'm getting to the point where I would give you some caution. Because this is a bad habit that you can create as you are trying to find resonance frequencies. You can go a little overboard. And what happens is that whenever you get rid of one resonant frequency, well, sometimes another one pops out that's just a lot more obvious now because the other one isn't covering it up. And then you go and you cut that one. And then all of a sudden, there's another one that's more obvious and more and more and more. And then at a certain point, you've got 10 cuts and your acoustic guitar just sounds like a mess. So I would definitely, once you start doing more than two or three, I would start to be more wary about doing that. I'm hearing one more. I'm going to see if I can cut it and we'll do a before and after. And if I think it actually helps, great. But if I think it causes new problems, then I might just want to leave it. Yeah, right there. So we definitely have gotten rid of a lot of these resonant frequencies, but the guitar still sounds really boring. It still sounds really jangly. It still sounds muddy and out of balance. So let's move on to the next step, which is going to be cutting some of the mud or maybe adding some fullness if you need to. So I'm going to open up another EQ just so that we don't have to keep looking at all of those resonant frequencies. And let's listen to this. So to me, this is still a very boomy sounding acoustic guitar. And you can actually see that this is the case. There's a big, big hump right here. So what I might want to do, take a pretty wide, uh, wide bell like this and make a cut. Now let's look over here, see if we lost anything. Looks like we did. Yeah, it sounds a lot better already. So I might actually want uh, one thing I can do instead of using a bell is I can actually use a shelf. Now, what a shelf is going to do is if I'm just having sort of general low end, low mids problems, I can just grab a shelf and just turn the entire thing down. So let's try this. Yeah, listen to that. really hear the difference, right? That is kind of where the mud is going to live for an acoustic guitar. It's sort of that, uh, you know, between 200 and 400 hertz, sometimes a little bit under that, depending on the chords you're playing. But if it's just really, really muddy, that would be the area to cut. You can either use a bell or if it's just the whole thing that I'd recommend just going for a shelf. And again, you're going to gain stage it so that you're rebalancing your guitar, not just taking some of it out completely. You can also use that area to add some fullness. You know, if it sounds extra thin, so for instance, if I was to cut this way too much.
That's a very thin sounding guitar, so I might want to come in here and add a very wide boost. Something like that, you know? Sounds a lot better. So let's take this back where we had it. Great. So now I actually want to boost some of the top end. I want to add just a little bit of air to this. This is another really common thing that you see done in acoustic instruments. You know, something to just kind of make it feel more open. Just like I made a shelf down here, I'm also going to make a shelf up here. And I'm going to boost just in the top end. I'm not really going to touch the upper mids. Just up here to get a little bit of that airy feel. Okay, so that's getting some of that air that I'm talking about. Now, we've already handled the low mids. You know, we've handled some of that notorious mud that we've got. We've handled the top end. You know, these are notoriously, sometimes they're bright, but they're just still a little closed off. Now I want to talk about the upper mids. Now, this is usually where the string sound lives. And you can tell this particular acoustic guitar has a lot of of string sound, a lot of just like that chunkiness that's going on in it. That, and when I say, when I say chunk, I don't really mean like low end, do 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 do, but chunky like the ch sound, like ch 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 kind of sound. So what I'm gonna do, same thing. I'm gonna go in here. I'm gonna sweep around till I find an area that just seems like it's too much. And I'm gonna cut it. Yeah, like that. Okay, so let's cut that. Make that a little bit wider. And I'm gonna bring this up a little bit more to compensate because I still wanna have some of that boost up there. Okay, so here's before, and here's after. Now I'm also hearing a little bit of harshness and this can happen. So I want to look at the pain frequency, which is kind of around two kilohertz. Now harshness doesn't necessarily have to live like right around two kilohertz, but it's usually the place where I start looking. Yeah, listen to that. That hurts. Okay, let's do some gain staging. Okay, here's before. And here's after. So sometimes after I've done a little bit of EQ, I kind of have a moment where I can look back and think, did I accomplish the goal I was going for? And you know, I'm listening through and I'm realizing I made a lot of cuts here. Uh, I made a huge cut throughout all of the low end and the low mids. I made a cut here 
in the upper mids and then a smaller cut here at uh, around two kilohertz. And so really all I'm not cutting is the top end and a little bit of the mids. That's part of the reason why it's not really sounding all that different whenever I bypass it. So I'm gonna listen again and basically I am going to see, okay, what still needs to maybe be cut a little bit more or maybe I can cut it a little bit less. Okay, so I'm still hearing a lot of low end, a lot more low end I'd like than I'd like. note still sticking out too much. Let's find out which one it is. I think it's this one. It's a new one. See, this is what I was talking about. This happens sometimes. Yep, right there. So I want to point out a problem that I've created for myself. And I think this is a really great teaching moment because as I continue to cut more and more frequencies out of this, especially whenever I was coming and trying to cut out all of these resonant frequencies, I just got so excited that now it just sounds kind of lifeless. And that is what you are trying to avoid with stuff like this. You're trying to rebalance the frequencies. You're not necessarily trying to just make it fully dead sounding. Now, that doesn't mean I can just turn this off because that's just far too much. So one thing that we might want to do is grab these and just take their gain back a little bit. You know, we might have just made them a little bit too aggressive. That one I'm still gonna cut because it's pretty dramatically bad. And then this is another great example of a moment where, you know, maybe we did too much. So here's what I'm gonna do instead. I'm gonna open up a new one and we are gonna talk about tilt EQs. So what a tilt EQ is, and there's tons of free tilt EQs out there, is it's basically an EQ where whenever it turns one side down, it turns the other side up and vice versa. It's a great way to rebalance out of balance instruments. So for this one, you know, it's obviously sounding too muddy. I want a little bit more top end. So I'm gonna try using a tilt EQ. But first, I'm gonna try cutting out some of the low end because I think a lot of the boominess of this is coming kind of from some just unnecessary sonic energy that's happening around that area. And that happens with acoustic guitar sometimes. They're just too boomy, even for their own good. You hear how much that helps? Now let me turn it up to compensate. that boominess isn't there anymore. And now we can go in and do our shelf, our tilt EQ. So a lot of times I like sliding it around just to see like what really needs work. All right, 
let's turn this up and compensate. Yeah, listen to the difference on that. Listen to how much louder we were able to make it. So this is a great example that because I was able to simplify, I was able to take out some of just the heavy, heavy EQ moves I was trying to make. I was able to look back, think, and just say, okay, what does this instrument need? And ultimately, that's the best way to EQ. Not necessarily to use tips and tricks that go with one particular instrument, but just what this instrument needs. So let's do a quick before and after. So here's before. And here's after. We made it a little bit too loud. So before. after. I actually really like the tone of that. I know it sounds maybe a little lo-fi, but I really like that. It's got some nice, like we've kind of worked through that chunkiness, that sound a little bit, and I think that's going to sound really nice in the song. And again, it's a great example that sometimes simplicity is the thing that you need. So let's talk about EQing piano. Now, piano is definitely an instrument where your EQ can vary pretty wildly, not necessarily because of the instrument itself, but more because of the wide array of genres that this particular instrument is in. For instance, if this instrument is in a rock song, I'm probably gonna EQ it pretty differently than if it was a classical piece where I'm not really gonna do much EQing at all. Whereas in the rock song, I might do a lot of EQ. I might be pretty aggressive with it to try to create space for the rest of the instruments. And it also does depend on what kind of piano that you're actually EQing. Because obviously there's not just grand and that's it. You know, there's grand pianos, upright pianos, there are electric pianos, although that's kind of a beast in itself. Not that they're difficult to EQ, but just that they are you know, created differently. They are essentially a synthesizer. We could continue to go on. I mean, obviously there are like the old honky-tonk pianos. You know, there are even the pianos that were used a few hundred years back that are quite a bit plinkier. But there are a few things that kind of no matter what you are going to be working on, like no matter what genre you're in, there's a few things that you're probably going to want to at least check out. So today we're gonna to be working with this piano track. It's very simple. It was recorded just in a room, just a fairly large, fairly large room, and you can really hear the room in the sound. And you can already hear like there's some problems with it that we're gonna be fixing. So let's take a listen. So it's really beautiful, right? But at the same time, it kind of feels like it's been recorded from really far away. So I actually recorded this piano several years ago, maybe maybe a decade ago. And I mean, all of the microphones that are on this piano are right up against the piano. And it still sounds so muffled. Again, it sounds like I put a microphone pretty far away from the thing. Let's go in here and look at what we can do to fix that. And then let's also talk about things that we need to do to create space for other instruments in the mix. So we're gonna be figuring out what's causing some of that covered sound, uh, working our way through maybe getting rid of some stuff, adding some stuff. And then we're also going to work on creating space for the other instruments in the mix. So for instance, if this is in, you know, your standard pop song, rock song, you know, creating space for the low end instruments, since many pianos are typically the other low end instrument in a standard band. So the first thing that we wanna do is search for room resonances. Piano is another instrument that is kind of notorious for having some bad room resonances, because usually there's a lot more room sound in a piano. There's a lot less of a direct microphone kind of sound 
as you might get in, for instance, an electric guitar where you have a microphone directly up against the grill of the amp. So we're gonna listen for that one note that's sticking out. I don't know if you heard it, but use your ears and really think like, it's, it sounds like it's in the mid range. So let's, let's check around there. You can hear it. I can actually see it too. It's right here. Cause it's just staying the whole time. So I'm gonna grab my sweep EQ and let's go around. Definitely right there. Mm -hmm. Hear that? So let's cut this. So before. And after. You hear how much cleaner it is? It's incredible. So let's do some gain staging. We'll see if we lost anything. I'm not sure if we did, if I'm being honest with you. So. Looks like it's kind of hanging around zero. Let's look at it now. Yeah, it sounds like it's pretty much the same volume. Maybe lost just a little bit. Yeah. But ultimately, what we care about is the fact that the direct sound is so much more obvious now. It doesn't feel like it's being covered up by something that's unnatural. Okay, so next thing that I want to do is I want to look at the low mids. So this particular piano is sounding pretty muddy to my ears. There's definitely kind of some gunk that's going on down there that is making the whole thing sound, like I said, a little covered, a little out of balance. And that's a fairly common problem for, for pianos. So I'm going to go around here, sweep around a bit, see if I can find something that's sounding uh, just particularly nasty to my ears. Yeah, kind of this area to me. Yeah, that sounds a little bit better. So let's go over here and gain stage. So it looks like we lost a few decibels. So let's go over here. Let's type in 2.5, see if that does it. That sounds good to me. So one of the cool things about this is that, you know, as we turned this up, as we did our gain staging, you know, not only have we cut a little bit of these low mids, but we've inherently boosted the upper mids, which is the presence part of the frequency spectrum. So we're able to hear it better. It sounds like I said earlier, just a little bit clearer. That said, I do want to actually go up here and maybe do a boost. This is another common area in pianos where sometimes they can get that kind of covered sound. And if a cut in the low mids isn't really cutting it, you might want to do a broad boost in the upper mids to kind of bring out the hammer sound, bring out some of the ambient noises that are going on inside of the piano. So you see how you could hear the dampeners moving up and down, that kind of ambient sound? I'll solo it so you can hear it more clearly. Pretty cool. All right, let's take this down, get it to where it sounded nice and subtle. Okay, now let's do some gain staging. So we added a little bit, so let's take some out. Okay, so here's before. Here's after. 
sounding a lot better. Now there's one more thing that we can do to clean this up. And this is actually something that I would recommend doing regardless if you have kick and bass in a mix and you're not really wanting to use the piano as your main low end instrument. So if I hit play, you'll see that there is a lot of, look at all this, there's a lot of sonic energy down here in the low end that we're just not really even hearing. It's just not present. So we are gonna use a high pass filter and we are going to sweep it up to kind of just get rid of some of that rumble and grime. I am gonna solo it out just so that you can hear what it sounds like because you can see, you know, if this was a solo piano, we might leave it in, but ultimately it's not really adding that much. Hold on, let me. You hear how, like, I have that all the way up to 100. This is adding very little. More than anything, it's more of an attack. You just, you hear that boom, 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 boom. And like I said, if this is a solo piano, if you're doing a classical piece, you absolutely want to leave that in there because that's some of the attack, some of the lifeblood of the piano. But if you're trying to create space for other instruments in your mix, then it's just not quite as necessary. Okay, so let's look at how much gain we took out because I can guarantee you we just saved a ton of headroom by taking all of that low end mush out. Okay, so maybe more just like a decibel of headroom. Not quite as much as I was expecting, but still good. I think I'm gonna cut a little bit more of this out. Pretty good, right? Now, one final thing you could do, this isn't necessarily required, but you can see over here how much high-end energy there is, but oftentimes pianos don't typically have a lot of sonic energy up in the top end of the frequency spectrum. So if it's a very dense mix, it might be worth cutting it. So I'm gonna make a, uh, make a filter and let's see what this sounds like. You can hear how cutting that has changed the sound very little, which means it was just energy that was taking up space. It wasn't necessarily adding that much. That said, I don't want to be too aggressive with it because sometimes you don't hear much stuff in the high end, but it's still adding a lot. So I'm going to still be a little bit more subtle. I'm not going to try to just chop off the entire top end. I'll kind of stick around eight kilohertz. So I'm actually hearing one final problem with this. There's still one note that's kind of sticking out to me. It might be a room resonance, might just be a bum note, who knows. But I'm kind of hearing it in the low mid, sort of around maybe 400, 500. So let's do one final sweep around and see if we can find the culprit. Kind of this sound right here. So I'm not gonna be nearly as aggressive on this particular cut. I'm more just wanting to control this. So listen to this difference. Pretty amazing, right? All of a sudden it sounds like a piano. It sounds 
open, it sounds broad. And look at how much we cut. We cut a lot out of the bottom and the top, getting rid of some of that unnecessary rumble and unnecessary sizzle. We cut some out of the low mids to get rid of some of the mud. We cut a pretty sizable amount out of a few resonance frequencies. And then finally, we just added a little boost. It's just two and a half decibels up here in the upper mids, just to give it some clarity, give it some brightness, give it just a little bit more presence. And I would say the result almost is a different instrument. So let's do one more before and after. And then I would say, feel free to take away any of these things that you've learned. I will actually give you one final tip. Sometimes certain pianos tend to sound really good in the mids. This particular piano, kind of lived more up here in the upper mids, but many pianos tend to have some great sounds kind of between 600 and two kilohertz. So, uh, you know, again, that's not necessarily me saying go boost there. You have to go boost there. But if you're really trying to find an area for the piano to live in the mix, I would recommend maybe checking that out. Maybe if the piano isn't sounding quite as alive as you'd like it to be or not quite as colorful as you'd like it to be that might be an area to check out and see if that adds something so here's our final before and after so here's before and here's after pretty impressive stuff so hopefully this helps you out with your next piano mix so let's talk about EQing your vocals. Now, obviously vocals are the instrument that people pay attention to the most. And they're also the instrument that people are most used to hearing. Now, obviously everyone has heard guitars and drums and pianos and whatever, but we talk to people every single day. It's not even necessarily that people are used to hearing singing voices, although they are, but we just have an innate understanding of what a human vocal sounds like. And so because of that, we need to be much more careful with what EQing that we do to achieve what we're trying to achieve. A lot of times, if vocals are recorded fairly well, I would actually recommend taking a more subtle approach to the vocals. So rather than going in and cutting, you know, 15 decibels here, boosting 15 decibels there or whatever, you know, a few dBs here cut, a few dBs here boost, so on and so forth. If you start to dramatically mess with the tone, what could happen is that people could start to hear like, oh, that sounds unnatural. That doesn't actually sound like a human. That sounds fake. And obviously you don't want that to be the case if you're trying to create something that sounds natural. Now, there are some genres where this is not the case. For instance, pop. A lot of times pop requires a lot of EQ shaping to get the vocal exactly perfect. And people are a little bit more used to that. So you can be a little bit more aggressive with your vocal when you're using a pop vocal. And that's actually what we are going to be working with today, just because it's easier to show you some examples of where some of the problems might be, because they're going to be a little bit more obvious and this genre is going to be able to take some pretty heavy cuts and boosts. But please be aware this isn't necessarily something you're going to want to use in your folk track or your rock track. So one thing to remember though, one of the big purposes of EQ in a mixing situation is to create space for the vocal. The vocal is usually the main instrument of an entire song. It's again, it's, it's the thing that everyone focuses on the most. So, we don't necessarily want to go in and create space for a bunch of other instruments inside of the vocal. Rather, we're wanting to create space inside of other instruments for the vocal. So I'm not going to be quite as big on you going in and saying like, okay, you know, how can we cut a whole bunch of stuff and create space for other instruments? For this particular instrument, it's going to be more about how can we make this vocal sound as uncluttered and clear as possible? So the first thing we're going to do Let's pop in here. Let's make ourselves an EQ and let's listen and see what we're dealing with here. Burning down a road I've yet to know. Mm. Okay, so it's a very pretty vocal. It's very well performed. There's a few things that I'm hearing in it that 
I think would be worth cutting. And they are some pretty common problems with vocals. So first of all, let's get this out of the way. Most of the time there's absolutely nothing going on down here in the low end for a vocal. It's usually just room noise, maybe, you know, the air conditioning, cars passing. It's really just going to clutter up the mix. So we are just going to move this forward until we start to lose some of the energy of the vocal. Then we're going to back off a little bit. Burning down a road I've yet to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about right there is fine. Great. So now that we have that out of the way, I actually am going to make this a little bit more dramatic just to make sure. Burning down. Now, one of the things that I'm hearing the most is sort of a boxy sound in here, which is really common in DIY vocals, because usually the rooms that you're recording in, well, they are literally boxes. And for whatever reason, box shaped rooms tend to create a boxy sound where it sounds like you are singing in a cardboard box. So I'm hearing a little bit of that. So I'm going to create a peak over here and sweep around. Usually boxiness tends to be somewhere between 250 and 600 hertz, kind of in that low mids area. Burning down a road I've yet to know. Yeah, I'm already hearing something. Mm -hmm. Make this a little wider. Memories calling me to come back home. Yeah, it's just a little much for me. I'm not going to be too aggressive with it. Yeah, just going to kind of help to have a hold on that low end right there, that, those low mids. So I am hearing a little bit more boxiness kind of up here, closer towards the mids. So I'm going to make another one of these and let's do some sliding. Burning down a road I've yet to know. Yeah, that sounds pretty aggressive right there. Mm -hmm. Memories. Memories calling me to come back. That like wah, 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 wah sound is some classic boxiness sound. It's like the uh, the trombone sound in those old Peanuts cartoons. Whenever any time the uh, the adults would talk, and all you hear would be like kind of like that. A lot of times that's existing, sort of between 400, 700. It's not in every vocal, but oftentimes it can really hurt the intelligibility of the vocal. It can really make a particular vocal just fade into the back of the mix. So we're gonna do some cutting on that. Burning down a road I've yet to know mm -hmm. Memories Memories calling me to come back home mm -hmm. Okay, let's do some gain staging. Grab my VU meter over here. Burning down a road I've yet to know. Okay, so kind of between four and seven. Burning down a road I've yet to know. Okay, so let's increase that probably by two or three. Burning down a road I've yet to know. It's pretty good. Burning down a road I've yet to know. Awesome. You see how you can hear a little bit more of the top end. It starts to shine a little bit more. Some more of the upper mids kind of come out. Now, one problem that's become a little bit more obvious now is there's kind of some sort of like whistle tone, some sort of nasaliness that's going on in the vocals now that we've made such a big cut to get rid of some of the boxy sound. And usually, you know, honkiness, nasaliness, that's another very common problem in, in vocals. That's usually somewhere between 500 hertz and 2 kilohertz, so somewhere in the mids. Let's make another band and we are going to sweep around. Burning down a road I've yet to Yeah, kind of know. around there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there it is. That honky sound, that nasally sound right there. So I'm going to cut that as well. Burning down a road I've yet to know. Okay, let's do some gain staging. Burning down a road. Burning down a road. So we've lost a little bit. 
Burning down That's a road far. I've yet to Burning down a road I've yet to know mm-hmm. So here's before right now Burning down a road I've yet to know and Here's after Burning down a road I've yet to know It's a lot clearer now. Now here's a really important trick to know for whenever you're trying to get that professional sheen that you hear in a lot of vocals, that kind of airiness that comes with vocals a lot of times. Uh, So usually if you're seeing some kind of pop vocal, unless you have a particularly airy singer or you're using a very bright microphone or you're in a really, really nice studio, a lot of times they require a pretty big boost on the top end. So I'm gonna create a shelf just like this one. And I'm gonna boost this, let's say right about here, probably about five decibels. And sometimes you only need a little boost. Sometimes you need a very aggressive boost. I'm gonna start around here. Okay, so let's do some gain staging. Burning down a okay, so we added a little bit, so it's now too loud. Burning down a road I've yet to know mm-hmm. Burning down a road I've yet to know Yeah, you can hear the difference now. Even though it's the same loudness, just this one is a lot airier, a lot more present, a lot less honky uh, and boxy. Burning down a road I've yet to know Versus this. Burning down a road I've yet to know. Which feels so covered, feels so much more quiet. So let's listen in context. So before. Burning down a road I've yet to know. And after. Burning down a road I've yet to know. Yeah, it just sticks out a lot more nicely. If I had a little bit more time, I might go in here and tweak this bell. I'm still hearing just a little bit of that honkiness, kind of like that whistle tone that's going on up there, but I'm not really going to worry about that for now. One other suggestion that I might make, I don't think this particular vocal needs it, but one thing that a lot of vocals uh, really play well with is the upper mids. Again, that's usually the presence frequency area. That's the part of the of the vocal where a lot of the character comes out, a lot of the personality, the emotion of the vocal. And that's also the part of the vocal that allows the listener to hear it really well. You know, a lot of times when you have a very upfront vocal, one that feels like it's right in the face of the listener, there's a lot of upper mids content that's going on up there. So if I was having some problems hearing this vocalist, I might actually go in here and add a boost you know, somewhere between two and six kilohertz. But, you know, something tells me this vocalist just isn't going to need it. I'll try to see if it's actually going to work, but uh, I think it's probably going to end up being fine on this particular vocalist. Burning down a road I've yet to know Mm -hmm. Memories Memories come Burning down. Yeah, it hurts my ears a little bit. And that's something that you can come across pretty often is whenever you are creating stuff up in the upper mids, whenever you're adding more of that sonic energy, uh, that's also where a lot of the pain lives. A lot of the pain of sound is up there. If you're ever hearing any harshness in a sound, the odds are pretty good that it's living up there in the upper mids. So I would say I'm pretty much done with this vocal. I'm really, really liking it. So now let's take a look at the harmonies. I'm going to unmute these so you can hear what they sound like. Burning down a road I've yet to know. Mm-hmm. Memories. One thing that I want to do with my harmonies is I want to make sure that they're blending really well with the actual main vocals but I don't necessarily want them to stick out. Like I don't necessarily want them to have their own space to live in. I just want them to exist in the mix and get them out of the way of the vocals as much as possible. So what I'm actually going to do, I'm going to 
come over here and I'm going to grab the EQ from my main vocals and I'm going to copy it over to my harmonies. Let me make sure that I've got a stereo file there. There we go. Whenever you're mixing harmonies, especially if it's the same person who's singing the harmonies, you always want to make sure that you're using the same cuts. So I'm actually going to start doing my EQ on the harmonies with all of this already intact. And for this particular harmony, I think I'm going to get rid of this boost in the top end. Because like I said, whenever you're boosting the top end, you're boosting the upper mids, usually that makes that sound more present in the mix. And we don't really want more presence in the background vocals. We really only want them to blend into the main vocals. So let's listen to see what we have right now. I'm going to do some gain staging to make sure that we're starting off pretty well. So here's before. Yet to know. Okay, so kind of between seven and five. So let's look at it now. Down a yet to know. So probably lost four decibels or so. Down a yet That's to better. Cool. So one thing that I'm going to do, and this is a fairly common trick whenever you're mixing harmonies, is I'm actually going to make a pretty aggressive cut in the upper mids. This is especially helpful if the harmonies are just sticking out too much in the mix for your taste. And the reason we're doing this is, again, the upper mids are the area where a lot of the presence of a vocal lives, and I want to get rid of some of that presence. I want to get rid of some of the personality of the vocal so that it sounds like it's just enveloping the main vocals. It's not necessarily just an entirely different person singing, unless that's what you want, in which case, probably don't do this. Down a road I've yet to know. So I'm gonna sweep around and find the area where I feel like the harmonies have the most energy up here in the upper mids, where like they sound the most forward. Kind of like right here for me. And I'm gonna make a cut. So very aggressive. What is that? 12 decibels. Let's go in here and do some gain staging. But we're gonna solo it out. It's gonna sound pretty weird. Okay, so before. And after. One interesting thing that you are probably hearing is there's not a ton of change happening. Why would that be? I mean, we've made so many cuts. But again, you want to think about the fact that look at how much of the frequency spectrum is being cut. Really the only part of the frequency spectrum that's not being cut is everything above, what is this, six kilohertz. So whenever I'm turning everything up by, uh, what is that, about six decibels, five to six decibels, you know, I'm really just turning all of this all the way back up to where it was. So in reality, I'm only really cutting a little bit of this and a little bit of this, and I'm actually adding some of the top end to this. So this is a great example where I might say, okay, you know, this is maybe too much for me. And I actually need to pick my battles and I might say, okay, you know, I might want to take this back a little bit, maybe take this back a little bit, because then whenever it gets turned up, this is still going to be a huge cut or vice versa. I could also just cut this extra far, but if all of my cuts are kind of at the exact same place and so much of my frequency spectrum is being cut, a lot of times you run the risk of it being a null sum game, you know, not really that much actually happening. So let's make sure that we're gain staging again. We probably need to turn the volume down a little bit. Down. Yep, we do. Down there we go. Okay, so let's see what this sounds like. See how that's really starting to just sit inside that vocal? Let me turn it off. You'll see what it sounded like before. Down a road I've yet to know. Before. Mm. And after. Memories. Memories calling me to come back home. Mm. 
So one thing I might want to do, and I don't think I'm going to do it on this particular harmony, but a fairly common thing to do on harmonies is to actually create either a high shelf or a low pass filter and cut off some of the top end. And that's because usually brighter sounds tend to sound more forward to our ears, which is a very interesting concept. This is a great tip for creating space in your mix, actually. If you're trying to push something back in your mix, if you're trying to make it sound like it's farther away, not quite as close, cut some of the top end. A lot of times that's actually gonna help you out a lot in doing that. So one thing that I would do is maybe cut, you know, around 10 kilohertz, something like that, and see if that pushes it back in the mix if I want it to be pushed back in the mix. Again, you have to EQ with intention. You can't just do it because you think you should. Okay, let's gain stage. It's pretty close. So this did a good job of pushing it back in the mix. I do actually think it makes it sound artificial a little bit too much. You know, these vocals in particular, for whatever reason, are just really standing out. So rather than doing this, I'm going to come back, just cut a little bit, and I'm going to lean into this cut. And I'm going to go down even farther. And let's do some gain staging. Okay. okay, well, let's listen to it. I think it's a little bit too wide. Again, it's sounding really unnatural. Alright, let's listen and do some gain staging. A little bit too loud. Memories, memories calling me to come back home. Mm. So, this is sounding a little bit better to me. It's getting pushed back in the mix. So, I actually think one thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to get more aggressive with my cut of the lower mids. So, this is another thing that happens with harmonies. The lower mids is kind of where the vocal lives. You know, it's not like the upper mids where, you know, like that's the presence, it's the emotion, the excitement, but this is just kind of the main body of the vocal. I mean, this is the warmth of the vocal. This is the, the humanity of the vocal, so to say. So I'm actually gonna go in here and try cutting that and seeing if that helps it to even more fade into the sound of the main vocal. I'm actually going to move this up a little bit, so I'm getting more of this sound. Memories, memories calling me to come back home. Okay, we're definitely going to have to do some gain staging, because again, we've lost a lot of volume there. So let's listen. We're looking for five to seven. Yeah, we've lost quite a bit. Okay, let's listen. There we go. That's starting to sound pretty good to me.
Yeah, that's sounding pretty good to me. It's starting to just live inside of that vocal, just like I was talking about. If you wanted to make this a little bit easier, one thing that I'll also do sometimes, again, just depends on how aggressive you want to be, how you know, inhuman you want the harmonies to sound. But one thing that I'll do a lot of times is I'll actually go over here to my filter and I'll actually filter quite a bit of the low mids just out of the sound entirely. Let's see what that sounds like. And sometimes when I do that, you know, I'm going to make sure that it's a little bit of a lower slope. So it's a little bit more of a musical cut. It's not like a hard and fast, you know, it sounds like I'm singing through a telephone or anything like that. Burning down a road I've yet to know. Mm. Let's solo this out, do some gain staging. Burning down, burning down a road. Ooh, too far. Burning down a road I've so one thing that happens with this that you'll also want to be aware of whenever you're taking out so much of the lower mids you know the lower mids is usually what actually triggers your compressors and you can actually see it over here how the range you went from sort of seven to five and now it's like ten to five and that's because now it's requiring more energy from stuff in the mids and the upper mids to push the volume meter along. And that's going to be the case with your compression as well. So if you do a cut this dramatic, I would definitely recommend putting some compression on over it just to make sure that you're keeping that harmony as consistent as possible because you don't want it kind of popping in and out of the track. You want it to be a little bit more of a straight line. Burning down, burning down. Sounds pretty good to me. Mm, so listen to this. Here's before. Down a, road I've yet to know. a lot of character, great sounding harmonies mm, if that's what you're going for. Here's after. You know, I might want to tweak this. I might want to do this in such a way where it's still not quite as bright. You know, there's there's still some brightness that's kind of sitting in there that's sticking out for, for my ears in particular, but I'm going to leave it there. I think it sounds really good. It's fitting in really nicely. I think especially after some compression, maybe a little bit of reverb to push it back in the mix. That's going to create just a really nice chord that's going to sit around those main vocals. And ultimately, Unless you're, again, you're looking for more of a duet kind of vibe for your song, that sort of background vocal chord is really what you're going for. Using some of those techniques, as long as you're using them with good intention, I think is going to do a very good job at creating the kind of sound that you're looking for with your song. Now that we've gone through the common problems that you're going to find in most instruments, well, now we need to talk about the elephant in the room, which is this question. Do they all apply? to every genre. And that's something that people ask me all the time, you know, like, oh, these are some really cool tips for mixing guitars, but you know, you play a rock guitar in that, but uh, you know, I'm mixing a folk track. Do those apply? You know, or, oh, like, I really love the sound of that vocal that you used in that example to teach us, but uh, you know, that's a pop vocal and I'm a hip hop artist or I'm a rock artist. Does that really apply to me? And Yes and no is the answer to that. There are definitely genre differences in mixing. Usually the problems that you're going to find are the same across the board. The big differences that you find is that the overall tonal balances in the general mix and the overall song is going to be different depending on the genre that you're working on. So that means that some genres are going to be a lot brighter than other genres. Some genres will be maybe darker or more natural or a lot fuller in the low end. So I figured it would be a great teaching moment to go in and talk about some of the differences that you're going to see in your genres. Now, before we start, I do want to give you the best tip I can possibly give you for figuring out how to balance your genre 
rather than anybody else's genre. And it's going to come as no surprise because I'm a pretty big broken record about it. And that's to use reference tracks in your genre to get your tonal balance right. It's really as simple as that. Just go find songs that sound like what you want your song to sound like, preferably ones that have been professionally mixed, and use those throughout your mix to reorient your ears, to retune your ears. It's going to be so much easier to get to something that sounds like your genre if you're constantly checking your genre throughout the mix. So that said, I do want to go in and show you some of the differences just so that you have at least a little bit of head knowledge to match what you're hearing with your ears. So let's start off with the most common and most obvious, and that's gonna be pop music. Now, when I say pop, I don't necessarily mean just what you're hearing on the radio. Pop is just any music that sounds modern and polished, at least as far as production goes. What you're gonna hear a lot is lots of top end boosts for that professional sheen, for the the air that you hear in pop music a lot. And that's usually gonna be sitting above kind of eight to 10 kilohertz, depending on your song. Now that's the most common difference of this genre. It's always a lot brighter than most other genres. Now I will be careful because if you're using parametric EQs, sometimes those can be a little harsh in the top end. So I'd really recommend if you are using pop, maybe lean a little bit more into your analog EQs if you're doing any top end boosts in, you know, maybe the vocals or in the acoustic guitars, the overheads, or even on the entire mix bus. So now let's look at hip hop. So hip hop actually sounds a lot different today than it did back in the 80s and 90s and even the early 2000s. It's a lot closer to pop these days, just as far as polish goes. That said, there are some key differences. You do hear a lot more aggression in the upper mids. So there's a lot more energy in the upper mids than in pop. There's also a lot more low end. You know, if you are hearing someone driving by with a subwoofer in their trunk, blasting hip hop music, and you can just feel it, well, that's because that's how it's been mixed. It has a lot of low end, a lot of boom to it. It does have some top end boosts, just like pop, but it's a little bit more sparing, whereas pop is a, a little bit more aggressive with those top end boosts. Okay, so now I wanna look at rock music. Now again, rock music, it really does depend on the style of rock that you're looking into. Every subgenre of rock has its own sound. Really every subgenre of any genre has, has its own sound, which is why reference tracks are so important. But overall, rock has a lot more aggression in the upper mids, just like hip hop does. It doesn't have those top end boosts though. Usually it's very, upper mids focused, a little bit less top end. It does have a lot more warmth and thickness though. So a lot more energy in the lower mids. So lower mids and upper mids is where you'll be focusing on making some boosts if you're doing rock music. Okay, so now let's look at metal music. Now again, you're still gonna get that aggression in the upper mids, just like rock and just like hip hop. All three of these are pretty you can be aggressive, angry genres, so that's where a lot of that emotion lives. Now, if it's highly produced metal, then yeah, go for some top end boosts. But if it's a little bit more lo-fi, I would really skip those top end boosts and really focus on the upper mids. Now, you don't really hear a lot of warmth or thickness in metal. That's one of the biggest things that separates it from rock, is it's so focused on the upper mids because it is, again, I mean, it's metal. You don't think of warmth when you think of metal, you think of shininess and harshness and aggression. Okay, so now let's look at our next genre, and that is folk. Now I say folk, but I really mean folk or classical or jazz or bluegrass, really any genre where they try to capture the sound of the band as realistically and accurately as possible. Most engineers in this particular genre aren't trying to enhance a lot of stuff. They're just trying to get it to sound as like the band in the real world as they can. So usually EQ is, is very subtle in these genres. Bands spend a lot more time in the recording phase to get their sound right, since usually mixing is pretty sparse. There's not a lot of compression, not a lot of EQ. So as far as the energy goes with those particular genres, well, it really just depends on that band. If that band is just a singer 
and an upright bass player, then, you know, it's going to sound what it sounds like. It's going to have a lot of bass. It was probably going to have a lot of top end. You know, if it's a whole bunch of mid range instruments, you know, like an acoustic guitar and a mandolin and a banjo, well, then it's going to be very mids focused. Again, it just entirely depends on what the instrumentation is. You know, obviously a classical piece is going to be very broad because it has a lot of energy in every part of the frequency spectrum because it has instruments that are producing basically every note in the frequency spectrum. That one will have a lot more balanced of a uh, general tone than maybe folk or bluegrass or any of these other genres that have that kind of natural sound. So finally, we get to the black sheep in the group, and that is EDM or electronic music. Now I call it the black sheep because this is a bit of a grab bag. I'm not gonna be able to really give you that much in the way of recommendations for this because every style and subgenre of EDM or electronic music is so varied on how they decide they want to sound. You know, if you go and listen to dubstep and then you go and listen to vaporwave, they're really, really different sounds, even though both of them are pretty much entirely synth based. And part of the reason for this is that these genres are based entirely on synthesizers. You know, because there's no acoustic instruments in the mix, there aren't really as many norms in how a track should sound. You know, a lot of the stuff we've been trying to figure out with EQ has been like, okay, how do I get this instrument to sound right? How do we get all these instruments to sound right together? But with, you know, with a synthesizer, you can really create whatever sound you want. You could create a sound that is only top end and nothing else. You could create a sound that is, you know, only top end and only bass and the mids and the low mids, the upper mids are entirely scooped out. That's not a sound that can exist in the real world. So it's not really worth me even giving you almost any advice on that because it's just going to depend on what you create. So for this particular genre, I would really lean even harder into your reference tracks. You want to find references that are in your subgenre of the style that you're trying to do to make sure that you're getting an overall sound, an overall mix tone that's going to sound really, really good lean into your references, and honestly, you're going to be just fine. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. Massive kudos for making it to the end. There aren't many people out there willing to put this much time and patience into their music. So I really admire that and you should give yourself a pat on the back. You're clearly somebody who's serious about investing in yourself and investing in your craft. And that's the exact kind of person we're looking to work with inside our comprehensive two-year program called The Reverse Engineer. So here's what I'd like you to do next. Simply open a new tab and type in mastering.com. And on that page, you can see a bunch of information about how the program works works and there's a button to apply for a consultation with somebody on our team. This is a free 45 minute Zoom call with one of our admission officers and they'll just break down how our methodology works, ask you some questions to see if it's a good fit and help you game plan out your next few months. Then if it is a good fit, we'll break down how everything works and extend and invite your way to join. Of course, there is a financial investment required to join our community, so please don't book a call if you're not prepared to invest in yourself and your career. But either way, we'll just be straight with you because in order to protect our reputation, we only want to work with people who will actually complete the program and get significant results and also be a positive addition to our community. Because trust me, it's extremely frustrating working with people who aren't reciprocating the effort that we're pouring into them. So we don't just let anyone in. But if you are serious about this, let's hop on a Zoom call. It's completely free. You can game plan out the next few months and just see how all of this works. Again, just open up a new tab and type mastering.com if you want to schedule your free consultation call with somebody on our team. That's all for this video. Keep an eye out for more courses like this. If you want, you can check out our 10 hour compression course as well to go even more in depth. Okay, enjoy and I'll see you again soon.